Fearing the Biker. Written by Cassie Alexandra. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved. Prologue. Which one is your old man? Asked the other kid, Flint. We were at the clubhouse, playing video games in the back room. He was 13, a year older than me, and I was whipping his ass in the football game we were playing. Acid, I said, pushing the buttons on the controller rapidly. That's what I thought. Wouldn't it be easier if you weren't wearing those? I glanced down at the fingerless leather gloves I was wearing. Maybe but my hands are cold. Yes. Another touchdown. This is boring, said Flint, throwing down the controller. He stood up and stretched. I say we do something else. I leaned forward and turned off the game system. Like what? He was silent for a few seconds. You want to go to the park? It was wintertime and cold as shit, but I was just happy to be hanging out with someone other than my younger cousin Tommy. He was only nine and liked to play with action figures, which got old. Sure, I replied, grabbing my jacket. Flint picked up his backpack and slung it over his shoulder. What was your name again? It's Jordan. That's right. So which one is your old man? I asked as we walked down the hallway toward the front door. Butch. He stopped abruptly and smirked. You hear that, he whispered. We were standing outside of one of the bedrooms. The door was closed but you could hear two people having sex. I grinned. Yeah. He put his ear against the door. It sounds like Schmitty and Jenna. I knew who Schmitty was. He was the VP for the Demon Rebels, which was our dad's motorcycle club. Who's Jenna? She's a sweet butt. Cool, I said. From what I'd heard, a sweet butt was another name for most of the chicks who hung around the clubhouse. They had a thing for bikers and loved to party. Acid would bring one home once in a while, and they'd disappear into his bedroom for a few hours. Sometimes they'd come out with frightened looks on their faces, never to return. Those were the days he usually left me alone. Otherwise, if Acid was having a bad day, he'd almost always take his aggressions out on me. Unfortunately, he had more bad ones than good. You ever feel up a girl before? asked Flint. Yeah, I lied, not wanting to sound like a punk. The truth was, I'd never even kissed a girl, let alone touched one. Sure. You did not, said Flint, watching my face closely. I did so, I argued. You weren't there so you wouldn't know. What was her name? I quickly made one up. Lisa. Her name was Lisa. Lisa, huh? What was her cup size? Cup size? He held his hands up to his chest. You know how big were her tatas? I laughed nervously. Oh yeah. Right. Well they both fit in the palms of my hands. All I needed, I said, repeating something I'd heard Acid say before. You're so full of crap, he said, chuckling. He put his arm around my neck and pulled me away from the door. Come on. Let's go and make a man out of you. I wasn't sure exactly what he meant, but it sounded interesting. Ah, uh, sure. As we were leaving the clubhouse, we told one of the old ladies, Carla Jean, that we were going to the park up the road. She was up at the bar, drinking a Bloody Mary and talking to one of the prospects. It's cold outside. You sure? she asked, flicking her cigarette into the ashtray. We need some fresh air, said Flint, as we reached the front door. And we're bored. Carla Jean frowned. Watch your mouth, Flint. Sorry, he replied with a smirk. Noticing it, she grunted. I'll let them know. Stay out of trouble. The park was less than two blocks away. When we arrived, I followed Flint up to the top of the triple slide, and we sat down under the canopy with our legs crossed. Check this out, he said, pulling out a girly magazine and a pack of smokes from his backpack. Here, he said, handing me a cigarette. My dad smoked so I didn't really think he'd mind. I shoved the cigarette between my lips and waited. Flint took out a lighter and lit our smokes. You have to inhale it, he said, after watching me puff on the end of mine for a while. You're not doing it right. Check this out. 
I watched as he inhaled the smoke and then blew it out, making a grayish-white ring. I smiled. Sweet. Try it, he said, doing it again. I tried inhaling, but it only burned my lungs and made me cough. He chuckled. Just keep practicing. You'll get the hang out of it. Okay, I said, clearing my throat as he opened up the magazine. Nice, huh, he said, nodding to a picture of a nude girl spread eagle. I felt myself getting excited and pulled my jacket down over my lap. Shit yeah. I'd love to bang her. Or her, he said, showing me another naked chick. Me too. The only thing missing is a beer, said Flint. Your old man ever let you drink? Once in a while, I said, lying again. He held up the magazine and showed me the centerfold. Both of us agreed that the model had more than a handful on her chest. How come acid doesn't bring you around much, he asked, turning to the next page. I shrugged my shoulders. I didn't want to tell him that it was because I couldn't stand to be around him. Normally, I avoided my old man at all costs, spending most of my time at Aunt Peggy's. That was his sister, and although she could be a real bitch at times, she didn't enjoy tormenting me like acid. When he wasn't preaching to me about respect, he was whipping me with his belt. Fortunately, he'd been taking a lot of road trips with the club lately, and leaving me alone. Is it true what they say about him? What's that? Flint exhaled another cloud of smoke. He really uses acid on people. That's why they call him that. I stared at the hand holding the cigarette, remembering the last time he'd used it on me. It had been about three months ago. Acid had come home from the bar, drunk and angry because of some chick that wouldn't go home with him. He'd started in on me right away about the house being a mess, and I'd given him a dirty look. Unfortunately, he'd caught it, and I'd caught hell. No, I said, remembering his warning. That if I told anyone, he'd use some on my tongue. At least he doesn't on me. That's not what I heard, said Flint, watching me closely. Before I could answer, we heard someone calling our names from below. Shit, I whispered, recognizing Acid's voice. My dad's going to kill me if he sees this. We quickly put our cigarettes out, and Flint shoved the magazine back into his backpack. What the hell you two doing? asked my old man, climbing the tall ladder. When he reached the top, he frowned. It smells like cigarettes up here. Are you two smoking? No, said Flint, looking nervous. No, sir, I said, trying to stay calm. He spotted some ashes in the corner, and his face darkened. What did I tell you about lying, boy? I opened my mouth, but nothing came out. You think I can't see what's going on up here, he snapped. Neither of us said anything. Acid pointed to Flint. Get your ass back to the clubhouse. Church is over and your dad is looking for you. Without another word, Flint slid down the slide and took off running with his backpack. Acid glared at me. You never learn, do you? I fought back tears, knowing that I was in deep shit. He grinned coldly. So what do you got to say for yourself, boy? I'm sorry for lying, I said hoarsely. His hand snaked out and he grabbed my wrist. And you'll be even sorrier when we get home. Looks like I'm going to have to show you again what happens to kids who lie to their parents. Now get off this damn thing. I quickly slid down the slide while he took the ladder, and we walked in silence back to the clubhouse. When he began to whistle, I stole a glance at him and noticed the expression on his face. It was almost euphoric. He was already anticipating my punishment. Someday, I'm going to show you what happens to parents who get off on beating their kids, I vowed, hating him more than ever. Chapter 1 Salt Lake City, Utah 21 years later Jordan Popping the tab on my energy drink, I stared at the warehouse in front of me. The one I had rigged with explosives. The owner of the building, a degenerate by the name of Gerald Piper, was due to arrive at any minute. The man was a sick bastard, involved with human trafficking and illegal porn. I'd been hired to not only take him out, but blow up his newly acquired warehouse in Salt Lake City. Although my knuckles itched to do some collateral damage to the prick's face before ending his miserable life, 
he wasn't my only target. There were other individuals who Gerald was scheduled to meet with. Two bikers from the The Devil's Sons Club. The President Bam and his VP Digger. Apparently, they were silent partners who'd pissed off a rivaling club one too many times. Because the feds were watching my clients closely, they had to keep a low profile, but wanted Gerald Bam and Digger wiped from the grid. Honestly, after learning about their history involving the exploitation of women, children, and farm animals, I'd have done the job for nothing. The world was pretty much lost already, but it would definitely be a little more tolerable without those three scumbags. They deserve to suffer, and my only regret on this job was that their deaths would be swift and painless, unlike the unspeakable crimes committed by them. Catching my reflection in the window of a nearby liquor store, I almost did a double take. Currently, with a long gray beard, bulbous nose, craggly skin, and a beat-up trench coat, I looked and smelled like a ripe transient. The kind that people went out of their way to avoid on the streets. It was one of many disguises that I'd used for jobs, and probably the most effective. Even my own mother wouldn't recognize me. Of course she had no idea what I looked like anyway. Not after bolting when I was an infant. She'd been scared shitless of my old man acid and had taken off, leaving me at the mercy of the sadist. But it's just like that old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Surviving a childhood with acid had undoubtedly made me a tougher, and more resilient person. It also made me cynical. I had no problem looking in the mirror every day. There were far worse assholes roaming the streets. If I could eliminate some of them and earn a fat paycheck at the end of the day, I had no trouble sleeping. The sound of hogs in the distance got my heart thumping faster. Knowing that shit was about to go down, I finished the energy drink and threw the can into the grocery cart I was pushing. Then I headed to the back of the warehouse, watching as two bikers rolled into the parking lot. As they parked their bikes, I pushed the cart slowly, pretending to look for more aluminum cans. Ignoring me, the bikers got off their motorcycles, climbed the steps leading to the building's employee entrance, and pounded on the door. After not getting a response, they turned around and scanned the parking lot, obviously looking for Gerald. When their eyes landed on me, I leaned down and picked up an empty soda can I'd planted earlier, and tossed it into my cart. Then I began pushing it again, this time, talking to myself like a lunatic. Crazy bum, I overheard one of them say, as a caddy pulled into the parking lot. He's talking to himself. Next he'll be singing. Hey you get the hell out of here, said the other guy, glaring at me. Go on. Beat it before we beat you. Smiling, I took my cue and began to sing. I keep a close watch on this heart of mine. I keep my eyes wide open all the time. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds. Because you're mine. I walk the line. Can you believe this piece of shit, Bam? Laughed the other biker. He's singing Johnny Cash. Funny thing is, the asshole doesn't have that bad of a voice, remarked Bam, pulling out a cigarette. I went on. I find it very very easy to be true, I find myself alone when each day's through, yes I'll admit that I'm a fool for you. Because you're mine. I walk the line. The caddy rolled up next to the motorcycles, and the engine shut down. What do you know he showed, mumbled Digger staring at the car. Why wouldn't he? He shrugged. Never know with that asshole. A short squat man carrying a briefcase got out of the car. He walked up the staircase and unlocked the door, not saying much to the bikers, who were still eyeing me. What, no encore? asked Digger when he noticed that I was no longer singing. Really? An encore? Get the hell inside, said Bam pushing him into the building. When the door shut behind them, I turned my cart around and walked away. As sure as night is dark and day is light. I keep you on my mind both day and night and happiness I've known proves that it's right. Because you're mine. I walk the line. Behind me I heard a loud explosion as one of the men inside tripped a detonator. This was followed by another violent blast, one that made the asphalt under my feet tremble. I smiled in satisfaction, knowing that three guys I'd just killed would be walking their own line straight to hell. It was days like this that I truly loved my job. Chapter 2 Jessica
I'm so proud of you, said my mother, Franny, who was sitting across from me at Jake's Steakhouse. After receiving a BSN certificate from the University of Iowa's nursing school, I'd recently passed the state licensing test, and we were celebrating quietly together over dinner. I know I keep telling you that, but I can't help myself. I smiled at her teary eyes. It's okay. It still makes me feel good to hear it, Mom. Oh, before I forget. She reached into her purse and pulled out a small gift-wrapped box. This is from me and Slammer. He wanted to be here tonight but, she sighed, unfortunately he's still in California with Tank. Slammer, my stepfather, was the president of a motorcycle club called the Gold Vipers, and his son Tank was the VP. They were exactly what you'd imagine them to be like too, rugged, cocky and stubborn as all hell. I had to admit they were also pretty badass, which sometimes worked in my favor. Especially Tank, who stood well over six feet, had muscles the size of cantaloupes and was covered in tattoos. Nobody messed with our family. Not recently, anyway. Are they still at that biker rally? Yeah. He wanted to bring me so I could meet someone named Bastard, she said, chuckling. These men and some of their silly road names. He's the founder of the Gold Vipers, I said, remembering Tank talking about it. Personally, I would never understand the club way of life. At least, what the benefits were for the women involved. It made me angry when I saw some of the wives and girlfriends wearing cuts that read, property of. If that wasn't bad enough, many of their men had no problem cheating on these same women with club whores. Those non-profit sluts hung out at the clubhouse just to party and get laid. I thought it was deplorable, but kept my feelings to myself. I wouldn't dare debate about it with Slammer or Tank. They were too set in their ways, and I was obviously an outsider. What happens in the clubhouse stays in the clubhouse was one of their mottos. My only solace in all of this was that Slammer claimed that he didn't fraternize with the whores, and from what I could tell appeared to be deeply in love with my mother. That's right. Slammer mentioned that he's a decorated vet. He really looks up to bastard, she said, nodding toward the box. Anyway, open it. Thanks, Mom. You really didn't have to do this. She waved her hand. Oh, you deserve it. Heck, you deserve more than this. I just wish I could do more for you. You always say that, but I don't think you realize how much you do for me already, I replied, unwrapping the box. I mean, seriously, you've always been there for me and I couldn't ask for much more than that, Mom. That's what we mothers do, she said. Not every mother, I said, thinking about the many conversations that I'd had with Adriana, about her husband Raptor. His mother had abandoned both of her sons, and although she was trying to make amends, it was still hard for Raptor to let go of the past. No, I suppose not, she said, taking a sip of her drink. When I opened the small jewelry box, there was a beautiful bangle bracelet with a circle in the middle that was made of tiny diamonds. Oh my god, it's beautiful, I replied, taking it out of the box. She smiled proudly. I know how much you used to love wearing bangles. We almost bought you a watch but I saw this and it screamed your name. I hope you'll wear it. Definitely. This is a gorgeous piece, I said, although I hadn't worn my other bangles in a long time. After being raped three years ago, I still didn't like to draw much attention to my skin or body. My therapist said that I just needed more time to heal. That things would get easier. Sometimes I wasn't so sure. Adriana showed it to me. I guess it's white gold and those are real diamonds. I hope you didn't spend too much on it. You're worth it, honey, and don't worry. Adriana gave us an exceptionally fair price for it. She's such a nice girl. I liked her too. In fact, we'd gotten to be very good friends over the last three years. She is, and you both have wonderful taste. Put it on, she said, her eyes dancing. I knew how much she loved jewelry herself. I put it on and thanked her again. It's beautiful, Mom. Thank you. You're welcome. So, she said, pulling a green olive out of her glass, you're going to be starting your residency soon? Yes, I replied. In about a month. 
You must be excited, she asked before popping the olive into her mouth. I shrugged. I'm a little nervous. I won't lie. It'll be fine, she said, reaching over to pat my hand. And although I'm a little sad to see you moving so far away, it will give you a fresh start. Shoreview, Minnesota is not that far. Only about five hours. She sighed. Believe me, to a mother it may as well be a continent away. Fortunately, I'd be moving in with her cousin, Cheryl, who was an RN at the hospital where I was doing my residency. I'd used her as a reference, wanting to get away from Jensen, the biker world, and the memories that still haunted me. From what I understood, Shoreview was a nice quiet suburb, free of gang-influenced strongholds and vendettas. I smiled. At least you have Slammer to keep you company. After I'd moved back home, Slammer and Franny had gotten married and then he'd joined us. Although he spent a lot of time at his bar, Griffin's, or the clubhouse, we were still walking all over each other in my mother's townhouse. Although he never complained, I knew he was looking forward to them finally being alone. I know, and you'll have Cheryl. She's excited to have you move in. Ever since her husband Earl died six years ago, she's been very lonely. He died of a heart attack, didn't he? I asked, vaguely remembering him. I knew he'd smoked a lot of cigars and loved telling jokes. Stroke actually, she replied smiling grimly. He was a nice guy. Made everyone laugh. The waitress appeared with our food and we began to eat. She'd ordered a salad while I'd gotten a cheeseburger and fries. That looks delicious, she said, nodding toward my plate. You're lucky that you can eat what you want and not gain a pound. Why didn't you order one of these? You're not overweight. The moment a cheeseburger hits my lips, I put on 10 pounds and my cholesterol skyrockets, she said, pouring some kind of vinegary dressing onto her salad. Wait until you're my age. You'll know what I mean. I smiled at her. Many people said she looked more like my older sister, and I had to admit that I was grateful for her genes. Both of us were around 5'6", with dark blonde hair and hazel eyes. You should still treat yourself once in a while, I replied, knowing that she spent a lot of time doing yoga and Pilates. She'd also quit smoking a few months ago, and was now hounding Slammer to do the same. Thanks honey. Still once I cheat I'm done for. I lost 15 pounds since last winter, and I know how easily it is to slip and gain it all back. I can tell. You look great. I was thinking about joining your kickboxing class, she said, and then took a drink of water. You've really toned up. I'd noticed that my clothes had gotten looser, but hadn't really thought about it. I'd been taking the weekly class more for the self-defense aspect. Not only did they teach you aerobics and kickboxing, but they'd also incorporated some basic taekwondo moves. It's certainly an ass-kicker, but I love it. I'm going to miss the class when I'm gone. I'm sure there are other classes in Shoreview. I nodded. Actually, I was thinking of joining a karate class. Her face lit up. That's a great idea. If you need money for it, let me know. Those programs can get expensive. Thanks but I can pay for it, I replied. I've been able to save quite a bit since you let me move back home. Good. You're getting paid for the residency, aren't you? Yes, thankfully. That's what I thought. How was your car running? I shrugged. Fair. Her lips pursed. Fair. How many miles are on it? I don't know. Somewhere over 100,000, I replied, a little embarrassed that I hadn't been keeping track. You've been getting the oil changed when needed? When is it needed? Her mouth opened in shock. I laughed. I'm kidding. Of course I have. Don't worry about my car. I should get another couple of years out of it. She sighed. Why don't you just take mine? No. You just purchased that thing last year, and I doubt Slammer would be happy if you did. He paid for it, didn't he? He wrote the check but said it was my car to do with what I will, she said firmly. I'm sure he'd understand if I gave it to you, Jessica. He adores you.
Right, I said dryly. I know he's a man of few words, but he really does. In fact, he's just as proud of you as I am. Tank as well. He thinks of you as his little sister and is always asking about you. I had to admit, Tank, as intimidating as he was to everyone else, had a soft spot and was one of the only guys that I truly trusted. Of course, we weren't dating either. That helped. Still, that lacrosse was expensive. I don't need something like that, although I appreciate the offer. Well, if that car gives you any trouble at all, you call me and we'll get it taken care of. Or just buy you a new one. Thanks, Mom. Hopefully, it won't conk out on the way to Minnesota. I grunted. Hopefully. Just then, her cell phone went off. She picked it up and checked her messages. Who is it? I asked, noticing the smile on her face. Slammer. He's here. At home. I mean, he's here. At the restaurant. With Tank. I stared at her in confusion. I thought he was still in California? She giggled. So did I. Come on, she said, sliding out of her booth. Where? We have to finish our food, I replied, staring at her in confusion. He wants us to meet him in the parking lot. Why? She grabbed my hand and pulled me out of the booth. I'm not sure. We'll be right back, she told the waitress. Oh, okay, replied the waitress, looking a little doubtful. Chapter 3 Jordan Two hours after the explosion in Salt Lake City, I stepped onto a commercial plane headed toward my cabin in Anchorage, Alaska. As I buckled myself into first class, a beautiful woman sitting across the aisle from me made eye contact. Recognizing her from a previous flight, I smiled and then grabbed my iPod to listen to music. The last thing I wanted was to get into a long conversation with her. She'd been annoying as all hell the last time we'd flown together. You don't remember me, do you? She asked, flipping her long red hair over her shoulder. I feigned ignorance. We've met? I wasn't at all surprised that she remembered me. The last time I'd seen her, she'd been arguing with her husband, who'd been flirting with one of the flight attendants. It had been over a year ago, and both of them had been slightly drunk. To strike back, she'd started coming on to me after I'd left my seat to use the bathroom. I'd ignored her advances, finding them petty and childish. Yes. I'm Tammy, by the way. My ex and I were flying to Anchorage last year for my sister's wedding. Oh, that was your ex-husband? She smiled with delight, realizing that I had remembered her. Well, we were married then, but not anymore. Our divorce finalized last week, and now I'm off to visit my sister again. Sorry to hear that it didn't work out. I'm not. He was an asshole. I chuckled. Well then congratulations. Thank you. So do you live in Alaska? Just visiting, I lied. Her eyes swept over my black leather vest and tats. Are you one of those motorcycle club bikers? Why do you ask? She grinned. You have that look about you. Plus, she pulled out a book from her purse. There was a picture of a biker on the front cover, with a chick straddling his Harley. I guess you could say that I'm a little obsessed right now. Obsessed, huh? I smiled. Sorry to disappoint. I do own a motorcycle, but I'm not affiliated with any clubs. She began undressing me with her eyes. Something tells me that nothing about you would disappoint. An hour later while Tammy and I were in the bathroom, getting it on, when she noticed some of the scars on my skin where acid had burned me. I'd taken my glove off at one point, and she asked me what was wrong with my hand. The revulsion on her face changed the entire mood. I pulled my hand away from her. Nothing's wrong with it. I think I proved that a few seconds ago. Sensing my irritation, she laughed nervously. Yes. I'm sorry about that. I wasn't expecting that. I guess now I can see why you wear the gloves. Is your other hand scarred too? Not as bad, I said, turning on the faucet so I could wash her smell from my fingers, which was suddenly making me ill. 
Oh well, it's not a big deal, she said, touching my shoulders. The rest of you is more than perfect. The more she talked, the more I understood why she was now single. My ex is a cosmetic surgeon. Have you ever thought about having reconstructive surgery on your hands? No, I said firmly. Why? Because it's my reminder of everything that's messed up with the world. She stared at my hand again, her eyes filled with pity. Damn. That must have hurt like hell. A mental image of acid tying my hands down and then pouring the scalding liquid popped into my head. It had hurt so goddamn bad that I'd passed out. It didn't hold a candle to the abuse acid had carved on the inside, however. Even now, years after his death, there was no relief from the nightmares that still haunted me. Actually, hell would have been easier, I said, opening up the door and walking away. Chapter 4 Jessica I don't get why he doesn't just come into the restaurant. Is there some kind of a problem? I asked, following her toward the exit. She smiled brightly. Not at all. It's a surprise. A surprise? I repeated, wondering what this was all about. Yes. What a beautiful day it's turning out to be. It was the middle of June, and the sun was warm and bright as we stepped outside. I grabbed my sunglasses from my purse and slipped them on as I followed her. It's nice, I agreed. It was the kind of day where I wished we had our own pool. I used to love swimming, and had spent a lot of time at the one at my old apartment complex. Back when I lived with my roommate, before the incident. There they are, she said, grabbing my hand and pulling me toward the end of the parking lot, where Tank and Slammer were waiting. Hi, I said as we approached. Hey Jessica, said Tank, who was leaning against a bright red Mustang, his tanned biceps folded under his chest. How've you been? Great, I replied, admiring the car. I wondered if they'd picked it up in California. Wow, nice ride. That's what I've been told, darlin, said Tank with a wicked grin. I rolled my eyes. The car, lover boy. He's such a meathead, said Slammer. He stepped over and gave me an awkward hug. Congratulations on passing your nursing exam, Jess. Thanks, I replied as he patted my back. Yeah, said Tank. A nurse. That's great. The only thing that I really know about nursing is… He laughed. Hell, who am I kidding? I know nothing. I don't even nurse my beers. I smiled. You goon. Slammer rolled his eyes. And you wanted to be a comedian when you were a kid. Glad I talked you out of it. I wouldn't call what you did talking me out of it, said Tank, smirking. If I remember correctly, you said that the only thing funny about me were my farts. No, what I said is that your jokes would clear a room faster than a fart, said Slammer. Don't listen to him. I think you're funny, said Mom, sliding her arm through Tank's. And you can be whatever you want. There's still time. What are you talking about? He's already living the dream. Gold Viper VP is nothing to whine about, said Slammer. And as far as the future goes, one day he'll inherit the bar and my status. I'm definitely not whining, said Tank. So what's going on? I asked, worried that the waitress was going to think we'd stiffed her. Smiling, Slammer pulled out a key from his leather vest and held it out. Here. For you. I stared at him in confusion as my hand wrapped around the key fob. What is this for? It's a graduation gift, he said, turning to the Mustang. What do you think? Oh, Slammer, squealed Mom, clapping her hands together. How wonderful. My breath caught in my throat as I stared at the gorgeous car, with its glossy red paint and shiny rims. Hold on a second, are you saying that this car is for me? He took off his sunglasses. It sure is. This baby is safe and reliable. Not like that piece of shit you're driving now. As excited as I was, I knew I couldn't accept such an expensive gift. The car is gorgeous. It really is. But. I can't let you give it to me, I said, holding the key back out toward him. It's too much. No no no. 
It's yours, darling. Bought and paid for, said Slammer, waving it away. Seriously, I love the thought, but I just can't accept something like this. You can accept it and you will, he said firmly. Now go sit inside and enjoy it because it's going to be your new best friend for a while. He's right, and if you don't accept the gift, he'll take it as an insult, said Tank, chewing on a toothpick. But? No buts. It's a gift from your mother and me. To you. We want you to have a reliable set of wheels. This one is a beauty and you deserve it, said Slammer, a determined look on his face. Now you can say no all you want, but this baby is yours and there's nothing you can do about it. Hell, your name is already on the title. Seeing the way his jaw was set, I threw my arms around Slammer and this time gave him a hug. Thank you, I said, my eyes filling with tears. He patted my back. You're welcome. Now why don't you go and take it for a spin? Wait, said my mother. We need to get back inside before the waitress calls the cops. We haven't paid for our food. Just what we'd need, said Tank, smirking. To get arrested for not paying a bar tab. That would be humiliating. No shit, said Slammer, looking toward the restaurant. I'm hungry. You don't mind if we join you, do you? Of course we don't mind, said Franny. Afterward, Jessica can try out her new car. Sounds like a plan, said Slammer, slipping his arm around her waist. Let's go eat. Hope the food is better than what they're serving at Griffin's. That new cook I hired just can't get his shit right. Hamburgers are overcooked and the wings taste like roadkill. I tell you I just can't win. I volunteered to help you out, said Franny. You know I make the meanest burgers in town. I know but I don't want you down there. We already talked about this, he said as we entered the building. I don't mind strippers, she said. It's not the strippers I'm worried about, mumbled Slammer. It's some of the dirtbags that walk through the door. They see you and try getting down your pants. She laughed. You're so full of it. No, I'm serious. You're beautiful. Isn't she tank? Yep, he said as we slid into the booth. Hell, you and Jessica could pass for sisters. Blushing, she waved her hand. Oh, you too. Mom, they're right. You look too young to be 45. You're 45, said Tank, winking. No. I thought you were in your 30s. If I was, I wouldn't have a daughter as old as Jessica. Sure you would, said Tank. Some of the girls who hang out at the clubhouses have moms in their 30s. They legal? asked Slammer, frowning. They're all over 18, said Tank. Don't worry about it, old man. I'm keeping track of shit. I do worry about it. I don't want any minors down there. He turned to Franny. I'm not around at night, so sometimes things get out of hand. Whatever. Nothing has been getting out of hand, mumbled Tank, as the waitress walked up to us. Noticing that she was pretty, he gave her a flirtatious smile. Hey there, darlin. Can I get a menu and a cold beer? Certainly. Bottled or tap, she asked, staring at his arms. Bottle. Wow, I love your tats, she said, flipping her hair back. I just got one myself. You did? Where, he asked, his eyes moving up and down her uniform. She backed away and turned her sandal, giving us a glimpse of the rose on her ankle. I'm starting off small. Nothing wrong with that, he replied. When you want something bigger, you should call me. Why, are you a tattoo artist? Oh, were we still talking about tattoos? He asked with a wicked grin. The waitress burst out laughing. You're a handful, aren't you? He wiggled his eyebrows. Call me and you'll find out, sweetheart. I snorted. Jesus Christ. I can't take you anywhere, said Slammer, taking out a vapor cigarette from his pocket. Sorry, hun, I've been trying to train him but he piddles out of his mouth everywhere he goes. Tank flipped him off. It's okay, she said. I think it's cute. Here, she said, writing down her phone number on a napkin. Call me sometime. If you want. Oh, I want, he said, taking it from her. Great. 
I look forward to hearing from you. I'll give you a few minutes to decide what you want to eat, she said, putting her pen into her apron. I'm thinking pie, he said, rubbing his lower lip with his index finger. Can I get a slice of you to go? Tank oh my god I gasped laughing. I looked at the waitress. Sorry. Slammer is right, we really can't take him anywhere. Um, I'll be back, she said, backing away her cheeks red. Weren't you just with Rhonda this morning? asked Slammer, when she was out of earshot. Yeah. So, he said, opening up the menu. She's just a sweet butt anyway. A what? I asked, frowning. It's a groupie, said my mother dryly. I raised my eyebrows. You guys have groupies? Yeah. Women love us, said Tank. My mom opened her mouth to say something, when Slammer put his arm around her shoulders. They love the boys, which is good because the only groupie I want or need is you, babe. He's right. Everyone knows you're the new queen, Franny. In fact, said Tank, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get together with some of the other old ladies. Get to know them a little bit more. As a matter of fact, I am, she said, smiling. We're having a poker party on Friday night. Most of the girlfriends and wives are showing up. Really? Why didn't I hear about that? I said, not exactly thrilled with the idea. Although I liked Adriana, some of the others seemed almost as intimidating as the men in their lives. I was going to bring it up, but then these guys showed up with the big surprise. You'll join us, won't you? She asked me. Uh, sure, I said, knowing I'd be home anyway. Is Adriana going to be there? Yes, she replied. Raptor is staying home with Sammy. It will be good for him. Guess I'll be hanging out with you Friday night, said Slammer to Tank. You know it's fight night, said Tank. Even better, said Slammer. I leaned my chin against my hand. Okay. What's that all about? Tank smirked. Some friendly fisticuffs partying music and babes. What do you mean by friendly fisticuffs? I asked, intrigued. Two guys get into a ring and some punches are thrown until one gets the better of the other. It's all in good fun, said Slammer. Is that legal? asked Franny, looking concerned. Nothing for you to concern yourself with, hun, said Slammer. It's just a bunch of guys having fun. What we do with our money is our own business, anyway. Yeah, said Tank. The cops usually turn their heads on events like this, and some even show up to watch. It's all in good fun. Oh, okay, she said, relaxing. Something told me that it was much more than that, but as long as she wasn't going to be involved in any way, I wasn't about to ask any more questions either. When you leaving for Minnesota, Jess? asked Tank. In two weeks, I replied. You run into any problems out there, you call us, said Slammer, reaching over to grab one of my fries. What do you mean? I asked. Is there something I should be concerned about? He grinned. Relax, sweetheart. I'm talking about money or whatever else that might come up. I relaxed. For a second, I was worried he was talking about club stuff. Oh, okay. But, he said, pointing to me. You're still an attractive, single girl in a new city. If anyone rubs you the wrong way, don't hesitate to call one of us. We'll take care of anything that needs taking care of. You got it? I nodded. I was both flattered but hesitant to take him up on the offer. I knew what had happened to the man that had raped me. I'd heard the whispers and had watched the news. He was dead. Admittedly, I was relieved to know that he couldn't harm me or anyone else again, but I was also worried about my mother. If Slammer was involved with anything else illegal and was caught, it would destroy her. She'd be heartbroken if he ended up in prison. Yeah. We're family, said Tank. We protect our own. That includes the women in our lives. I thought about how Tank's girlfriend had been murdered, and how Adriana had been kidnapped, and found his words ironic, considering their fates. It was their affiliation with the Gold Vipers that had put the girls in danger in the first place. Not to mention my own attack by a rivaling club member. 
None of that had been coincidental. I'll be fine, but I appreciate the offer, I said. My mother cleared her throat. We're following you out there. To Shoreview? Why? Make sure your move goes smoothly, said Slammer. Why wouldn't it? I asked, feeling anxious again. Relax, he said, smiling. Your mother's a little nervous about you moving out of state. Franny smiled. He's right, but only because I'm going to miss you. I'll miss you too, but there's no need to chaperone me, I said. It would be nice to see Cheryl again, she replied. Cheryl was just out here two weeks ago, I said, smirking. Mom, I'll be fine and to be honest, I think I need to do this by myself. But? I agree, said Slammer. And I told your mother that too. Not that I don't want to take a road trip. I love them, especially this time of year, but this will be good for you. What about those Devil's Rangers, she asked. Babe, I told you before, mud is gone and the rest of their chapter is no longer a threat, said Slammer in a low voice. How do you know for certain, she asked. He was silent. Slammer? He sighed. Because most of them are no longer above ground, he said. And from what I've heard from some of my sources, their mother chapter isn't interested in revenge. They're just brushing it off, asked Franny. That's a little surprising, isn't it? Let's just say that Mud and Breaker won't exactly be missed by anyone in the Devil's Rangers, said Slammer. They'd made a lot of enemies, even in their own club. I guess that doesn't surprise me, I mumbled, wishing they'd change the subject. Just hearing the name Breaker made my skin crawl. He was dead, but for me, never forgotten. See, there's nothing to worry about, said Tank, looking at me with a smile. Of course that's great news, said Franny, her shoulders relaxing. But I would still like us to follow you out there. I sighed. Mom. Just me and Slammer, she answered. It will be fun. We'll grab a bite to eat on the way and check out some of the antique shops. Slammer, have you ever visited Stillwater, Minnesota? Can't say I have, he replied. Oh, you'll love it. Cheryl and her late husband once owned a slip in the St. Croix River, and we used to have so much fun on it. This was before you were born, Jessica. Obviously, I replied, having never been to Stillwater myself. Is it near Shoreview? Yes, it's only about 30 miles away. We're going to have so much fun, she said, looking excited now. Would you like to join us, Tank? Antiquing, he asked with a smirk. Yes, and we could do some sightseeing. In fact, we should drive all the way up to the North Shore, she said. Thanks for the invite, but I'm going to pass, said Tank. Someone needs to look after the bar while you're gone. Bullshit. Raptor can keep an eye on things while we're gone. Or one of the others, said Slammer. I'm not going to be the only one suffering through antiquing. Nonsense. You're going to love it, said Franny, glowing with excitement now. You just never know what kind of treasure you'll find in an antique store. Cheryl once picked up a vase that was later valued at $500. She only paid $25 for it. I'm sure that's a rare occurrence. To be honest, thrift and antique stores aren't my thing, said Slammer. But I'll take you wherever you want to go, darlin. Thanks, hun, she replied, kissing him on the cheek. And keep an open mind. You might just have a lot of fun. You too, Tank. Speaking of fun, how are the women in Minnesota, he asked. There won't be time for that, interrupted Slammer as his cell phone went off. We're only staying one night. Who's that, asked Franny as he began to scowl. A prospect. What the hell does he want, he mumbled before answering. This better be important. Dutch. What's up? I couldn't understand what Dutch was saying on the other end of the phone, but Slammer suddenly looked angry as hell. Damn it, he snarled, pounding his fist on the table, startling all of us. He got up and walked away from the booth, still listening to whatever the prospect was saying. I wonder what that's about, asked Franny, looking worried. Don't know, said Tank, standing up. I'll go and make sure everything's okay, though. Thanks, said Franny. After he walked away, I sighed. 
Sounds like club business. Hope it's nothing illegal. It shouldn't be, she said, although her own eyes were full of doubt. Chapter 3 Jordan Two hours after the explosion in Salt Lake City, I stepped onto a commercial plane headed toward my cabin in Anchorage, Alaska. As I buckled myself into first class, a beautiful woman sitting across the aisle from me made eye contact. Recognizing her from a previous flight, I smiled and then grabbed my iPod to listen to music. The last thing I wanted was to get into a long conversation with her. She'd been annoying as all hell the last time we'd flown together. You don't remember me, do you? She asked, flipping her long red hair over her shoulder. I feigned ignorance. We've met? I wasn't at all surprised that she remembered me. The last time I'd seen her, she'd been arguing with her husband, who'd been flirting with one of the flight attendants. It had been over a year ago, and both of them had been slightly drunk. To strike back, she'd started coming on to me after I'd left my seat to use the bathroom. I'd ignored her advances, finding them petty and childish. Yes. I'm Tammy, by the way. My ex and I were flying to Anchorage last year for my sister's wedding. Oh, that was your ex-husband? She smiled with delight, realizing that I had remembered her. Well, we were married then, but not anymore. Our divorce finalized last week, and now I'm off to visit my sister again. Sorry to hear that it didn't work out. I'm not. He was an asshole. I chuckled. Well then, congratulations. Thank you. So, do you live in Alaska? Just visiting, I lied. Her eyes swept over my black leather vest and tats. Are you one of those motorcycle club bikers? Why do you ask? She grinned. You have that look about you. Plus, she pulled out a book from her purse. There was a picture of a biker on the front cover, with a chick straddling his Harley. I guess you could say that I'm a little obsessed right now. Obsessed, huh? I smiled. Sorry to disappoint. I do own a motorcycle, but I'm not affiliated with any clubs. She began undressing me with her eyes. Something tells me that nothing about you would disappoint. An hour later while Tammy and I were in the bathroom, getting it on, when she noticed some of the scars on my skin where acid had burned me. I'd taken my glove off at one point, and she asked me what was wrong with my hand. The revulsion on her face changed the entire mood. I pulled my hand away from her. Nothing's wrong with it. I think I proved that a few seconds ago. Sensing my irritation, she laughed nervously. Yes. I'm sorry about that. I wasn't expecting that. I guess now I can see why you wear the gloves. Is your other hand scarred too? Not as bad, I said, turning on the faucet so I could wash her smell from my fingers, which was suddenly making me ill. Oh well, it's not a big deal, she said, touching my shoulders. The rest of you is more than perfect. The more she talked, the more I understood why she was now single. My ex is a cosmetic surgeon. Have you ever thought about having reconstructive surgery on your hands? No, I said firmly. Why? Because it's my reminder of everything that's messed up with the world. She stared at my hand again, her eyes filled with pity. Damn. That must have hurt like hell. A mental image of acid tying my hands down and then pouring the scalding liquid popped into my head. It had hurt so goddamn bad that I'd passed out. It didn't hold a candle to the abuse acid had carved on the inside, however. Even now, years after his death, there was no relief from the nightmares that still haunted me. Actually, hell would have been easier, I said, opening up the door and walking away. Chapter 5 Jordan I took a cab to my cabin, which was on Sand Lake. When I arrived, I started a load of laundry, took a shower, and went for a motorcycle ride relieved to be back in Anchorage. As I started my Harley and took off, I began to let go of the last few hours, enjoying the wind in my face and the freedom of the open road. Fortunately, it was close to dinner time and the traffic was light, making it that much more enjoyable. I cruised for about an hour and then decided to head back, stopping at a gas station to fill my tank. 
As I was putting my credit card back into my wallet, my cell phone rang. It wasn't a number I recognized. Hello? Judge? It was Slammer. Yeah, what's up? I hate to bother you, brother, but we've got some problems back here in Jensen. I think we're going to need your help. What kind of problems? He sighed. I know you weren't close to your mother, but... Jesus Christ, I'll just say it, she's been murdered. I'm sorry, son. You sure it was murder? I asked, feeling more numb than anything. Not a heart attack, stroke, or drug overdose? It was murder. She was shot. Did she owe her drug dealer money? Nah. Raptor said she'd been clean for the last couple of years, and I've run into her a few times. She was doing pretty well, as far as I could tell. Maybe she had a relapse? It's always possible, I guess. There will be an autopsy, so we'll know for sure if there were any drugs involved. Who found her? Her roommate did, early this morning. I suppose Raptor wants to know who did it, and that's where I come in. You got it. I sighed. He should hire a private detective. Don't you want to find out who did it too? She was your mother. To be honest, I don't really care. Raptor seems to think she was killed because of mud and breaker. That thing with the Devil's Rangers three years ago? I'd been commissioned by Slammer to kill two members of a rival club, Breaker for raping Slammer's stepdaughter, and their club president, Mud, for kidnapping Raptor's wife. Why would they go after Mavis, though? Revenge. They now know she's your mother. Guess they won't get the reaction they anticipated from me, I replied, as an attractive woman pulled up to the pump next to mine. She got out of her car and stared at me. I smiled at her and turned away. Raptor is pretty shaken up though, said Slammer. They'd gotten close the past few months. My younger stepbrother, Trevor, a.k.a. Raptor had been much more forgiving toward Mavis. Of course he'd had her in his life for 13 years. She hadn't even given me six months before taking off and leaving me with acid. If it has to do with the Devil's Rangers, you should be able to handle this on your own, I said. You'd think but the feds are watching us, mumbled Slammer. I can't get us involved. Same old song and dance. Why this time? He lowered his voice. They got wind of some bogus arms deal that went down last summer. Can't pin anything on us but that doesn't stop them from trying. Obviously you weren't involved in an arms deal, I said dryly. Of course not, he replied, a smile in his voice. I run a biker club and a strip joint. I know nothing about running guns. Why don't you just let the cops handle this thing with Mavis? They're already looking into it, but you and I both know that it's not going to go anywhere. He sighed. Truth is. I'm worried about Raptor. He's talking about taking matters into his own hands. Now that he has a kid, he can't be doing that shit. He'll get himself killed. He should be fine if he has club help. I answered, although I was a little skeptical about Raptor getting involved myself. Sammy didn't need his old man going to jail, especially over Mavis. As I said earlier, we're under surveillance. I told him that we should wait, but he's all fired up and wants to do something now. Order him not to. You're the prez. If it comes down to it, I will. I don't want to see him going to prison. But he's so pissed off. I don't know if he'll back down. Do you have any leads on which chapter might have ordered the hit? I think it came directly from the mother. Just found out tonight that they've got themselves a new president. Someone who was tight with mud. You know anything about this guy? A little. John Hughes is his birth name. He goes by Reaper now. He just got out of prison a few months ago and took his old man's place in the club after he had a heart attack. Reaper, I repeated. Yeah, I recognize the name. He's a hothead. Acts before he thinks. I'm surprised they elected him president. If you saw the size of this guy, you'd understand why he gets his way. From what I hear he makes Tank look like a toddler. I frowned. 
Something told me if Trevor went into this by himself, he wouldn't be coming back out on his feet. Is this line safe? Yeah. I borrowed the phone from a waitress at the restaurant I'm at. Good, I said, turning around to see the woman who'd been pumping her gas walking toward me. Hold on a second. Sure, said Slammer. I apologize for interrupting your call, but I'm in a hurry and I wanted you to have this. The blonde removed her sunglasses and handed me a business card. From the laugh lines around her eyes, I guessed her to be in the neighborhood of 40. I looked down and read her name. Caitlin Ferraro, attorney at law. Am I in trouble? I asked smiling at her. She tilted her head and smiled back. No, but something tells me that you are trouble, handsome. I could use a little of that in my life, she said in a low voice. Especially living up here. Is that right? I asked, amused that I'd been hit on twice in one day. Yes. I just moved to Anchorage, and the nights have been so dull lately. Call me, she replied. If you'd like to ride more than just your Harley. Nothing like getting to the point, I said, surprised at her bluntness. Even the woman on the plane had bought me a drink before propositioning me. I work over 60 hours a week and don't have time for socializing. When I know what I want, I go for it. Right now she undressed me with her eyes. I'm looking at it. I felt my jeans tighten at the bold way she was staring at my zipper. The woman meant business. What in the hell was going on with the women in Alaska? Aren't you even going to ask if I'm married? She laughed. I'm a divorce attorney. I already know that it probably wouldn't matter anyway. Look sweetheart, I just want to hook up with you. That's it. I can respect that. I thought you might. I better let you get back to your call. Don't lose my card. I won't, I said, slipping it into my pocket. She walked back over to her car and got in. Did I just hear that correctly? Asked Slammer still on the phone. Some chick offering to bang you? Sounds that way, I replied, watching Caitlin drive away. You want me to let you go? We can talk later. No. She's gone. He sighed. So what do you think about this situation with Mavis? I'll call Raptor and hopefully we can come up with something that won't land him behind bars. Good. It would be a damn shame if he did. I agree. You know if this is Reaper he might be going after more than just Mavis. I was thinking about that myself. I've let everyone else in the club know. To keep an extra eye on their families. Fortunately, most of the old ladies know how to use a gun. Knowing how to use a gun meant nothing when you were caught off guard. If there was more retaliation, more death, it wouldn't show up with any kind of warning. You tell Bastard about this yet? Bastard was the president of the Gold Viper's mother charter. Smart and level-headed, he usually never acted upon impulse. That was until he'd met April, his new old lady. She'd also been a victim of the Devil's Rangers. They'd killed her brother and she'd finagled her way into Bastard's life soon afterward, obviously wanting his help. And help he had. Not only did he send his boys in to take care of the remaining Devil's Rangers living in Minnesota, but surprisingly, he'd reached some kind of peaceful agreement with their mother chapter. Apparently, Reaper was now pissing all over that treaty. He knows. He getting involved? He's waiting to find out what we're going to do about it, if anything. You mean what I'm going to do about it, I thought. Okay. I'll call Raptor. Hopefully we can figure something out. And avenge your mother's death? If that's what Raptor wants. Why not? I said dryly. It's what we all want. You of all people know that Mavis made mistakes, but she didn't deserve to die. Not for club business. Not for any of this shit. I didn't want to hear any more about Mavis, and I could tell he was in his preaching mode. I gotta go. I'll contact you when I arrive in Jensen. Sounds good. I hung up and called Raptor. I heard about Mavis, I said when he answered. Sorry for your loss. 
it was your loss too, he said huskily. Yeah, I suppose, I answered, not wanting to argue about it anymore. So, you think it was club related? My gut is telling me. Swear to God she'd cleaned up her act. No drinking. No drugs. No enemies. Nothing else makes sense. We have to assume it's club related, brother. Yeah, I would have to agree, I admitted. He let out an exasperated sigh. Jesus, is this shit with the Rangers ever going to stop? You already know the answer to that. Even if Reaper disappears, a new president will fill his place. Your two clubs have it out for each other, and the way it looks, it's never going to end. I know. There's never been bloodshed like this though. Damn cowards are attacking innocent women. They have no code of honor. No ethics. Apparently not. You at the bar? I asked as he took a drink of something. There was music in the background, and laughter. I'm at the clubhouse. I needed something to calm my nerves. Where's Adriana and my nephew? I asked, picturing Sammy. He was a cute kid, with his big blue eyes and chubby dimpled cheeks. Raptor had recently sent me some pictures of him, and I'd saved them on my phone. I'd never seen the kid in person, but there was no denying that his smile tugged a little at my heart. At her mother's house. Don't worry, if you met Vanda, you'd know they're both in good hands. As far as I was concerned, Adriana and Samuel were far from being safe. Right now I'm more worried about you. Sober up and get your shit together. I'm flying out as soon as I can charter a plane. I was hoping you'd say that. Call me when you get here. I will, I said. Make sure you keep an eye on your family. If what you're thinking is right and Reaper is involved, something tells me that this is just the beginning. I will. We have a club meeting in two hours. Once that's over, I'll find a safer place safe for Adriana and Sammy. Good. After we hung up, I got on my bike, headed back to the cabin, and repacked. Then I called a friend of mine named Barney, who owned a small plane, and talked him into flying me down to Iowa. I didn't even know you were back, he said. I just got back. Hope the government is paying you well, replied Barney, who thought I was an IRS auditor. Well enough to own a cabin home that I never get the chance to enjoy, I said dryly. Once you retire you can put it all behind you and enjoy the peace and tranquility of the wilderness. Believe me, I'm looking forward to it, I replied, imagining myself fishing in a canoe with a dog on one side and a case of beer on the other. You ever think about retiring early? He asked. Every day. Mercenary work paid well and had its rewards, especially knowing that I was removing some of the worst scum of the earth. But as time went by, I found that murder, even what I deemed as justifiable, didn't disturb me anymore. Taking another life wasn't supposed to be that easy on a man's soul, and that lack of emotion wasn't lost on me. Chapter 6 Jessica When Slammer and Tank returned to the table, I could tell something was very wrong. Mom noticed it too. What's happening, she asked, watching his face carefully. Slammer glanced around the room and then answered in a low voice. Raptor's mother was found. Murdered. Oh my god, do they know who did it? asked Franny shocked. They're not sure yet, he replied. She put a hand to her chest. Poor Raptor. Are you certain it was murder? He nodded. I cleared my throat almost afraid to ask. Do you think it has anything to do with the Devil's Rangers? It might, he answered. They have a new president. A guy who just got out of prison and was close friends with Mud, from what I understand. My stomach tightened. Mud was the president of the charter that Breaker belonged to, right? Yes. Then her death probably had something to do with me, I stated, feeling ill. No, said Slammer firmly. And listen to me, none of these deaths were your fault, so don't even go there. The guy was a monster and so was Mud. He's right and obviously those men in that club are all monsters, said Franny, reaching over to grab my hand. She squeezed it. 
You were a victim just like April's brother and she looked at Tank, her eyes sad, Crystal. The vein in Tank's forehead began to pulse at the mention of her name. He looked down at his knuckles in deep thought. Exactly, said Slammer. And those guys have gotten everything they deserve. Franny sighed and let go of my hand. I guess what I'd like to know is why on earth would the club go after Mavis? Because of her relation to Raptor, said Tank, coming to life again. Pop, we need to lock down the women and figure this shit out quickly. Something tells me this asshole, Reaper, isn't finished. I agree, he said quietly, looking like he'd aged ten years since taking the phone call. Lock down the women? Repeated Franny, her eyes wide. Are we in danger too? Probably not, but we're not taking any chances, said Slammer, waving toward the waitress. We've got to go. I need the both of you to follow us to the clubhouse. Why there? I asked, grimacing. I'd never been to the unsavory place, and the stories I'd heard from Adriana were enough to make me never want to visit. Because I'm holding a club meeting, and right now I don't want to let you two out of my sight, he said matter-of-factly. Franny's lips tightened. I don't like to sound like a nag, but you said we were safe from all of this. Sighing, Slammer put his arm around her shoulders. I know and I'm sorry. I thought it was all behind us too. We're just taking precautions until we know for sure what's happening. What about the cops? Can't you just tell them who you think did it? I asked. See if they'll bring this guy, Reaper, in for questioning? It's not that easy. Besides, you know how it is, Jess, we take care of our own problems, he said. This is a repeating problem. One that doesn't seem to be going away, I replied, frustrated. It just gets worse and worse. People are dying and now we have to hide out at the clubhouse? Just because you want to take care of it yourself? Now a vein began to also throb in Slammer's forehead. You're not looking at the big picture. The problem did go away, and it was because of us. He smiled grimly. Care to guess why it's returning? I sighed. Why? Because of our wonderful justice system. They let that scumbag out of prison and now he's murdering people, said Slammer. That's what happens when you involve law enforcement, sweetheart. So, what you're saying is that if you get your hands on him, this will all be over? I replied. Again. What I'm saying is that we'll handle it, he said sternly. And if something else happens, we'll handle that too. I looked at my mother, whose face was chalk white. Mom, I hate to say I told you so, but you said that we'd both be protected from this kind of thing, and I don't know how many times I warned you that something like this was going to happen. Now we have to go into hiding because our lives are in danger, I said, my voice shaky. Again. Maybe next time, you'll listen to reason instead of what your heart wants you to believe. Don't come down on her, said Slammer before she could answer. It's not her fault. I snapped my head toward him. You're right there. It's yours. You told her what she wanted to believe, just so she'd be your old lady. Jessica, gasped Franny, staring at me in shock. Say what you want to me, but don't talk that way to him. Slammer's shoulders slunk. It's okay, he replied, looking weary. She's not completely wrong. I did make promises that I had no right making. I just wanted you in my life, babe. You can't blame him for this, said my mother, ignoring him. Slammer has done everything he can to try and protect us, Jessica. You know that. Which isn't much, apparently, I mumbled, looking away. Because we have to go into hiding. Jess, we don't even know if Reaper is responsible for Mavis's death, said Tank. Hell, we could all be jumping to conclusions. Somehow, I doubt it. I let out a frustrated sigh. Tank, could you excuse me? I need to use the bathroom. I'm starting to feel sick to my stomach. Sure, he said, sliding out of the booth to let me out. Are you going to be okay? I will be when I'm far enough away from Jensen. In fact, I said, standing up. I'm calling Cheryl to see if she'd mind if I drove down there tonight. That's a good idea, said Franny, pulling a tissue out of her purse. You should. 
I want you to come with me, Mom. At least until the club has handled it, I said, still digging into Slammer. Franny shook her head. No. I can't leave right now. There is too much going on. Actually, it's a good idea, said Slammer, turning to her. You should go with her to Cheryl's. At least for a few days. Tank can follow you both up there. Make sure you arrive safely. But I can't just leave my job with such little notice. Not right now, she protested. We have an audit coming up next week. There's so much paperwork to get ready. My mother was an office manager in a nursing home. She'd worked there for over 20 years and had hardly ever missed a day. From what it sounded like, she was the glue that held the entire office together. When she'd returned from her honeymoon, three years before, everything had been a mess. Unpaid bills, lost forms, and money missing from the lockbox. Tell them a relative has died and you need to attend their funeral, said Slammer. They'll understand. I don't know, she said, frowning. If you ask me, we should both get out of town before one of us needs a funeral, I muttered, walking toward the bathroom. Fortunately, Slammer was able to talk my mother into leaving town with me that evening. Just for a couple of days, she said, still looking a little unsure. I'll drive separately, of course. Right, and as I was saying in the restaurant, Tank will accompany the both of you to Minnesota, added Slammer, turning to him. You'll skip church tonight. I figured as much, he said, glancing at me. How much time do you need to get your stuff together? Not long. I've already packed some of it, so maybe an hour at the most? I replied, my eyes darting around as we walked out of the restaurant. There were hardly any cars around and it was still daylight, but I almost felt like we were being watched. How long will it take for you to pack, Franny? asked Slammer. Not long, although, she said, looking down at her watch, it's getting late. By the time we leave town, it will probably be after nine. Maybe we should wait until morning? No. The more I think about it, the better I feel about you leaving town. Tank, follow the girls home and call me when you get there. Sure, he said, pulling his keys out of his jeans. If I'm tailing them to Shoreview, though, I'm going to need to stop home and grab some stuff for the road trip. Tank still lived in Slammer's old house, which was close to Griffin's, the strip joint he owned. That's fine. Just do it after you make sure they get home without issues, he said. I will, said Tank. You okay with this? I asked him. Tank wasn't always an easy person to read. Right now, he seemed a little too quiet. Of course I am, he said, breaking into a smile. Gotta keep little sis safe. Not to mention my mama bear over there. Franny smiled. She loved it when he called her that. His own mother had died of cancer when he was two years old, and although some of the other club members' old ladies had helped to take care of him, he'd never had anyone else to really call mom. And you do a great job of it, Justin, she said, this time calling him by his real name. I'm fearless when you're around. You're like our own personal Superman. Just don't be too fearless, said Slammer, eyeing a dark SUV that was parked but idling across the street. He's not bulletproof. Mom and I looked at each other and frowned. Tank laughed and put a hand on her shoulder. Leave it to Pop to become overly dramatic. Nobody is going to start shooting at us. They do, and I don't care who's watching, I'm cleaning house, said Slammer, still staring at the SUV. And screw the feds or anyone else who tries stopping me. When we reached my mother's car, Slammer pulled Franny into his arms and held her tight. I'm going to miss you, babe. I wish I could join you. I know, but you've got your hands full here in town, she said softly. I couldn't hear his answer. They murmured a few things quietly to each other, and then kissed. Afterward, he released her and turned to me. Watch over your mother, he said. Of course, I replied, noticing again how weary he looked. With his gray hair and weathered skin, he suddenly looked much older than 57. Truthfully, I'd noticed that he'd aged quite a bit since I'd first met him three years ago. The drinking, smoking, and stress of being a club president wasn't doing him any favors. Slammer gave me another hug, and then nodded toward the red Mustang. 
So you like the car? I grinned. Are you kidding me? I love it. Thanks again. You're welcome, darlin. He put his sunglasses on and lowered his voice. To be honest, I did it for you and your mother. She worries about you so much, you know? I glanced at my mom, who was saying something to Tank. Believe me, I know. He walked over to his bike and picked up his helmet. Happy wife, happy life. I smiled. Anything goes wrong with the car, you call me. I will, I said. Good. I'm heading out. Call me before you leave, Franny, said Slammer. I will, she said. I love you. I love you too. Tank, don't go back to get your stuff until you've secured the townhouse, said Slammer. Will do, replied Tank, getting onto his motorcycle. I'll meet you both at our place, I told my mother. Okay. Waving at the guys, I got into the Mustang and started the engine, enjoying the feel of the leather seats and that new car smell. When I left the parking lot and accelerated, the engine rumbled with power. As much as I was frustrated with what was happening with the club, I had to admit, the car was very nice. Chapter 7 Jessica My cell phone rang as I drove home. It was Tank. What's up? I asked. I just ran out of gas. The damn gauge isn't working for some reason, he said angrily. I looked in the rearview mirror and found that I was alone. Oh crap. Do you need a ride to the gas station? I'm with Franny right now. She's giving me a ride. Oh good. When you get back to the house, park across the street and don't get out. Wait for me. Okay. Sorry. There's no reason to be. It's not your fault. He grunted. My old man would be the first to disagree. Anyway, we'll get back to the house as quickly as possible. Remember, don't get out of the car. I won't. See you soon. Okay. I said. After we hung up, I called Adriana's cell phone to see if she was doing okay. I heard what happened, I told her. I'm so sorry. Thanks. How are you and Raptor holding up? Okay, I guess. Sammy and I are with my mother right now. I haven't heard from him for a few hours though, she replied. It's making me nervous. He was pretty shaken by the news. I can imagine. Have you talked to the cops? Yes. They don't have any leads right now. Trevor thinks it was the Devil's Rangers. She let out a ragged sigh. I thought that nightmare with them was behind us. Yeah. Me too. Looks like it won't ever go away. Adriana sighed again. Looks like. Well, I'm leaving town. I just wanted to call to make sure everything is okay with you. Where are you going? I explained. Shoot. I was hoping to get together with you before you left for Minnesota. Obviously, leaving right now is the best thing to do though. If these guys went after Mavis, none of us are safe in this town. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. What about you and Sammy? Do you think it's safe staying in Jensen? We don't really have a choice but to stay. Trevor assures me that we'll be fine though. He's going to have a couple of the prospects keep an eye on us when he's away. We also had a home security system put in a couple of weeks ago. Even with all of that, you're still staying with Vanda? Yes, but just until tomorrow. Trevor feels that the Devil's Rangers wouldn't have an address for her or Jim, especially now that they moved into his place, so we're just hanging out here for the next 24 hours. So, you're going home tomorrow? I hope so. I don't like having to feel like this. Frightened, you know? And she laughed. I miss my damn house. She and Raptor had just moved into a newly constructed home in the suburbs. I'd been to their housewarming party and could understand her frustration with not being able to be there. It was certainly beautiful. Does she know who you think killed Raptor's mom? 
I asked, remembering the stories about Vanda and her contempt toward the club. She'd eased up, but from what Adriana had said, the biker life still worried her. No. She only knows that Mavis is dead, but that's it. She thinks we're staying here because I'm grieving and want her support. Obviously, I am pretty shaken too, but if I told her that we thought it was the Devil's Rangers, she'd pack our bags and ship us to Canada herself. Canada might not be a bad idea, I mumbled, especially if those freaks are really in town and still looking for revenge. After what happened three years ago with Mud and knowing what their club is capable of, I'd have to agree. The farther away from Jensen, the better. If you want, I can swing by and pick you and Sammy up. Bring you two with me to Cheryl's? I said, meaning it. Thanks for the offer, but we couldn't leave Trevor, and obviously, he's not going anywhere. He hasn't said much, but I'm pretty sure he's already looking into retaliation. She sighed. It's just a never-ending cycle. I don't know how much more of this I can take to be honest. My eyes widened. Are you thinking of leaving him? No, but I might threaten to, just to get him out of this bullshit. It's not just about him and the gold vipers anymore. It's about keeping Sammy safe. I get it. Believe me, I replied, worried about my mother. Look, if you ever need anything or just want someone to talk to, call me. I mean it. I will, and the same goes to you. I don't care what time of the day or night it is, call me if you need to talk. I smiled. She was a good friend, and I already missed her. Thanks. Once I'm settled, you'll have to take a trip up to Shoreview for a visit. Sounds like fun. Oh, I'm getting another call. Looks like it's Trevor. Drive safely and thanks for calling, Jessica. It was good hearing from you. It was good for both of us. You take care too. Give Sammy a kiss for me. I will. Goodbye. Goodbye. I hung up, slid my phone back into my purse, and drove home. When I pulled up to the house, I parked across the street, turned off the engine, and waited. Not seeing anything unusual, I relaxed and closed my eyes. Leaning my head against the seat, I thought about Adriana and Sammy, and hoped they'd be okay. Not only was she incredibly sweet, she was a good mother with a lot of patience for someone our age. We were both 24, and I couldn't imagine having a child right now myself. Of course, our situations were much different, and the thought of a man touching me intimately was still hard to think about. Even after the counseling and support meetings that I'd been to, I knew it would be a while before I allowed anyone into my bed. Admittedly, I did read a lot of romance books and longed for something that I wasn't naive enough to believe was real. A hero who would sweep me off my feet, protect me from the bad guys, and when it came to sex, had the patience of a saint. My own personal superhero. Snorting to myself, I opened my eyes and then gasped loudly when I noticed a man staring at me from outside of my car window. Sorry, he said loudly, smiling at me. He had long blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail and a shortly cropped beard. Didn't mean to frighten you. I looked down and my heart stopped when I noticed the cut. He was a devil's ranger. Do you live around here? He asked, apparently not knowing who I was trying not to panic. I shook my head. His smile widened. Could you roll down your window? He hollered. So we can talk? I started the engine. Sorry, I need to be somewhere, I said loudly. Then, before he could respond, I put the car in drive and stepped on the gas, grateful that nobody was in front of me. As I began driving away, I grabbed my phone and called my mother. I'm almost there, she answered. Don't go home, I said quickly, looking in my rearview mirror. When I saw two bikers following me, I gasped in shock. Oh my god. They're following me. She sucked in her breath. Who? My heart felt like it was beating out of my chest. Devil's Rangers, I said, watching as they hung back. What? There are two of them. They're not being aggressive, but I think they know who I am. Were they at the house? Yes, I said, grabbing my purse. 
With shaky hands, I reached in and pulled out the small Taurus revolver I'd kept hidden. Then I grabbed the box of bullets out of the other side. Listen to me, call 911, she ordered her voice shrill. Tell them you're being followed by someone who means you harm. Yeah. Okay. I will, I replied, turning a corner quickly. As I looked into my rearview mirror again, I noticed the two bikers kept going straight and relaxed. Wait. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. They were at the house, but the two guys who I thought were following me didn't turn when I turned. They're gone. She let out a sigh of relief. Okay. Honey, drive directly to the clubhouse. I'll call Slammer and let him know what's going on. Okay. Where are you? I'm about a mile away from the townhouse. I'm turning around. I'll meet you at the clubhouse instead. Okay. If you see them again, call the police. I will, I said, still trying to calm down. My entire body was shaking, knowing that they were out there somewhere, trying to find us. I love you. I love you too, Mom. After we hung up, I turned down another block and headed toward the clubhouse, like she'd said. As I stopped at a light, the phone rang again. It was Tank. Hi. I take it you heard? Yes, he replied. How many were there? It looked like there were only two of them. I then explained what happened. Assholes, he growled. Okay, get your ass to the clubhouse. I'll meet you and Franny there as soon as possible. Okay. Don't stop off anywhere else, and if you see them again, call me immediately. If I see them again, I'm calling the cops. Only if your life is in danger, he said. We'd like to handle these guys ourselves. I rolled my eyes. Right. I'm thinking if I see them again, my life will be in danger. Let's hope you don't, he said. See you soon. Okay. I hung up and looked down at my gun again. I'd started feeling a little paranoid carrying it, but after what had just happened, I was happy that I'd kept it in my purse. Shoving it along with the box of bullets back into my handbag, I continued down two more blocks to a stop sign. As I was about to drive forward, a black van flew around my car and came to a screaming halt. Oh my god, I gasped, horrified as two men jumped out and rushed toward my car holding guns. Get out! Hollered the same guy who'd been outside of my house minutes before. His friendly smile was long gone, and I could see that he meant business. Now! Paralyzed with fear, I stared at him. He raised his gun. I'll kill you now if you don't open the damn thing. Trembling, I reached toward the door to unlock it when the biker on the other side of the car, a heavy set guy with long curly hair and a bushy beard, pointed his gun toward an SUV. I watched in horror as he fired it. Oh my god! I screamed, covering my mouth. The windshield exploded and the driver, an elderly man, slumped forward. Get out. Now. Repeated the fat guy who'd shot him. Or more people are going to die, including you. Shaking violently, I grabbed my purse and unlocked the door, hoping they'd let me keep it long enough for me to get my gun and bullets. The blonde, who I noticed had the name Stryker embossed on his cut, grabbed my arm and pulled me out roughly. What do you want with me? I sobbed as he dragged me over to the van. His hand was locked around my wrist like a vice, and I could feel his nails digging into my skin. Shut the hell up, he growled over his shoulder, glaring at me. You've already caused enough problems. Problems? I don't know any of you, I cried, as he shoved me against the van, his gun still pointed at me. Why are you doing this? Ignoring the question, he noticed my purse and snatched it from me. You're not going to need makeup where we're going. Or maybe she will? Laughed the other biker, as Stryker tossed it to him. Reaper can't seem to get enough pussy now that he's out of prison. He might like this one. No please. I cried, trying to pull away. Why are you doing this? Because of who you are, darlin', said the heavy-set guy with the name Grady stitched onto his cut. I don't know who you think I am, but you're wrong. I'm nobody. Please just let me go. 
I won't say anything, I begged. I promise. Good idea. Keep your mouth shut, said Grady. Women should be seen and not heard. Chuckling, Stryker pushed me into the van just as sirens began to blare in the distance. Then he slammed the door and locked me inside. Let me out. I screamed, pounding on the door with my fists. I heard the sound of the men getting into the van and seconds later was thrown backward as we peeled away. Feeling as if all was lost and my fate was sealed, I put my hands over my face and cried. Chapter 8 Jordan I was just getting ready to board the plane when Slammer called me. I've got a problem, he said angrily. My stepdaughter Jessica is missing. What do you mean? Franny told me that she called her about 20 minutes ago and said Jessica thought that she was being tailed by some of the Devil's Rangers. I swore. This was the same girl who'd been raped. It didn't look good for her. Where was Jessica when she spotted them? Leaving our townhouse. She took off and was supposed to meet everyone here at the clubhouse, but hasn't showed up yet. She's not answering her phone either. Franny is worried sick. I'll get there as quickly as possible, I said. In the meantime, I'll make some phone calls. Find out as much as I can about Reaper, and see if anyone knows where he might be holding up. I'd appreciate it, brother. I hung up and got into Barney's plane, a small beechcraft that I'd ridden in at least a dozen times. Can I use my cell when we're up? I asked him. Normally, I wasn't much of a phone conversationalist, so I'd never bothered checking with him before. You won't get a good signal. If it's urgent, I'd make the call now before we fly. Okay. How long will it take to get to Jensen, do you suppose? He looked at his watch. About six hours. Okay. Give me a minute, I said, shoving my travel bag into one of the compartments. No problem. I stepped back outside and began making calls. Eventually, I found a contact who knew something. Brett Davis. Reaper has an uncle with a cabin in Cedar Rapids, said Brett. Rumor has it that he was going to be visiting it soon. Which was only a couple hundred miles from Jensen, I thought. You got a name or address? I asked him. No, but I can make some phone calls. I'd appreciate it, I replied. I'll call you back in a few. Okay. Leave a message if I don't answer. Will do. We hung up and I stepped back onto the plane. You ready? asked Barney. Just ten more minutes. Sorry. He laughed. No problem. I'm in no rush. Sophie is out of town and I'm supposed to be fixing the fence in the backyard. Wasn't looking forward to that pain in the ass project. Now I have an excuse to put it off longer. Sophie was his wife. I'd never met her, but had heard plenty about her. I'd known Barney for two years and he was a good pilot. He was also a good storyteller. He liked to reminisce about his life and didn't ask a lot of questions about mine, which was one of the reasons why I'd stuck with him. If you need help let me know, I told him. I'd never been to his place and normally like to keep things impersonal with business associates, but Barney was no spring chicken. Helping a guy like him out seemed like the right thing to do. I might take you up on that, he said, reaching into his travel bag. He pulled out a large, metal lunchbox. Since we're waiting, I may as well eat. You want an egg salad sandwich? I made some for the flight. No, that's okay. Thank you though. You sure? I made plenty. Just in case. My stomach growled. I hadn't eaten for a while. You sure? Of course I'm sure. Here, he said, handing me one wrapped in plastic. I've got some bottled water, too. Help yourself. Thank you, Barney. You're a lifesaver, I said unwrapping it. I took a bite. It's good. You make it yourself? One of the few things I know how to make. Sophie spoils me. Does all the cooking, usually. He patted his stomach. She's been gone for two days though. I've already lost a couple pounds. 
I smiled. He wasn't fat but he looked well fed. He also had many laugh lines and his blue eyes were always twinkling. You're a lucky man. I know. I thank the stars every day that she's put up with my orneriness. You're ornery? I asked surprised. I would have never guessed. You're always in a good mood. He shrugged. I'm diabetic. If I don't eat regularly, I can be a bit of an asshole. I didn't know you were diabetic. I take insulin shots and make sure I have this lunchbox filled with oranges and wheat thins, he said, patting it. Shit. I'm sorry for eating one of your sandwiches. You going to be okay for the flight? I made extra. Don't worry. Well, I appreciate you doing this. I know the flight was spur of the moment. Like I said, it was a win-win situation. Good. So, how long have you and Sophie been married again? 42 years. Wow. That's impressive. He nodded. Mind you, it hasn't been easy. Relationships take work, and there were times when we wanted to kill each other. But in the end, it's all been worth it. I get to spend my dying days with a woman I've shared so much with. So no regrets? Nope. Well, it would have been nice if we could have had kids. Maybe even adopted. Couldn't have them, huh? No. We tried for years but found out later that she had a condition. Something called endometriosis which made it harder to get pregnant. What about treatment? I asked having heard the term but not what it meant. It didn't help much. She didn't want to take any fertility drugs either. Always said that if it was meant to be, it would happen. Guess it wasn't meant to be, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. At least you had each other and still do. He nodded smiling. What about you? Anyone special in your life these days? No. Why not, he asked seriously. I shrugged. I don't know. I guess there really isn't room in my life for a relationship. Too busy, huh? You could say that, I replied. I'm always involved with work and obviously I travel too much. So you've never been in love? Can't say I have, I replied. What about dating or, he winked, knocking boots? A fellow like you must get plenty of women. I get my share, I replied. Usually just one night stands. Life is short and before you know it, you'll be staring up at the ceiling at night, wondering where it went and why you feel so empty inside. A job pays the bills but it shouldn't be your entire life. I already stared at the ceiling at night, but it was because I had plenty of enemies and knew I was being hunted. I didn't need to share any of them with a woman. I get what you're saying, I said, knowing that he was speaking from the heart. I do. Honestly, I guess I just haven't met the right woman. Sophie has a lot of wonderful friends with daughters. We could set you up on some dates? No, I said, chuckling. I don't have any problems finding dates. But thank you. You sure? Because? My phone going off interrupted him. Yeah, I said, getting up to answer it. I got an address. You ready for it? I looked back over at Barney. Do you have a pen and paper? Sure, he said, wiping his hands against his pants. He reached into his duffel bag and pulled out a pad of paper and a blue pen. Here. Thanks, I said, taking it from him. Okay. I'm ready. Brett gave me the information and I wrote it down. Thanks, I said. No problem. Keep in touch. I will. I owe you. Buy me a steak dinner the next time you're in New York. I smiled. Damn right I will. As far as Reaper, be careful with this guy. He's a real nutter. Gets into some seriously crazy shit. Don't we all? The man chuckled. There's crazy and there's completely psychotic. The guy doesn't seem to even care about dying. I heard he plays Russian roulette for fun. Even forced his grandmother to play once. She win? 
She won to tell about it. When your grandmother hates you, you know your shit is messed up. He should have never been let out of prison. Right. Well, I'll take care of that problem and make sure grandma only plays Parcheesi from now on. He laughed. I know you will, he replied. Brett was with the FBI and knew what I was all about. It didn't stop him from helping me out though. Of course, saving his ass during one of my assignments probably made me that much more appealing. He'd been beaten and shot by a gang member in Chicago. One I'd been hired to kill. After walking in on their moment, I filled my order and then took pity on Brett by dropping him off at a nearby hospital. A month later, I'd heard rumors that he wanted to thank me personally. Knowing that it could have been a trap, I went anyway, meeting him at a seafood restaurant where we'd talked face to face. That was 16 months ago and since then we'd helped each other out more than once. I looked over at Barney, who was still eating and watching me intently. I'd better let you go so we can get into the air. Thanks for the info. You're welcome. Go take care of business. I will. After I hung up, Barney cleared his throat. You got problems with your grandmother? He asked. No, but someone else's apparently needs a family intervention, I replied, texting Slammer the address for Reaper's uncle's cabin. His eyebrows shot up. You going to be part of that? I hope so. Barney smiled and began cleaning up the lunch mess. You're a good man. I knew that the moment I saw you, Jordan. His words made my stomach sour. If he knew the real Jordan Steele and what I was capable of, something told me that it would crush him. I don't know about that. Anyway, I nodded toward the windshield, we can leave now. He chuckled. Not much for compliments, are you? Hey, coming from you I'm flattered Barney. I truly am. I don't think there's anyone I respect more to be honest. Which was the truth. Not only did he appear to be a great husband and business associate, you could tell he really cared about people. There was a shortage of that these days. Barney grinned proudly. I'm honored you feel that way. Thank you son. He started flipping some switches on the dashboard. I'll contact the tower for approval and we'll get moving. Okay. By the way, could we find some place to land in Cedar Rapids? Why there, he asked looking surprised. Because there's been a change of plans. Hope it's not too much or an inconvenience. No. We can do that. I'll radio the tower. Thanks. Sorry about the confusion. Not a problem. I sat back down and stared out the window as Barney put his headphones on and began preparing for liftoff. I knew that I was going to be late for the party in Cedar Rapids and that Slammer's stepdaughter was either dead or wishing she was. No matter what her fate ended up being, I was going to make sure that Reaper was wiped off the face of the earth. Anyone who made their grandmother put a gun to her head deserved nothing less. Chapter 9 Jessica I stared down at the diamond bracelet my mother had given to me at the restaurant, imagining the terror she was feeling at the moment, knowing that I was missing and who in fact now had me. I let out a ragged breath. That's it. I'm a dead woman. To say that I was scared was an understatement. I was so frightened that eventually I began looking for something in the van that could end my life before they did. After hearing about what they'd done to Raptor's mom, I wasn't stupid enough to think they'd let me go. I was going to die, and if I didn't escape one way or another, I'd get raped and tortured by a man who'd just gotten out of prison. It seemed very ironic, considering Breaker had just gotten out before he attacked me. I wiped the tears from my face and then rubbed my palms against my jeans. It was then that I remembered the belt I'd worn that morning. Normally, I didn't wear belts, they bothered me. But this particular one was unique, and I'd fallen in love with the buckle, which a tiny metal skull with a crown and wings, making it stylishly wicked. I removed the belt and pulled it off of my jeans. Staring down at the prong, I touched the tip, it wasn't very sharp, but I knew it could do a lot of damage. I just didn't know if I had the courage to try and use it against one of the bikers. And if I did, I was highly outnumbered. 
Killing myself almost seemed like the easiest and most merciful thing I could do at the moment. Don't be a coward, I muttered, feeling ashamed that the idea of suicide had even entered my head. Yes, I'd already been to hell and back and was about to cross the border for a return trip. Chances were that it was going to end badly, but that didn't mean it had to end completely. I just needed to muster enough courage to stay alive and maybe even come up with a plan. It was then that I remembered what Adriana had told me about Mud. When she'd been kidnapped, she'd made him believe that she hated the gold vipers and had been hot for him. She'd even kissed the man. I couldn't imagine letting one of them kiss me, but if it got me close enough to their jugular, things might not have to go that far. Taking a deep breath, I began biting on the vinyl part of the belt to somehow try and free the buckle. Fortunately, I was able to do just that before we arrived at our destination, which was about two hours from where we'd started. When the van finally stopped and the back door opened, I had the prong in my front pocket and had managed to hide the rest of the belt around my waist under my jeans. With my light blue peasant blouse covering the waistband, nobody seemed to notice anything unusual. Let's go, said Stryker, holding out his hand to help me out of the vehicle. Where are we? I asked, ignoring him. He scowled. That's not your concern. Get your ass out of the van before I come in there and get you. Gritting my teeth, I got out of the back myself and looked around. It appeared that they'd driven me to some cabin in a very secluded and wooded area. Parked outside were several motorcycles and a couple of cars. Move it, said Grady, waving his gun toward the place. Touching the outline of the buckle in my front pocket to give me courage, I began walking toward the porch, wondering if it would be worth it to try and make a run for it. Before I could decide, the front door opened and a large man stepped out. He was obscenely muscular and tall, close to seven feet. I figured him to be somewhere in his forties, with long, dark hair that was braided in the back and brown eyes that were filled with contempt. So this is Franny, he asked, walking down the steps toward me. As he moved closer, I noticed he had quite a bit of tats, all of them dark with a death theme. Perfect, I thought dryly. My name is not Franny, I said, staring up at a long white scar under his left eye. The closer he came, the scarier he appeared. Anyone tell you that staring isn't polite? He asked, now smirking. In fact, staring can get you scars of your own. Sorry. I didn't mean to stare, I said quickly, feeling myself sweat under the pressure of his scrutiny as he circled around me. You sure you got the right old lady? asked Reaper, suddenly grabbing me by the back of my hair. Ouch, I gasped, trying to pull away. He stared down into my face, his eyes boring into mine. I can't imagine Slammer tapping this one. I'm not anyone's old lady and I'm certainly not Slammer's, I cried, tears in my eyes from the pain. You've got the wrong person. Don't listen to her, Reaper, said Stryker, pulling out a photo from his pocket. We found her outside of Slammer's house. See for yourself. It's her. Reaper let me go, and I quickly backed away from him. Smirking, he grabbed the photo and looked at. The smile fell from his face. God damn it. God damn what? asked Stryker. It's not her, he said, holding up the picture. Curious, I stepped closer and stared at the photo. It was definitely my mother, sitting with Slammer at some outdoor cafe. The photographer had zoomed in and anyone could see that there were similarities between us, but our noses were different, and her hair was darker. And not to mention that there was twenty-five years between us, I thought dryly. Good going, he said, turning back to Stryker. You brought me the wrong bitch. You were supposed to bring me Slammer's old lady. You brought his stepdaughter instead. Dumbasses. I shuddered, realizing that he knew who I was anyway. She looks enough like her, said Grady. Anyone could make the same mistake. Look at her. Save it, snapped Reaper, rubbing a hand over his face. We'll work with what we have. Just get her into the house and lock her in the back. I thought we were going to, you know, said Grady, smiling wickedly. Have us some fun. I stiffened up, waiting for Reaper's response. Get your shit together and you will, he said, turning to go back into the house. 
But it will have to be when I'm done with her. Chapter 10 Slammer After receiving the text from the judge, I called in the rest of the club members, and we made plans to try and get Jessica back. Feds or not, I wasn't about to let her die without putting in some kind of effort. She was a good kid, and worth the risk of going to prison. Just like I told Franny time and time again, we took care of our own. Jessica was my stepdaughter, and now a part of the club, whether she liked it or not. Bring her back to me, wept Franny as we prepared to leave. Tank and Raptor had driven ahead, over an hour ago, to give us intel on the Reaper's cabin. Sitting in the clubhouse parking lot were ten more of us on hogs, with two more prospects in Insuv. We were all armed with handguns, plus there were a few AK-47s hidden in the back of the cage. I plan on it, I told Franny, holding her close. Since Jessica's body hadn't been found, there was still hope that she was alive, and that Reaper would try to use her for some kind of bargaining chip. Fortunately, with the judge's help, we were one up on him. When this was over, he would know that he'd messed with the wrong club. I released her and stared down into Franny's eyes. Now, whatever you do, don't leave the clubhouse. Ice and Mikey will do what they need to do to keep you safe while we're gone. Trust them, okay? Ice and Mikey had just become official members the month before. Both were dependable and knew how to keep calm under pressure. I didn't foresee any of Reaper's men storming our clubhouse, though. Franny would be safe as long as she stayed put. I won't go anywhere. Just find my daughter. Nodding, I kissed her on the lips and then got on my Harley. Let's ride, I said, starting the engine. Confirmation came at 10.30 p.m. Tank sent me a text verifying that there were at least a dozen Devil's Rangers hiding out in Cedar Rapids. We pulled over to the side of the road as I read the message. Apparently, the place was lit up and the bikers were partying heavily in some cabin. You see Jessica anywhere? I asked. Negative. But you're sure it's the Devil's Rangers? Yes, he replied. Two of them are out and back banging some chick. I smiled. By the time we made it out there, most of them would be piss-ass drunk. I sent him a message back, telling him to keep watch and wait for our arrival. Should we try getting her out? Only if you think you can do it without getting caught. IDK. Place is crawling with rangers. Then just keep watch. We'll be there soon. Okay. I shoved the phone into my jacket. Just as we were about to take off again, my cell phone rang. It was some private number. Yeah. I answered. Slammer. Who is this? I asked, already knowing in the pit of my stomach. Name is Reaper. Heard you're missing something of value, he said, sounding amused. I clenched my jaw. Where is she? Somewhere safe. For the moment. What the hell you want? To be honest, I haven't decided yet. I just wanted to let you know we have her, and you'll be hearing back from me soon. Is she alive? Yes. I want proof. There was a long pause. You'll get it. What's this about? Mud. It's about everything. Jessica has nothing to do with the club, and she's already been through enough. You need to let her go. I don't need to do anything. You hurt her, and you'll regret it for the rest of your life. He laughed coldly. Your threats don't scare me, old man. By the way, I have a welcoming party set up for the judge's arrival. What do you mean? Let's just say that the piece of shit won't be able to help you anymore. I just wish I could be there to watch it go down. Before I could ask him anything else, he hung up. Shit, I mumbled, typing out a warning message to the judge. I hit send, wondering how Reaper knew where and when he'd be flying in from. I wasn't even sure myself. Maybe he's just messing with you. I thought as I received an incoming message from a phone number that I didn't recognize. This one had an image attached. 
When I saw a pic of Jessica tied to a bed with a gag over her mouth, I gritted my teeth. She was alive, but the terror in her eyes indicated that it might not have been a good thing. Shoving the phone back into my jacket, I waved toward the road and we took off again. Chapter 11 Jessica I stared blindly at a picture of an eagle on the wall, my wrists burning from the twine holding me to the bed. I'd tried struggling when they'd first tied me up, but soon realized that it was fruitless. My only consolation was that I'd been locked inside the bedroom, alone. Reaper hadn't even made an appearance. Not yet, anyway. Rock music and laughter in other parts of the cabin made me want to vomit. Here I was, being held prisoner, while men and women drank and partied in the next room. They didn't give a shit about me. In fact, when I'd been escorted through the house, some of them had even cheered, as if I was some kind of prize. If that wasn't bad enough, a couple of the men asked if they could get a turn screwing me. In response, Reaper had told them there was already a line, but after that, I was open territory. After about an hour in the room, the door opened and Stryker walked in by himself. He closed the door and stepped over to me. I stared up at him in terror, waiting for him to do something. Say cheese, he said, snapping a picture of me with his phone. I watched as he smiled down at the photo and then pushed some buttons on the phone. Afterward, he attached the phone to his belt and stared down at me in silence. I glared at him, unable to speak because of a bandana they'd tied around my mouth. Comfortable? he asked, suddenly giggling. I could tell from the way his eyes were dilated that he was on something. You're one fine piece of ass, you know that? I rolled my eyes. Yeah, you are. Those must be real too. He leaned down and touched my breast. Horrified, I tried pulling away from him, screaming through the material as he groped me. Shush now, he whispered. Can't wait to see if you're a true blonde. Crying, I thrashed my body around, trying to do anything to get him to stop. Irritated, Stryker removed his hand. You should be good to me, you know. I could make things so much easier for you. You have no idea. I stared up at him with loathing. At that moment, the only way he could make anything easier would be to slit my throat. He grinned wickedly. Tell you what, play nice with me and I'll make sure that Reaper doesn't kill you. He owes me anyway. Knowing I'd rather die than do what he wanted, I tried screaming again. Then, without warning, the bedroom door swung open and Reaper stood in the doorway. You get the photo? Looking anxious, he nodded. Good. You send it to Slammer? Yep, he replied, turning to look at him. Then why are you still in here? asked Reaper, his face darkening. Stryker looked down at Reaper's hand. He was holding a plastic red cup. I was just making sure she didn't need something to drink or have to use the bathroom. Good idea, said Reaper. I don't need her pissing the bed. Stryker turned back to look at me. You need to go? I nodded, knowing they'd have to untie me for that. Help her out, said Reaper. Get her something to drink, too. He smiled. Maybe a shot or two of tequila. It might make her more pliable. Stryker smirked. Good idea. Reaper left the room and Stryker began untying me. Keep your mouth shut about what almost happened in here. You got it? I nodded. When I was free, he grabbed my arm and pulled me off of the bed and toward the door. Stopping abruptly, he looked at me. One more thing, I'm the only reason you're still alive. So don't try anything stupid or I'll make Reaper want to kill you. Got it? I nodded again. I'm serious. This place is filled with people who want to see Slammer dead. They don't particularly like you, either. I'm all you got. I get it, I said, my mouth muffled from the gag. He looked at the scarf around my face. You promise to keep quiet and not shoot your mouth off, I'll remove that. I nodded. He reached around and untied the scarf, his whiskey breath in my face. Too bad you're on the wrong side, he whispered, touching my cheek with his thumb. You're one fine-looking woman. 
I licked my lips. Stryker smiled at me. We can still have ourselves a little party when we get back. Like I said, things will go a lot easier for you. I stiffened up, my heart pounding in my chest as his lips came dangerously close to touching mine. I really need to go to the bathroom badly, I whispered, forcing a smile. It's been hours. Fine. Let's go. Relieved, I followed him down the hallway to the bathroom, which was currently being occupied. Shit, mumbled Stryker. He pounded on the door. You almost done in there? Yeah. Just need a few more minutes, hollered a man's voice. Figures, he replied, turning to look at me. Only one bathroom. Hope you can hold it. Seriously? I've got to go really bad, I said, bringing my hand to my crotch as if I was trying not to pee my pants. I've been holding it for hours and now that I'm standing, it's even harder to hold it. Before he could answer, we both heard the distinct sound of skin slapping against skin. Then a woman began to moan. Stryker smirked and pulled a cigarette pack out of his pocket. Guess they are pretty busy in there. Please, I begged. I don't want to pee myself. Is there anywhere else? What about outside? I'll do it quickly and then we can get back to the bedroom. He lit his cigarette with a lighter and then grabbed my hand. Now you're talking. Let's go. Thank you. He pulled me down the hallway to the kitchen where two girls were drinking wine and playing cards. Where you going with her, Stryker? asked the tall redhead. Someone's in the can and she's gotta go. I'm bringing her outside to pee in the bushes, he replied. Just like all gold viper bitches should be treated. Like dogs, said the redhead. I noticed that neither of the girls wore patches, so I assumed they were club whores. I'd rather be treated like a dog than a roller coaster. I bet the guys who ride you need a seatbelt so they don't slip out. Her smile fell. Screw you, she said, standing up. Settle down, Leanne, warned Stryker. Leanne glared at me but sat down. Get her out of here. She smells like a wet dog. Actually, honey. I think that's the odor coming from between your legs, I said, surprised at my own tenacity. Do everyone a favor and spray that thing with Lysol. You whore, she yelled, throwing the cards down on the table. She stood up and charged toward me. Leanne, I'm serious, knock it off, ordered Stryker, pushing her away. Don't let her get to you. I'm going to kill that bitch, she cried, trying to move around him to get to me. I plugged my nose. It smells even worse now that you're on your feet. When was the last time you showered, sheesh? The other girl snorted. Leanne screamed, and Stryker had to physically hold her back. Seeing my opportunity, I threw open the kitchen door and ran outside, toward the woods. God damn it. Hollered Stryker, now running outside after me. Determined to get away, I ran as fast as I could into the woods, but was no match for him. He caught up in no time and tackled me to the ground. You bitch, he growled, pulling me up from the dirt. I told you not to try anything, didn't I? Didn't I? Yes. I'm sorry, I squeaked. I thought she was going to kill me. How can you blame me for that? He relaxed. Still, you shouldn't have run off like that. Now pull down your jeans and pee somewhere. Not until you turn around. He grunted. If you think I'm turning my back to you. I can't go when someone is watching. I don't care. If you don't get your pants down in two seconds, I'm going to take them off for you. Fine, I said. Instead of unbuckling them, I pulled the belt buckle out of my jeans and tried stabbing him in the neck with the prong. What the hell? He grabbed it out of my hand and laughed. This is a belt buckle, isn't it? Resourceful little bitch, aren't you? I glared at him silently. Everything okay out here? Hollered Reaper from near the cabin. Yeah. I got her, he called back, grabbing me by the throat. She isn't getting away. I gasped at the pain. Please don't, I said hoarsely. Just be lucky I didn't shoot your ass. You'd better keep a better eye on her. Reaper yelled. 
You lose her and I'll kick your ass. Don't worry. I got her, he repeated angrily. The door to the cabin banged shut. Asshole, mumbled Stryker. Please let me go, I begged after he removed his hand from my neck. I can't go back there to the cabin. I'd rather die. Shut up. I don't give a shit what happens to you anymore. Stryker tossed the prong and then tried unbuckling my jeans. What are you doing? I gasped, slapping his hands away. Making sure you pee so we can get back inside. Hold still, he said, grabbing my wrist with one hand and my button with the other. So we can get these off. No. Let me go, I cried, trying to pull away. He grunted. No way. You heard the lady. Let her go, said a deep voice behind us. I sucked in my breath, feeling an overwhelming sense of relief. Tank. Swearing, Stryker released me and I rushed away from him. When I turned back around, Stryker was on the ground, motionless with Tank and Raptor standing over him. Did you kill him? I asked, spying the belt buckle near my feet. I picked it up. No. I just knocked him out, said Raptor, rubbing and waving his fist. Jesus you must hit hard, I said, surprised. You just have to know where to hit someone, he replied. Damn, I hope I didn't break anything in my hand. We've gotta fly people, whispered Tank when the cabin doorway opened up again. Is everything all right out here? Echoed another man's voice. Stryker? That you? Stryker didn't answer, for obvious reasons. Let's go brother, repeated Tank, when Raptor pulled out his gun. No. We need to kill Reaper, he answered, a determined look on his face. Before he causes any more harm. Stryker. Repeated the biker, his voice growing nearer. It's too dangerous, whispered Tank as two more Devil's Rangers stepped outside. Another time. But we're already here, he argued. And there might not be another chance to kill Kodiak. There are only two of us, reminded Tank. It would be suicide. Come on, man. Let's get her out of here before shit gets ugly. Suddenly, shots were fired. A bullet whistled by Raptor, almost hitting him. Damn it. We've been spotted. Let's go, growled Tank, grabbing my hand. All three of us began running as gunfire exploded all around us. Shit, gasped Raptor, grabbing his arm. He slowed down. You okay? asked Tank, looking back over his shoulder. Yes. I've been hit, but... I'm fine. Just keep going, he replied, his face already white. Fortunately, we were able to put distance between us and the Devil's Rangers. After several minutes of running, we managed to lose them, escaping into a deeper part of the woods. What do we do now? I asked, leaning forward as I tried catching my breath. We need to circle back and get to our bikes, said Tank. No, answered Raptor, examining the bullet wound on his arm. I hate to say it, but they've probably already got to them. We can't go back that way. Damn it, muttered Tank. I knew we should have parked farther away. I just bought that bike last year. They're going to trash it. I just know it. Of course they are, said Raptor. Call it in as being stolen when we get back to Jensen. Damn those assholes, he said, kicking a few sticks away with his boot. We should have ridden in a cage. Too late now for regrets, said Raptor. At least we got Jessica back. That's the main thing. Yes. I still can't believe you found me, I said. We had help from the judge, said Raptor. He found an address for the cabin. Thank him for me the next time you talk to him. You okay? I asked, now staring at his arm with concern. There was a lot of blood. I'll be fine. He took his cut off, and then began removing the white t-shirt underneath. I just need to stop the bleeding, he said, ripping his shirt. He wrapped it around his arm, and I watched as he tied it. If you want, I can take a look at it. I'm a nurse now, you know, I told him. Maybe when we're out of here, he replied. Have you ever been shot before? I asked. He smiled humorlessly. 
Actually, no. Figured it would happen one day, though. Hoped that it wouldn't, though. Adriana is going to be pissed. Is there a lot of pain? I asked. Nah. It's not too bad. That's because you don't have pythons like this, joked Tank, flexing his muscle. And less muscle to tear into. I looked at Raptor's arms, and although they weren't anything like Tank's, it was obvious he spent plenty of time at the gym. Some of us have puny arms, and others of us have puny dicks. Guess we know where you stand, Popeye, joked Raptor. Hell, I need to eat my spinach just to carry the weight of this beast around, he replied, grabbing the front of his jeans. Raptor chuckled. Guys, you're really going to make stupid dick jokes like that when our lives are still in danger and we're lost in the damn woods? Relax, sis. Talking shit helps us lighten the mood, said Tank. Relieve stress. Whatever works, I guess. Don't worry. We know where we are, said Tank. We're somewhere in Cedar Rapids. He pulled out his cell phone. In fact, I'd better call Slammer now and let him know what's happening. As he was calling Slammer, I looked at Raptor. How are we going to find our way out of the woods? I'm sure there's an app for that, he replied, taking out his phone. The beauty of technology, huh? Right, I said, watching as he scrolled through his phone. I sighed. You know, I really do need to pee. I'll be right back. Don't go too far, said Raptor, not looking up from his phone. There's probably bears and wolves lurking somewhere in these woods. Great, I mumbled, walking away. When I was far enough from their view, but still able to see Raptor and Tank's phones lit up, I unzipped my jeans and squatted behind a tree. As I was finishing up, I heard something a few feet away, like a twig snapping. Alarmed, I pulled my jeans up and took out the buckle. Relax, I told myself, holding up the prong. It's probably a squirrel or a deer. Don't overreact. I quickly scanned the darkness around me, my heart pounding in my chest. Jessica, whispered Tank loudly. Where'd you go? She went to pee, I heard Raptor answer. I'm coming, I called back, feeling myself relax. I turned and started walking back toward them, when I felt a hand clamp over my mouth and someone grabbed me around the waist. Going somewhere? whispered Reaper in my ear as he held me against his chest. Terrified, I bit his hand as hard as I could. Gasping in pain, he removed his hand. Tank. I screamed, lunging away from Reaper. Before I could take three steps, however, he had me again. Let her go, hollered Tank, approaching us with Raptor behind him. They both had their guns out and aimed at us. I heard the distinct click of a gun being cocked next to my temple. Back away or I'll kill the bitch, he growled. You're making a mistake, said Raptor in a calm voice. This girl has nothing to do with what's happening between our clubs. She's Slammer's stepdaughter. She's involved, whether she likes it or not, he replied sharply. Please let me go, I cried, tears spilling down my cheeks. Reaper ignored me. Drop your weapons or I'll shoot her and take at least one of you with me. What the hell do you want? asked Raptor, who also had his gun out. Why are you doing this? Revenge? Who's asking? asked Reaper. Raptor. I could feel him stiffen up behind me. It was your bitch that was responsible for Mud's death. No it wasn't, said Tank. She didn't kill anyone. You're right. It was that asshole. The judge, he said with a sneer. Coincidentally, your half-brother. I don't know where you heard that bullshit but we're not related, said Raptor. Nice try. I found out about it when I was in prison. Funny thing is, word spreads pretty quickly in there. Hell, I knew more about what was happening out here when I was on the inside. One thing I found out was that it all started with this bitch opening up her mouth, he said, squeezing me tighter. Me? I squeaked. Yeah. That shit with Breaker. You squealed and everything went to hell. I was suddenly so angry that I forgot about the gun pointed at me. I couldn't believe he was making this my fault. Oh, it's my fault that I was raped, huh? I said, gritting my teeth. Beaten. Tormented. My fault? 
For all I know, you were asking for it. And if you would have just kept your mouth shut, Mud would still be alive. Oh my god, I gasped. Asking for it? Who asks to be raped? Don't listen to him, said Tank. This dirtbag was incarcerated for rape himself. Those were bogus charges, argued Reaper. I never raped anyone. This isn't about you and don't you dare blame her you piece of shit, snarled Raptor, glaring at him. Besides her being raped, two other innocent women have died. That's three victims and this all falls on your club. I wasn't paying attention to what Reaper was saying when he answered, because I was still fuming. Noticing that he'd eased his hold on me, I ducked away from the gun and then stuck him in the thigh as hard as I could with the prong. Shit, hollered Reaper as I lurched away from him. Get down. Yelled Raptor. I threw myself into some weeds just as Reaper began firing. Tank and Raptor fired back, but he somehow managed to get away. Come on. We've got to get out of here, said Tank, helping me up. Before he returns with his club. Even now we could hear voices getting closer. Where are we going? North, said Raptor, looking down at his phone again. If we follow this GPS, we'll get to a freeway and a gas station. The road is less than two miles away. Good, said Tank, as we started running again. Slammer and the others can meet us there. Fortunately, even with Raptor hurt, we managed to lose Reaper and the Devil's Rangers. Once we found the road, the gas station was only a half mile up. When we arrived, Tank called Slammer again and explained what had happened. Slammer is relieved that you're okay. You should be here soon with the others, said Tank, hanging up the phone. What are they going to do when they arrive? Go and find the cabin? I asked, exhausted. I wanted to go home and the thought of this night not being over was unnerving. Not sure yet but you're going home, said Tank. They've got an SUV with them. We'll make sure you get back to Jensen in one piece. Thank God, I said, sighing in relief. Tank put a hand on my shoulder and stared at me, his eyes soft. I have to ask this, did any of them? Touch you inappropriately. No. They were going too, though. Thank God you came when you did, I replied, smiling up at him with gratitude. Those bastards, he said, gritting his teeth. I'd have blown up the cabin with every one of those scumbags inside. I'm sure you would have, I replied, flattered by his brotherly passion. I gave him a hug. Thanks for getting me out. You too, Raptor. You're welcome, he replied. By the way, said Tank when I stepped back. Slammer received a phone call a few minutes ago. From Reaper. What did he say? I asked. Apparently you got him pretty good with whatever you stabbed him with. I grinned. It was a belt buckle prong. You're kidding, said Tank. I explained how I'd spent over an hour biting it off of my belt in the van. Needless to say my teeth are kind of sore, I said, touching my jaw. Tank rubbed his chin. Really? That thing must have been pretty sharp. Not really, but it was long, and I hit him with it as hard as I could. He sure squealed like a pig, said Raptor, smirking. I'm pretty impressed. Quick thinking under pressure. It was all I had, and I wasn't going to let anyone touch me again, I said. Evidently, Reaper is far from being impressed. In fact, he's one pissed-off prick, said Tank. Poor baby, I said dryly. He told Slammer he's coming after you. Because I stabbed him in the leg? I asked. You got away and hurt his ego, said Raptor. I'm sure that's what's pissing him off right now. Don't worry. He won't get you a second time, said Tank. You'll have protection with you 24 hours a day until this shit is over. Club protection? I asked, not exactly thrilled. No, actually, Slammer had another idea. Especially now that Reaper is so obsessed with killing you. What are you talking about? I asked, feeling my stomach churn. He's hiring you a bodyguard, said Tank. My eyes widened. Seriously? A bodyguard? Who? Yeah, who? asked Raptor, who looked just as surprised. 
He's going to try and get your brother to do it, he answered. Raptor's brother? I didn't know that you had a brother, I said, and then the realization hit me of who he was talking about. Ah, uh, you don't mean the judge? Tank nodded. Isn't he an assassin? I asked. Yeah, said Tank. Basically. He seriously really kills for a living? I asked. The thought of having a man shadowing me was bad enough. Having one that had taken lives on purpose was bone chilling. Yes, said Tank. And he'll kill Reaper if he tries to get to you. I turned to Raptor. You've met him, right? Briefly, he answered. What's he like? I asked. He's all about business. Not much of a talker, said Raptor, smirking. Hell, I don't think he knows how to smile. Oh. Well, that makes me feel better, I said dryly. There's nothing to worry about, said Raptor. If he agrees to be your security, then your life is in very good hands. I remembered Adriana telling me she'd heard that the judge had scars on his hands. It made me wonder what kind of scars he also carried in his head. For someone to kill without qualms, they had to be pretty ugly. Chapter 12 Jordan There were two texts I'd received from Slammer after the plane landed on the tarmac at the small airport in Cedar Rapids. The first one was a little disconcerting. Possible threat at airport. Reaper knows where you're landing. Not sure how. Be careful. I frowned. What is it? asked Barney, noticing my expression. Nothing major, I said, clipping the phone to my belt as he maneuvered the plane toward the terminal. Just some information regarding the job I've been assigned to do. Hounding you already, huh? Guess that's why they pay you the big bucks. I smirked. Guess so. Thanks again for the ride, Barney, I said, as we walked away from the plane 25 minutes later. You're a lifesaver. Glad I was available. You caught me at a good time. It was definitely good timing on both of our parts. Yawning, he agreed. I kept my eyes open for anything out of the ordinary, my hand on the gun that I was under my leather jacket. It was early Monday morning, just past 3 a.m., and quiet on the runway. Only one other small plane sat, ready for takeoff, and there weren't many employees around, save for a couple that had directed us on the tarmac. So, are you flying back tonight? I asked him. No, he replied. I'm exhausted. I'm going to get a pizza and a room at one of the local motels. I'll probably head back tomorrow, unless someone contracts me for another job. How long are you staying in Iowa? To be honest, I'm not sure, I answered. The other text I'd received had confirmed that they'd found Jessica at the cabin. Reaper and his crew were still at large, however, and Slammer had something he wanted to discuss with me. In person. You want to share a cab? he asked. No, that's okay. I'm going to rent a vehicle and head out to Jensen. I thought they needed you in Cedar Rapids, now? He asked shocked. Another change of plans, I replied. You have the patience of a saint. Well, at least it isn't too far of a drive for you. It's only a couple of hours. I really hope they're paying you well. You deserve it. Thanks. He held out his hand, I shook it. Well, have a good night and give me a call if you need anything. I'll probably be heading back to Anchorage around 6 p.m. tonight. Good to know. Oh, I almost forgot. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the envelope of bills. There was his usual fee of $1,200, plus a hefty tip. He deserved it. Here's your money. He shoved it into his jacket without looking inside. Thanks for paying in cash again. I appreciate it. No problem. Get some sleep. Thanks. Drive safely. I will. We parted inside the terminal and I walked over to the car rental kiosk. As the attendant was searching for a Harley that I could rent, I noticed a man watching me. He was standing in one of the small stores, paging through a magazine with one eye on me. 
Are you sure you want to rent a motorcycle? Asked the attendant. We've got plenty of nice cars or SUVs. I've even got a fully loaded GMC Sierra truck, if you want to go that route. Truck, huh? Yeah. You look like a truck kind of guy, he said, smiling. I prefer a bike. Okay. You've been riding long? Long enough, I said, not interested in conversation. I was tired and still had a couple of hours ahead of me. See anything available? The man looked up from the screen. Actually, you lucked out. I have one Harley available. It's $250 a day. That's a little high, isn't it? He shrugged. I don't know. To be perfectly honest, I don't rent many of them out. I sighed. What model? He typed a few more keys as he stared intently at the monitor. It's a Road King. Last year's model. Great touring bike. 250, huh? Yeah. Plus applicable taxes and insurance if you want it. Does it have saddlebags? Not sure. I think so. I sighed. I'll take it. I had no other choice. I desired a bike, and it would get me to Jensen quickly. Plus, I loved driving at night with the wind against my face. Not only was it a great experience, but it kept me alert. You need a helmet? he asked. Got my own brain bucket, I replied, holding up my helmet bag. Smart. Yep. Like to keep it that way. He chuckled. Never got on a bike without one, and never used anyone else's. Same with sheets and pillowcases. I could handle ants, spiders, scorpions and centipedes, but the thought of getting bedbugs or lice freaked the shit out of me. It was one reason I always requested a fresh set of sheets when I checked into a hotel or motel. Yeah, they were already supposed to be fresh ones, but I always demanded another set the moment I arrived. I'd toss the old ones away and make the bed myself, usually not sleeping with the top covers or a bedspread. It was the only way I could fall asleep when traveling. After filling out the paperwork and giving him a credit card, he handed me the keys to the bike and told me where to go. As I turned to leave, I noticed the stranger again. Our eyes met and it took him a few seconds to look away. Although he was wearing a suit and looked like some type of corporate executive, I spotted a bulge near his ankle and had to assume he was armed. Shoving the keys into my pocket, I headed toward the restroom to wait for my stalker. After ten minutes, he entered the bathroom. Our eyes met in the mirror as I combed my hair. Morning, he said, nodding. Morning. He approached the sink and turned it on. Where are you headed, he asked, washing his hands. My eyes bore into his. Why are you asking? Just making conversation, he replied. I turned and faced him. So now that you have me, what's the plan? He gave me a blank stare. Excuse me? Come on, I said, taking a step back. Let's see what you got. The stranger gave me a funny stare. Are you, is this a, come on? The air in the room suddenly felt stifling, and for the first time ever, I wanted to put my foot into my mouth. If he was trying to kill me, we wouldn't still be having this conversation. Sighing, I rubbed my face. Sorry, man. I'm bushed and obviously made a mistake. No. Wait, he said, smiling as I prepared to leave. It's okay. I'm gay too. My name is Todd. My eye twitched. I'm not gay, Todd. He turned off the water and grabbed a paper towel from the dispenser. Are you sure? Because I thought we had some kind of connection going when our eyes met in the lobby. That's why I walked in here. To see if you wanted to have a drink with me. Sorry, pal. I wasn't sending you any signals, I said, feeling my forehead beat up with sweat. You okay? You're looking a little pale. This wasn't anything I'd ever prepared for, I was usually on my game in every situation. Getting hit on by another man was throwing me for a loop. I'm fine. I'm just not gay. He sighed. Yeah, I get that now. I have to say, I'm a little disappointed though. 
You're very attractive. I could feel my cheeks turn crimson. Embarrassed, I grabbed my travel bag and headed toward the doorway. Thanks. Have a good night. Wait, he said as I was about to exit. I turned around and clenched my jaw. Gotcha, said Todd holding a gun with a silencer toward my chest. He laughed. You should have seen your face. It was priceless, man. I can't wait to tell Reaper that I made the famous judge lose his cool. Wish I'd videotaped it. Before I could tell him where to go, someone tried entering the bathroom, stealing Todd's attention. I quickly did a roundhouse kick, hitting him in the hand with my boot. The gun went flying and before he could recover, I had him in a headlock, down on the linoleum floor. Jesus! What's going on? asked an old man with a cleaning cart. As you can see, we're a little busy? I told the janitor, who looked shocked. I smiled. Glover's quarrel. He lowered his eyes and nodded. No problem. Just clean up after yourselves. Asshole, croaked Todd, trying to pull my arm away from his neck. I told you it was just sex. She meant nothing to me, I said loudly, and then smiled at the janitor. My boyfriend. He's so possessive. Gets jealous over the stupidest of things. Shaking his head, the janitor turned and walked out of the bathroom. Let me go, demanded Todd, his spittle making a slobbery mess on my jacket. Scowling, I changed my position, putting him into a sleeper hold until he passed out. I then slid away from him, grabbed my travel bag, and walked out of the bathroom. Where's your friend? asked the janitor, who was waiting near the ladies' room. You two make up? Yeah, we did, actually. He's coming, I lowered my voice and smiled. And that's why you probably don't want to go in there yet. He likes to finish without me. The janitor seemed confused and then a look of disgust crossed his face. Chucking, I walked away and hurried down the hallway, locating another restroom. I went inside and quickly removed the fake goatee and the blonde wig I'd been wearing. Then I removed the eyeglasses, the brown contact lenses, and the mole from my cheek. When I walked out of the bathroom two minutes later, my jacket was stuffed into my travel bag, and I wore a pair of grey work coveralls with a baseball cap. As I made my way to the rental garage, I passed by Barney, who was still waiting for a cab. He didn't even look my way. Chapter 13 Jessica When Slammer arrived with the rest of the club, they placed me inside of an SUV with two of the prospects, and sent me back to Jensen. Meanwhile, the rest of the club drove back to the cabin to confront Reaper and retrieve raptors and tank spikes. I learned afterward that the Devil's Rangers had scattered, realizing their location had been compromised. Bunch of pussies, said Tank, several hours later. We were back at Slammer and Mom's place, and I'd just gotten out of the shower. We were standing in the kitchen, where he was making himself a couple of sandwiches. I knew they'd be gone by the time we got back there. Just knew it. I smirked. Poor excuse for a biker club, huh? You got that right, he answered, licking mayo off of his finger. But then I wouldn't expect anything less than from those assholes. It's one reason why we've been rivals for so long. You can't trust any one of them. I sighed. So what now? Did Slammer mention anything more about that guy watching over me? Because frankly, I'd rather just drive out to Shoreview and stay with Cheryl. I doubt that gang would find me there. You don't want to underestimate them, he said. And now that Reaper wants you dead, you're going to need extra protection. But that guy? I asked, frowning. I'm sorry but the thought of him being around scares the hell out of me. He won't hurt you. Sure as shit he'd hurt anyone who tried to though. Do we know for sure if he's going to do it? No. Slammer is on his way back here though. I guess the judge didn't want to meet at the clubhouse, so we'll find out soon enough. Wait a second, he's coming here? Now? I said, looking down at my shorts and top, realizing that I needed to change quickly. The air conditioning unit wasn't working properly, and I'd slipped on an outfit I'd normally never wear in public. Only because it was too revealing. At least for me. What's wrong? You look cute, he said. 
it's about time you wore shorts. It's got to be 80 degrees in here. They really need to get that fixed. I know. Seriously, Tank, is he really coming to the house? Today? Tank smiled. You're really that frightened of him? You should be worried about Reaper, not Jordan. Jordan? That's his birth name. We call him the judge because of what he does, although his verdicts are usually paid for. Tank smirked. Most of the jackasses he's killed deserved what they got. I can't believe you're talking about death like it's no big deal, I said, leaning against the counter. He's paid to kill people. What kind of a guy can stomach doing that whenever asked, without being crazy? He shrugged. Personally, I don't think he's crazy. See, it's all about how you're raised. His old man was a cold son of a bitch who used to beat the hell out of him growing up. Heard he used to use acid as a way to discipline him. Growing up with a prick like that would definitely change the way you viewed things. Hell, I don't think he's crazy. I just think he doesn't care about people too much. A noise from the other room startled us both. Slammer must be home, he said, taking a bite out of his sandwich. Or maybe mom left work early, I replied, walking out of the kitchen. She'd gone in a couple of hours ago, although she hadn't wanted to leave my side. The kidnapping had really gotten to her. When I saw the stranger in the living room, staring at photos on the mantel, I screamed for Tank. Tank exploded into the room, his gun out. What is it? Sorry. I didn't mean to frighten her, said the man, his hands in the air. You the judge? asked Tank, lowering his gun. Or Jordan. Whichever you prefer, he said, now staring at me. I couldn't help but be surprised as I stared back at the man standing next to our fireplace. I wasn't sure what I'd expected, but it wasn't the tall, dark and handsome stranger with the searing blue gaze. Hello, brother, said Tank, lowering his gun. He held out his hand. Name's Tank. Been looking forward to meeting you. As Jordan reached over and shook Tank's hand, I couldn't help but to check out the rest of him. He was lean with broad shoulders, a tapered waist, and muscular arms. He was obviously very athletic, which was needed in his line of work. You must be Jessica, he asked, breaking my concentration. Yes, I croaked, turning red with embarrassment. Sorry, dry throat. He smiled. I'd need a drink too, after what happened to you last night. I laughed nervously, wanting to crawl under the couch and hide. I felt like a young teenager who was having a conversation with the star quarterback from her high school. It was bad, I agreed. Well, you're alive and that's the main thing, he replied. Yeah. I tore my gaze away from those baby blues and a smile that belonged on the cover of Esquire magazine instead of the FBI's most wanted list. It was then that I noticed the scars on his hands, which weren't half as bad as I'd imagined them to be. That's what I keep telling myself. So where's Slammer, he asked, sliding his hands into his jeans. Crap, he'd notice me staring, I thought. Slammer should be here any minute. You want something to drink? A beer? A soda? Replied Tank. I'm good, he said, looking at his watch. Tank waved his thumb toward the kitchen. I'll be right back. I'm going to finish my sandwich. You're not hungry or anything? No but thank you, he answered. Okay. You two should probably use this time to get to know each other anyway, said Tank. Jordan frowned. Oh really? Realizing his blunder, Tank laughed. I meant, she should tell you about Reaper, since he's obviously targeting anyone associated with Mud's death. Jordan looked at me. That's probably a good idea. I know his background, but it wouldn't hurt to know more about his personality. Ah, uh, sure, I said, a little anxious that Tank was leaving me alone with Jordan. Although I wasn't as terrified of him anymore, he still made me nervous. I just wasn't sure if it was because of my reaction to him as an assassin or a man. Chapter 14 Jordan Tank left the room and we sat down, with Jessica on the sofa and me on a recliner. She then began telling me about the kidnapping. 
I never expected them to follow me like that, she said, after explaining how Stryker had confronted her in front of the house, and then how the Devil's Rangers had cornered her on the street. Her eyes looked haunted as she relived the moment. And then they shot this guy in broad daylight. He was just an innocent bystander. I've learned to expect anything and everything, I said. Although admittedly, I hadn't expected a girl like Jessica to be Slammer's stepdaughter. She looked more like the farmer's daughter, with her honey blonde hair, large hazel eyes and cute splash of freckles across her nose. The fact that she was wearing white cutoffs and a yellow checkered shirt tied at the waist, emphasized it even more. Believe me I won't make that mistake again, she answered, letting out a ragged sigh. So, is that when you met Reaper? No. That happened after we got to the cabin. As Jessica explained what happened next, she crossed her legs and I found myself staring at her slender ankles and then her feet, which I even found oddly sexy. Especially since I didn't consider myself a foot guy. Is there something on my ankle? She asked as I stared at her red painted toenails. I tore my gaze away. Sorry. No. I was just thinking about what you were telling me. Oh. She laughed nervously, and I could tell from her expression that she was anxious being alone with me. Do I make you nervous? I asked her. Her mouth opened in surprise, and then she blushed again. Okay. Maybe a little. Don't be. I'd never hurt you. I know, she said quickly. The look in her eyes told me otherwise. I decided not to press it. So what can you tell me about Reaper? She bit her lower lip. He's big, muscular, and has these tattoos. She described them to me. Skulls and the Grim Reaper. I smirked. Not too original. So what can you tell me about his facial features and hair? He has long brown hair. He wore it in a braid down his back when I saw him. Oh, and he has this scar under his eye. His left one. She dragged her finger down her cheek. Right here. It's white. How tall would you say he was? I asked, although I knew all of those details. I just wanted to watch her talk. Just watching her lips move was fascinating. I don't know. Six and a half feet. She smirked. The guy was taller and even bigger than Tank. I don't know, maybe he takes steroids? Might explain a lot more than his muscles, I replied. So, you went after him with your belt buckle? She shrugged, looking a little embarrassed. Yeah. I mean, it didn't do much other than to piss him off. Obviously. Now he wants to kill me. I'm pretty sure he was planning on killing you before that happened. But you got away. Yeah. I got away. Twice. She nodded. I'm impressed. You foiled them twice, I smiled. You're very clever. I don't know about being clever. I was just lucky that Raptor and Tank showed up. Yeah, but you still got out of that cabin. If you wouldn't have gotten that far, I doubt I'd be talking to you now. That was quick thinking on your part. Maybe, she replied, looking embarrassed. Jessica, apparently, didn't like compliments. Did you hear about Raptor? No. What about him? He was shot. In the arm. I hadn't heard that part of the story. Is he okay? Yes. She explained what had happened. Good to know he's okay. So, he's your stepbrother? I smirked. Apparently. He's nice. So is his wife, Adriana, she replied. And their son, he's adorable. Have you met Sammy? No. Oh, she said, smiling. He's sweet but definitely a handful. I hear that runs in the family, I said, smiling slowly. She laughed nervously. Oh, you have a sweet side. Me? No. I meant Raptor's side of the family, I said, joking. Her smile fell. Obviously, in your line of work, sweet isn't a good requisite for being a murderer. The way she said it made me wince. I only kill those who I agree deserve to die. 
How do you determine whether or not they truly deserve to die? She asked, her eyes narrowing. By their history. And that's why they call you the judge? Because you're the one determining their fate? She asked, frowning. For the record, I didn't give myself that nickname. And? I only accept jobs where I feel the target deserves to die, I answered, wondering why I felt that I even needed to defend myself. In other words, you're trying to play God, she accused. My eye twitched. No, but I'm doing what God should do. Getting rid of the scumbags that prey on the innocent. How do you know that he doesn't already have a special plan for the people you are targeting? How do you know that I'm not part of that special plan? She smiled. Touché. The sound of the garage door opening put an end to the conversation. Sounds like Slammer is back, she said. Tank walked back into the living room and repeated the same thing. Then he sat down next to Jessica, and I found myself wondering what their relationship was. How was your sandwich? she asked him. Good. Could use some dessert. I miss Franny's apple pies. Going to have to get her to make another one soon. I know, they're delicious, said Jessica, still watching me out of the corner of her eye. Slammer stepped into the foyer from the garage, throwing his keys into some kind of metal box. Hey, I'm home. Hi, Pop. The judge is here, replied Tank loudly. Slammer walked up the steps smiling. I figured. I saw the bike in the driveway. How's it going, son? He asked, holding his hand out to me. Although Slammer and I had never met face to face, I'd seen him a couple years ago on the street. He was looking much more haggard and had put on a few extra pounds. Other than that, he still reminded me a little of the actor Burt Reynolds. I stood up and shook it. Not too bad. I'm a little curious as to why you wanted to meet in person. He smiled up at me. For one, I think it's about time we met. I have to say, you are not what I expected. I arched my eyebrow. Really? How so? I think he means someone more ordinary looking, said Jessica. What she means is that you're too goddamn good looking to be a killer, said Slammer, chuckling. Am I right, Jessica? Blushing, she shrugged. Something like that. Raptor is a pretty boy too, said Slammer. If there was one thing that Mavis did right by you boys, it was sharing her genes. She was once a very beautiful girl. You mentioned there was another reason that you wanted to meet directly, I replied, wanting to change the subject from my looks. Obviously you've met Jessica, he said, nodding toward her. Yes, I replied. He sighed. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'd like to hire you to protect her. Chapter 15 Jessica Protect her? Said Jordan looking surprised. As in, personal security. Yes, said Slammer. That's what I'm talking about. I'm by no means a bodyguard. You know what I do, he answered. You eliminate problems. Right now, we have a big one with that dickhead, Reaper. I've received word that he has a major boner right now for killing Jessica. I need to keep her safe. Can't the club protect her, he asked. Embarrassed that Slammer was asking him to do something he obviously didn't want to do, I had to say something. I didn't want to be forced on anyone. Wait a second. I don't want the club to protect me, I interrupted firmly. I don't expect you to be my bodyguard either. In fact, I think I should go to the police and tell them what happened. They'll arrest him once I give my statement and tell them exactly what happened. See what I mean? said Slammer smirking. She thinks if we go to the cops, they'll put him back in prison, and life will be rainbows and unicorns. Jordan's lip twitched. So, what are you thinking? Did you want me to sit outside of Jessica's house until they come for her? Then kill them one by one? he asked dryly. No. I just want her out of Jensen until things settle, or until we take down Reaper ourselves. Obviously, he's not coming for her directly. He doesn't want to risk getting thrown back into prison. He'll send his club after her, like he did before. Until then, I need her to be somewhere safe and with someone I trust. 
I can stay with Cheryl, I said. Nobody will find me in Shoreview. That's not good enough. Cheryl is related to your mother and they'll check there, sooner or later, said Slammer. Is Cheryl in danger? I asked, suddenly feeling sick to my stomach. I hadn't even thought about that. Not anymore. In fact, Cheryl and your mother are going on a 10-day cruise, replied Slammer. I've already arranged it. They'll both be somewhere safe as well. Good idea, said Tank. Although, I'm surprised Franny would agree with it. She has no choice, said Slammer. Her life is more important than her job at the nursing home. Why don't I just go with them on the cruise? I replied. I'll even pay for it myself. Right. You hate cruises. You said so yourself, replied Slammer. Many, many times. It was right, of course. For some reason, I had a major phobia about cruising. The one and only time I'd went, I'd been 16 and it had been a miserable experience. Not only had I been seasick, but I'd felt trapped. Even now, the idea of being in the middle of the ocean and stuck on a ship was harrowing. I don't hate them. I just don't like being confined to a ship. To be perfectly honest, I don't like cruise ships either, admitted Jordan, staring off into space. Don't like confinement. Just like he wouldn't want to be confined to me, I thought. So what do you say, asked Slammer. Will you do it? Jordan looked at me. Only if she agrees to do what I ask, no questions asked. I raised my eyebrows. What is that supposed to mean? Tank chuckled. I don't think anyone can get her to promise that. That's the way it has to be, he said, matter-of-factly. She follows my orders, I'll agree. Slammer looked at me. This is some serious shit, Jessica. Your life is in danger, and we need to get you out of Jensen. You stay here, and you might end up in the back of someone's van again. Or worse, dead in a ditch. I grimaced. Pop is right, said Tank. I'd like to say that we can keep you safe, but mistakes happen. You've already been through enough. Let's get you somewhere safe and away from the club until we fix what's going on. I sighed. How long do I have to disappear for? You know I'm supposed to be starting my internship soon. At least a week. Maybe two, said Slammer. If it ends up being longer, I'm sure you can tell the hospital that your mother is very ill and you can't leave her. Where would we go? I asked, turning back to Jordan. He looked at Slammer and then back to me. I have a cabin somewhere. You won't know the location until after we arrive. So, I'm disappearing with you and nobody will know where I am? I said dryly. Not even Slammer or Tank? That's the point, he answered. You're going to disappear. I agree. Take her somewhere safe. Somewhere private. The less we all know, the better, replied Slammer. Chapter 16 Jordan Fine. When do we leave, she asked. Right now, I said, still a little stunned that I was agreeing to this. I'd never brought my work home with me, and deep down I knew this was a mistake. I just couldn't seem to say no to them. Not when I knew how much danger Jessica was in. The thought of Reaper getting his hands on her again was pissing me off. I would rather have just gone after him myself, but something was making me lean toward this route instead. Maybe it was her smile or her red toenails. I just wasn't quite ready to say goodbye to either yet. You'd better go and pack some stuff. We need to leave soon. Right now? Can't we wait until my mother gets home, she asked, biting her lower lip. I know she'll be upset when she finds out I've left Jensen. If I could just have a few minutes with her, before I disappear. Sorry, but unless she's due back in the next 30 minutes, we need to go, I replied. If your life is in danger, the worst thing that we can do is hang out here any longer. He's right, said Slammer scratching his head. Go and pack. You can call your mother and let her know what's going on. Just do it before we take off, I said. In fact, I'm going to have to ask you to leave your phone here. Leave my phone, she repeated, her eyes wide. 
Why? Cell phones can be traced, I said. If Reaper has someone working for him who can access that information, we may as well put out a welcoming mat for him. Plus, I still wasn't sure how he'd found out I was arriving in Cedar Rapids. There had to be a leak, either on Slammer's end or my contact Brett. Then there was Barney. I couldn't imagine him giving me away, though. He didn't even know what I really looked like. I could keep my phone turned off, she said. Problem solved. No. Too risky. You'll want to check your messages later. The urge will be too great. You can use my phone if you need to get a hold of someone, I answered. She sighed in frustration. Fine. Pop, come to think of it, we could use Jessica's phone to lure Reaper out of town and then take care of him, said Tank, crossing his arms under his chest. Hell, we could kill him outside of Jensen. You know if we take him out here, the feds are going to be all over that. If he tries tracking her that way, said Slammer frowning. More than likely, he'll just send his club back to the house in hopes of kidnapping her again. That's how those bastards work. Yeah, but they know you'll be waiting for them this time. Unless Reaper is a complete idiot, they're going to try something different, I replied. If we spread the word on the street that Jessica is in hiding, they might try tracking her cell phone, insisted Tank. I don't know. It might be a long shot, said Slammer. We'll have to talk more about it. Jessica. You'd better go and pack. Leave your phone though. In case we need to go that route. Frowning she got up and headed toward her bedroom. How much is this going to cost me? Asked Slammer when she was out of earshot. That depends on how long she stays with me. Can he get a discount because she's cute? Asked Tank, grinning. I should charge you more because of it. He snorted. Why? She stands out. Where we're going, she'll be remembered. Don't take her into town then, said Tank. To be honest, I'm not too worried about it, I replied, and then told Slammer my price. Tank whistled. Why don't I just take her somewhere for a few weeks? Because I need your help with the club, said Slammer. And son, I hate to say it, but you're dangerous with women. With my luck you'll end up in bed with Jessica. Tank's face darkened. It's not like that between us. We might not be blood-related, but as far as I'm concerned, she's my sister. Slammer patted him on the back. That's good. I was hoping you'd say that. He looked at me. I expect the same out of you. I'm paying you to keep her safe. If you touch her. Don't worry. I don't mix business with pleasure, I replied. Of course, there wasn't much pleasure in my personal life either. Something tells me you might need to remind Jessica of that, said Tank, smirking. Why is that? I asked surprised. Tank lowered his voice. I saw the way she was looking at you. Like a lovesick puppy. All I'd seen in her eyes was hesitation and fear. Sorry but I caught none of that. Whether she likes you or not, Jessica is fragile and needs protection. Nothing else, said Slammer his voice also low. It's been three years since she was attacked and she's still skittish around men. Keeps her distance and doesn't like to be touched. He clenched his jaw. That prick breaker really did a number on her. Don't worry. There won't be anything going on that you wouldn't approve of, I replied, as Jessica stepped back into the living room holding a large backpack. You're all set, asked Slammer walking over to her. I just need to call my mother first, she replied setting the bag down. Okay. I'll be right back. I need a beer, said Slammer walking into the kitchen. It's been a long day. No shit. Bring one for me too, called Tank. You'd better put some jeans on, I told Jessica. She looked confused. Why? We're taking a motorcycle, I replied. We wipe out and I'd hate to see those legs get road rash. Oh. I suppose I'd better go and change then, she answered, staring at me funny. After she left the room, Tank snorted. Those legs? I shrugged. Don't read anything into that, I said. I'd hate to see anyone get road rash. Right, he answered, obviously not believing me. 
Twenty minutes later, we were outside and getting ready to leave. I'd made her grab a leather jacket, which she'd also grumbled about. It was indeed hot outside, but I knew that if we did run into problems on the road, I didn't want any part of her getting hurt. Here, I said, handing her my helmet. What about you, she asked, her eyes widening. Shouldn't you have a helmet just in case? It took me a few seconds to answer. Jessica was standing close, and her tanned face glowed under the sunlight. She looked so young and sweet that it caught me off guard. I'll be fine. We only have a couple hours of riding. Slammer, do you have an extra helmet? She asked him. He was standing behind us, keeping an eye on the street. Your mother's, he sighed, but it's in her car at the moment. Sorry. Don't worry about it. It's not a problem. I got on the bike and slipped my sunglasses on. You ready? Jessica nodded and then turned to Slammer. I couldn't help but appreciate the way her jeans hugged her heart-shaped ass as she reached up to give him a hug. Goodbye, hun, he said, patting her on the back. Just remember you're in good hands. I couldn't hear what she replied back, but Slammer told her not to worry. He released Jessica and then Tank pulled her in for a hug. I'm going to miss you, he said, kissing her on the forehead, and then he looked at me. Call us when you get to your location. So we know she's safe. Definitely, I replied. Tank released Jessica and she turned to look at me, her eyes filled with anxiety. You okay? I asked, wondering again what in the hell I was doing. She nodded. Did you get a chance to call your mother? I asked. Yes. She upset? You could say that. She wanted to be here but she understands, replied Jessica. She turned to look at Slammer. By the way, I left my cell phone on the kitchen counter. Try not to lose it. If we do, I'll buy you a different one. I know you've had your eye on the newest model, he replied, winking. I'm holding you to it, although I don't care as much about the phone as I do my contact information. She slipped the helmet on over her head. Maybe you could go down the list and write all of the names and numbers, since I didn't have time to do it myself. Sounds like a job for Tank, said Slammer smirking. Tank grunted. I started the bike, and she got on behind me. You want us to follow you to the edge of town, asked Slammer. No. That might draw more attention, I replied, wanting to get away from the house. We'll call you later. He nodded. Hold on to me tightly, I told her, noticing that Jessica was barely touching me. She tightened her hold, but only slightly. I took off, and as soon as the speedometer needle began to rise, she clung to me. You ever ride before? I hollered, admittedly enjoying the feel of her arms around my waist. Yeah. Tank's given me a ride on his a couple of times. Don't you like it? Yes. It just takes me a few minutes to relax. Plus, we've never been on a long trip together. This will be my first. Then I'll make sure it's as good for you as it is for me, I said, and then kicked it down. Chapter 17 Jessica Riding on the back of Jordan's bike, going God knows where, it all felt surreal. I kept wondering if last night's fiasco even happened, and if the intriguing man in front of me was part of a dream. I almost hoped not, because there was something about him that got under my skin. Yes, I knew he was dangerous and had done some pretty dark things, but there was no denying that when he looked at me my knees felt like jelly, and my heart beat a little faster. It wasn't just that he was gorgeous, smelled amazing, and had a smile that belonged in the movies, there was something in his eyes. I'd always heard that they were the windows into the soul, and when I looked into his, I wondered if we had much more in common than either of us realized. We'd both been victims of monsters, and although we were dealing with the abuse in totally different ways, it was obvious that we'd both survived some pretty unspeakable horrors. You okay? He hollered as we left another small town. Yes. How much longer? I yelled back. Another forty minutes. Okay. I thought about the days ahead, and wondered again where this intriguing man was taking me. 
The thought of being alone with him had been frightening at first, but now I was feeling more of a squirmy excitement. The man, who everyone called the judge, wasn't what I'd expected, and it was definitely a relief. Of course I was basing what I felt by looks, which I knew was wrong, but something in my gut told me that although he was a killer, he wasn't necessarily a bad man. Jordan suddenly pointed up at the sky toward a beautiful eagle, and slowed slightly. As we drove, it almost appeared to be following us, and I had to smile. Those were endangered not too long ago, he hollered as it veered away from us. I know. The world is pretty messed up. It certainly is, I answered, staring at his gloved hands. Twenty-five minutes later, we were entering Cedar Rapids. What are we doing here? I asked, stiffening up as we passed the sign welcoming us. We're catching a plane. I relaxed. Oh. Okay. As we drove toward the airport, I half expected that we would run into one of the Devil's Rangers. We lucked out. When we arrived at the small airport, we dropped the bike off at a rental garage and grabbed our belongings from the saddlebags. Then he made a phone call to someone named Barney. When he was finished, he nodded toward the restrooms. I need to use the bathroom. I'll be out shortly. Okay, I replied. Would you like something to drink? He asked, motioning toward a small cafe that was down the hall. Actually, that sounds like a good idea. I'm a little thirsty. Here, he said, pulling out his wallet. He handed me some cash. It's going to be a long flight, so if you could get us a couple of sandwiches and maybe a bag of pretzels? Also, grab a couple bottles water. What kind of sandwiches? Whatever looks good, I'm not picky. Okay. I have money too, you know. I can help pay for some of this. Don't worry about it. Just thank Slammer when you see him next. This trip is on him, he replied, smiling. I smiled back. Of course it was. Will do. I'll meet you at the cafe. Okay. After he disappeared into the bathroom, I headed over to the small bistro and did what he asked. Then I sat down and began drinking one of the bottles of water. As I was screwing the cap back on, a man sat down next to me. Before I could tell him the seat was taken, he smiled and my jaw dropped. It was Jordan. Why are you undercover? I whispered, stunned that he was now wearing a short blonde wig and glasses. He'd also done something to his jet black eyebrows, because they were now much lighter, matching the new goatee surrounding his mouth. In my line of work I wear many disguises, he said softly. This one I use for traveling with the man who'll be flying us to my cabin. He thinks my name is Jim, by the way. Jim Blake. Not very original, I replied, smirking, what about me? Shouldn't I be wearing a disguise? He looked around. Maybe but there's no time. Here comes our pilot by the way. I followed his eyes and saw an older man with gray hair heading toward us. Long time no see, he said, smiling as he shook Jordan's hand. What happened? They fire you, Jim? No. Had a family emergency. This is my cousin, Jessica. She just separated from her husband and needs a quiet place to stay. Figured the cabin would be perfect. Nice meeting you, Jessica, said the man, holding out his hand. I'm Barney. Hi, I replied, shaking it. I didn't know you had family in Iowa, Jim, said Barney, staring at me curiously. I'm actually from Minnesota, I replied before he could answer. I drove out here earlier today to meet up with him. I grabbed Jordan's hand and noticed him flinch, but thankfully Barney didn't seem to notice. I'm so grateful that you're letting me stay, Jimmy. Regaining his composure, his lip curled up in a half-smile. We're family. It's the least I could do. I'm sorry to hear about you and your husband, said Barney as I released Jordan's hand. But I have to say, it's nice meeting one of Jim's family members. He's so quiet about his personal life. Sometimes I wonder if he's a Martian from outer space, sent here to spy on all of us. I laughed. Oh, he's always been like that. Doesn't like to share anything. 
Hell, sometimes I wonder if he's an alien myself. Barney chuckled. Jordan yawned. If I am, then you're both in trouble once we get into the sky. Especially now that you've blown my cover. Barney waved his hand. A, I've already had run-ins with aliens. We've got an agreement. I don't rat on them, and they keep it quiet about the pot I've got growing in the backyard. I stared at him in surprise. Barney, you're growing marijuana? He chuckled. It's for my wife. She uses it for medicinal purpose. She has Crohn's disease and says it helps with inflammation and pain. Aren't you afraid of getting arrested for growing it, though? I asked. His eyes sparkled. Growing what? I don't know what you're talking about. I smile and looked at Jordan, who I noticed was staring at me. We should get going, he said, looking away quickly. He checked his watch. It's almost seven. Yeah. We'd better get a move on, agreed Barney. I'm just happy that you were still in Iowa, said Jordan as we began walking toward the gates. To be honest, I took my time today. I didn't feel like rushing back home to an empty house. So, where do you live, Barney? I asked him. Alaska. Just like Jim, he replied. And there it was. We were going to Alaska. I glanced over at Jordan. Aren't there a lot of bears in Alaska? Like grizzlies? Before he could answer, Barney snorted. Honey, there are much scarier things in Iowa than there are in Alaska. Mark my words. I believed him. Chapter 18 Jessica When Jordan said the plane ride would take a few hours, he wasn't kidding. We flew for just over six, and by the time we landed in Anchorage, I was through with flying. I'd never been a fan of it myself, and after hitting a number of turbulent areas on the flight to Anchorage, I was happy to be back on solid ground. Here, said Jordan, when we were out of the plane. He handed him a thick brown envelope. You don't have to pay me, said Barney. I was coming back anyway. Give it to your cousin. She's probably going to need it more than anyone. Jordan opened up the envelope and took out five $100 bills. Here. Take this and don't give me any shit about it. Barney smiled. Fine. I've learned there's no use arguing with you. Exactly, he replied, shoving the envelope into his jacket pocket. That's another reason I enjoy working with you. You're a smart man and know when to cut your losses. Barney chuckled and turned to me. It was nice meeting you, Jessica. I hope everything works out for the best, he said, holding out his hand. I shook it. Thank you, Barney. He looked back at Jordan. When Sophie gets back into town, we should have you both over for dinner. She'd love to meet you, Jim. Lord knows she's heard enough about you. I'd love to meet her as well, he replied. Unfortunately, I'll be heading back out again in a few days. For more audit work. Barney nodded. Sure. Call me. I'll see if I'm free. I will definitely. Thanks again, man. You've been a lifesaver. You're welcome. Glad I could come through again. Go home and get some rest. That flight was pretty rough. I'm sure you're exhausted, said Jordan, patting him on the back. Yeah, those were some strong winds. I'm glad to be home, that's for sure, he replied. I don't know how you do it, I said. Flying scares the hell out of me. I normally enjoy it, said Barney. But those winds? I tell you what, when you hit that kind of turbulence with a smaller jet, you have to really know what you're doing. Thank God you do, I replied. He chuckled. Oh, I was thanking him when we landed. Believe me. The fact that he'd been a little frightened made me feel even less confident about flying again. Goodbye, Barney. He waved and then we watched him walk away carrying his duffel bag. He was a nice man, I said as we began walking in the opposite direction. Yep, he replied, becoming quiet again. So now what? 
I asked, trying to keep up with him as he walked. His strides were long and I guessed that he wasn't used to walking with anyone, especially a woman. We'll take a cab to my cabin, he replied, slowing down when he noticed that I was struggling to keep up. I stared at his blonde hair. Are you leaving your disguise on? Yes. Just in case we run into Barney again. Why? I kind of like it, I joked. You remind me of Ken. He frowned. Ken? Yeah, as in Ken and Barbie. Ha. Huh. Wasn't really going for the plastic yuppie type. You pretty much hit it out of the ballpark. Hell, if I would have known that you were dressing up, I could have worn the long platinum blonde wig I had in the back of my closet. He smirked. Okay, why do you have one of those? I used it for Halloween once. Didn't have the heart to throw it out yet, I replied as he pulled out his cell phone. Just think we could have been Ken and Barbie. That would have been entertaining. You think so, huh? He chuckled. You really enjoyed yourself back there, didn't you? You mean pretending to be your cousin? Yeah. I thought you were finished at the airport, but then to hear you tell stories of our childhood together when we were on the plane. You just kept going on and on. Hell, even I was starting to believe the stuff coming out of your mouth. I laughed, remembering the look on Jordan's face when I told Barney about the time we went skinny dipping as kids, and how Jim had thought a fish had nibbled on his privates. Then how he'd run home crying. Sorry. I just couldn't help myself. I was having so much fun I had a hard time stopping. You're just lucky he didn't know too much about me or those stories wouldn't have made a lot of sense. Yeah. I suppose. Sorry. It's okay. I could tell that you were enjoying yourself. He gave me a sideways look. You're quite the storyteller. I've always had a wild imagination, I guess. Plus, I used to star in some of our high school plays. Really? Did you enjoy doing them? Yes. Very much. I even considered going into acting. But then I realized that I wanted to save people more than I wanted to perform in front of them. Don't you have to do a little of that when you're a nurse anyway? Put on a fake smile when you know they're not doing too well? I nodded. Yeah, but I don't get any joy from that kind of acting, obviously. I suppose not, he said, dialing a number on his cell. I'm going to call us a cab and then afterward, we'll send word to your mother that we arrive to our destination safely. Remember, if I let you talk to her, don't tell her our location. I understand. I listened as he set up our taxi ride and wondered what his cabin would be like. If it was anything like the man, it would be private and very secluded. As nice as he'd been, he was a man with secrets. I just hoped that one of them wasn't a torture room in his basement. Chapter 19 Jordan Jessica was quiet during the cab ride to the cabin, and I was too tired to make conversation. When we arrived 30 minutes later, she seemed to perk up. This is really nice, she said, after I paid the driver and we were on the porch, surrounded by the familiar chirp of crickets. It was a sound that some found annoying. For me, it was more of a welcome home, to the one and only place that I could truly relax in. Thanks, I replied, surprised at the sudden relief I felt that she approved. It's not anything too fancy, but I always look forward to getting back here. I bet. It's bigger than I thought it would be. Oh really? It wasn't extremely large, about 2200 square feet, but it had a deck that wrapped around to the back, a small boathouse, and a long dock with a built-in bench at the end. I don't know. I guess I pictured a two-room cabin with one bedroom and an outhouse, she said, laughing. I pushed in the alarm code and turned on the light. They have those in Anchorage, too. Personally, I need space to move around, I said, thinking back to the times Acid had locked me in my small bedroom for punishment. Sometimes he kept me in for days, only feeding me when he wasn't too drunk or high to forget. After a while, I learned how to crawl out of my bedroom window and get back into the house while he was away. 
Wow, it's beautiful, said Jessica as she looked around the great room, which also opened up into the newly renovated kitchen. I looked around, remembering my first glimpse of the place. Hardwood floors, vaulted ceilings and large windows overlooking the lake had sold me on the cabin before I'd even viewed the three bedrooms. Thank you, I replied, as she walked over to the stone fireplace and picked up a photo that I had of Sammy. How long have you lived here, she asked, putting it back down. I bought it a couple of years ago. She turned around and looked at me. Thank you, Jordan. For what? For letting me stay here. I know it couldn't have been an easy decision. It hadn't been, but now that she was here, it didn't feel quite as bad as I'd imagined. You're safe. That's what matters. I have to admit, I feel like nobody could find us out here. That's what I was going for when I bought the cabin. Another mission accomplished. I smiled. I'm going to take a quick shower and then make something to eat. Feel free to watch television or make yourself comfortable. Which room am I staying in? she asked. There are two guest rooms down the hallway and to the left of the linen closet. Pick whichever one you want. Oh, and you'll find clean linen in the closet. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, I replied, heading toward my bedroom. When I was finished with my shower, I slipped on a pair of sweatpants and a white t-shirt, and then headed into the kitchen where I found Jessica watching the news. Anything new going on in the world that we should be worried about? I asked, opening up the refrigerator. Just the same old crap, she said, turning off the television. Arms talks, hurricanes and fugitives on the run. I can see why you like being so far up north. This place doesn't come without its own problems, believe me. Would you like a beer? Sure, she replied. I grabbed two bottles out of the refrigerator and uncapped them. You hungry? Very. Do you like eggs? I'm in the mood for an omelet myself. She smiled. An omelet sounds wonderful. Would you like any help? I took a swig of my beer and went back to the refrigerator. No, I can actually hold my own in the kitchen. She laughed. Adriana says Trevor loves to cook too. I didn't say that I love to cook, but I can certainly handle an omelet, I said, pulling out a carton of eggs, ham, cheddar cheese, and a green pepper. What about you? Do you like to cook? Sometimes. My mother does most of the cooking at home, but once in a while, I make dinner. So, how do you get along with Slammer? I asked, grabbing a pan from the cupboard. He's nice enough. It took me a while to get used to him. What do you mean? Well, his lifestyle. The way he views women and, she smiled grimly, the constant swearing. Sometimes I don't think he knows any other word but F word. It's an easy way out. What do you mean? Most people that swear all the time are lacking in communication skills or just too lazy to come up with anything more colorful. But then there are those situations where no other word can replace the bad ones. Sometimes you just have to say fuck. Jessica snorted. Yeah, like when I was abducted. Exactly. I said that word a few times that night. No other one can best describe those fucks. I laughed and nodded toward the bangle she was staring at on her wrist. That's nice. Someone special give you that? My mom. It was a graduation present. I was just thinking it was a surprise that Reaper's crew didn't try and steal it. Maybe they didn't even notice it. Your mom has great taste by the way. Thanks. She stared up at me. I'm sorry about your mom. My eye twitched. No need to be sorry. I heard what she did. Leaving you with your dad, who was obviously disturbed. Yeah, well as far as I'm concerned they were just sperm and egg donors, I said tightly. Anyway, I try not to think about them. Oh my god. I'm sorry, she replied quickly, looking embarrassed. I shouldn't have brought them up. I feel like such an idiot. You're not an idiot, I said, feeling like an ass myself making her uncomfortable. She didn't know. I just don't like talking about them. I get it. 
So what about your old man? Where is he? My real father. Yeah. He died a few years ago. Car accident. I looked up from cutting the green pepper. Oh. Sorry to hear that. Thanks. What was he like? Her eyes shone as she talked about him. He was such a good man. Used to take me to the park all the time when I was little. Gave me piggyback rides. Laughed a lot. The perfect father, huh? I asked, happy for her. She nodded. Yes. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money and never went on any expensive vacations, but he made sure that I went camping and fishing in the summers and that we built snow forts and went ice skating together in the winters. So you know how to fish? Yes. I love to fish. I can even fillet them. That's great. Your dad teach you that too. Yes, but to be honest, I haven't done either in a long time. I kind of miss it. Well, since I have a boat and this lake is swimming with fish, we're going to have to fix that, I said, mixing the eggs in a bowl. Really? Sure. I have a boat we can use too. Just have to acquire a license and get some bait. How about tomorrow morning? Sounds great, she said, looking excited. For some reason, I was a little excited about it myself. Chapter 20 Jessica I couldn't help but stare at Jordan as we sat down together and ate. Not only did he look relaxed and happy, but whenever he smiled, I felt like it wasn't something he was used to doing. Something told me that he spent a lot of time alone. Do you date very much? I asked, shocking both of us. His eyebrows shot up. Date? I blushed. I'm sorry. I'm being nosy. It's okay. He didn't answer, but I figured since I'd thrown it out there, I'd ask again. So you don't or you do? His lip curled up. I don't have a lot of time for dating. Not with all my traveling and... Terminating? I asked lightly. His eyes widened and then he smiled grimly. Pretty much. Then it must get pretty lonely up here. Yeah, but I don't mind. I've always been a loner. I enjoy the privacy. What about you? He asked, changing the subject. You date much? No, I said, and then smiled humorlessly. Not that I've been trying. I'm sure if you gave it any effort at all, there'd be a line outside your door. I smiled at him in surprise. I don't know about that. You're a beautiful girl. You must know that. Um, well thank you. You're not so bad yourself, I replied, feeling a little giddy that he thought I was beautiful. Right. You've seen my hands, he said, looking down at his food. Yeah. So. They're nothing to be embarrassed about, Jordan. I'm not embarrassed about them. So, you just think they're ugly? He held up his left hand. They're certainly not pretty. I'm not sure if it was the beer that made me do it, but I grabbed it and rubbed my thumb over the scarred skin. I don't think they're ugly, Jordan. I really don't. Our eyes met. You're just saying that. My heart was pounding in my chest. I hadn't touched a man other than Slammer and Tank for so long because of my fears. Yet, looking into Jordan's eyes, I could see that he was more frightened of what I was doing than I was. Why would I need to? I don't know, he said softly. Because you're a nice girl? Being honest is part of being a nice girl, I told him. I stared down at his hand, still rubbing the skin with my fingers. Obviously, they're scarred, but what I see are the hands of a survivor. To me, that makes them beautiful. He didn't say anything. I licked my lips. I have scars too, I said softly. From Breaker. His eyes hardened but he didn't ask where. On my upper thighs, I said, looking down at my thighs. So, I guess we both have nice little reminders of the shit we've been through. What about cosmetic surgery? Why haven't you had cosmetic surgery? I shot back. Many reasons. 
one of them being that I don't want to forget. I smiled sadly. Funny. I'd do anything to forget. I wish you could forget too, he said, turning his hand over so that he now held mine. You're a good man, Jordan Steele, I said, staring into his eyes again. I could feel the electricity between us, and was exhilarating. He suddenly released my hand, as if it had grown hot. I'm sorry, I said, hating the guarded look now in his eyes. I didn't mean to embarrass you. You didn't embarrass me, he said, standing up. I'm just tired. I'm sure both of us could use some sleep. What time is it? Almost 6 a.m., he answered, picking up his plate. Oh. Wow, I said, also standing up. I grabbed my own plate and followed him to the sink. Can I help you with the dishes? No, don't worry about it. I can handle these. Okay, I said, looking up at him. I smiled nervously. It was a nice talk. Thank you. He stared down at me and I could tell he wanted to say something more, but struggling with it. Curious but not wanting to push anything, I bit my lower lip. So, um, would you mind if I used your shower? Not at all. Go ahead. There should be some fresh towels in there. Okay. Thanks, I said, turning to walk away. Jordan suddenly touched my arm. Hey, it was a good talk. I looked up at his damp dark hair, which was a little messy, had the strangest urge to touch it. What is it? he asked, giving me a curious grin. I. He ran a hand through it. Let me guess, I'm having a bad hair day and it's not even eight in the morning? Actually, it looks great, I replied. Your hair. And everything else about you, I wanted to add but didn't dare to. Well, that's a relief, he teased. I could almost see the boy he might have been in those dancing eyes of his. The child who'd never had a mother, or the true love of a father. It tore at my heart. Before either of us knew what was happening, I threw my arms around Jordan and hugged him. Surprisingly enough, he didn't push me away. In fact, his hand circled around my waist and soon I felt like the one being comforted, it felt so good. I closed my eyes, inhaling the fresh scent of his cotton t-shirt while my cheek rested against his chest. I wasn't sure what we were doing anymore, but I didn't want him to let go. Is this okay? I whispered. You're asking me? He murmured, a smile in his voice. He touched the back of my hair lightly. I think I should be asking you if it's okay. I hugged you first, remember? How can I forget? As we held each other, a new awareness began to spread through me. An awareness that I was deeply attracted to Jordan and the idea of us kissing didn't frighten me. In fact, I began to feel warm at the thought of his mouth on mine, our tongues dancing together. I let out a slow breath, keenly aware that my body was responding to him holding me. Something I hadn't experienced for a very long time. Jordan's lips brushed my temple and then he began rubbing my back. Our bodies were so close that I could feel the rhythm of his heart against my ear. It was beating quickly, and I wondered if he was as attracted to me as I was to him. Then I felt his excitement and heat wash through me. Then a face from my nightmares popped into my head. Look at me, bitch. Stiffening up, I let go of Jordan and backed away. I'm sorry, he said awkwardly. You didn't do anything wrong. It was me. His eyes burned into mine and I knew he saw the tears. Fortunately, he didn't press me about them. Okay. Chapter 21 Jordan Jessica left the kitchen and I finished the dishes, my mind on earlier. What had started out as an innocent hug had almost gotten out of control. I could only blame it on myself. Good going, dumbass. One thing was for certain, from the look in her eyes, she was still struggling with those inner demons. Breaker had done such a number on her that I really wanted to kill the bastard all over again. This time make it even more painful. Sighing, I turned on the dishwasher and walked toward my bedroom. As I passed by the bathroom, I could hear the shower running, and I suddenly pictured her standing under the water, naked. 
Pushing the images away, I went into my bedroom, made sure my gun was within reach, and stripped. Then I slid into the sheets and stared at the ceiling, my perverted mind returning to the beautiful woman standing in my shower. She was off limits in every way. I had to remember that, especially now that I was her protector. Chapter 22 Jessica Bitch look at me growled Breaker. No, I cried, trying to get away from him. Wasn't he dead? Leave me alone. Jessica. Wake up. You're okay. It's just a dream. Stop. I gasped, feeling his hands on my arms. He'd been chasing me through a cemetery where all of the victims of the Devil's Rangers had been buried, including Raptor's mother. There was also a tombstone with my name on it, and he was trying to drag me back over to the hole so he could push me into it. It's me. Jordan. You're okay. Wake up. Jordan? I opened my eyes, fragments of the nightmare still haunting me. Sorry, I said, staring up at Jordan, who was sitting next to me on the bed. You had me worried there, he said, smiling grimly. You were screaming and I thought someone had broken in here. Embarrassed, I looked away. I'm sorry. I should have told you that I sometimes talk in my sleep. That was a little more than talking, he said, smoothing the hair away from my face. You okay now? I thought back to the times when I'd woken up in the middle of the night, my mother standing over me with tears in her eyes. I didn't want her or anyone else worrying about me. I'm fine. Let me guess, you were dreaming about one of those assholes, Breaker or Reaper? I smiled sheepishly. Breaker. I'm sorry if I woke you. There is absolutely nothing to be sorry about, Jessica. I turned and stared at the foot of the bed, remembering Breaker's eyes. They'd been so cold. So hateful. I haven't had a nightmare about him in such a long time. I guess I thought I was over them. It's probably because of all the stuff going on in your life at the moment. Yeah, I'm sure you're right. I sighed. Even dead, that prick still has power over me. He has no power over you, said Jordan sternly. Don't ever think that. He apparently still has power over my dreams, I countered. Because I certainly can't stop them from happening. Nobody can. Look, it's just your subconscious at work. The nightmares will eventually pass. Yes. I know you're right. I just hate that they can be triggered so easily. It was violence that created them and violence that brought them back. We just have to make sure that it stays out of your life from here on out. Moving away from Jensen has got to help, I answered, thinking of Cheryl's house in Shoreview again. I hope. At least after this crap with Kodiak is sorted out. It's a good start. He stood up. And believe me, it will get sorted. One way or another. What about you? He tilted his head to the side. What about me? You must have nightmares doing what you do. Yes, he admitted. How do you usually get through them? He shrugged. Like I said before, you can't control your dreams. I guess I've just learned to accept them. I grinned. So, you basically roll with the flow. I guess you could say that. He grinned back. Just be grateful you don't sleepwalk. My eyes widened. You sleepwalk? It's been a while. Mostly when I was a kid. When was the last time it happened? It's been a few months. I woke up in the kitchen one night, after walking into a wall. I laughed. Wow. Did you ever wake up outside? A couple of times, back when I was just a kid. But then the old man started locking me in my bedroom at night. His smile fell. Took care of the problem. My heart went out to him. I couldn't imagine living with someone so cruel. Maybe you were trying to get away from him? In your dreams? He didn't reply, but I could tell from the look in his eyes, I was probably right. Sorry, I said, feeling foolish for bringing up his past again. Me and my big mouth. 
Don't worry about it. I decided to change the subject quickly. So, what time is it? About nine in the morning. You should try and get back to sleep, though. It's only been a couple of hours. Go back to sleep? I replied dryly, pulling the sheet up to my neck. Right. You worried about having another nightmare? To be perfectly honest, it's not just that. I keep thinking that Reaper is going to bust through the window any minute, I replied, nodding toward the wall. Believe me, Reaper doesn't know where you are, and if he did, he wouldn't be alive long enough to be any kind of threat. The last time someone reassured me that I was safe, Reaper's club kidnapped me not less than 30 minutes later. So, you can understand why I'm not feeling very confident about anything right now. Do you want me to stay in here with you? No, I replied, a little surprised that he'd volunteered. You don't have to. It's okay. I don't mind at all. I bit my lower lip. I don't want to be a pain in the ass. Don't worry about it. The truth is, if you can't sleep, I can't either knowing that you're frightened. Okay, if you're sure it's not too much of a bother? I mean? I guess I would feel more comfortable if I wasn't alone. Not at all. I'll go grab a sleeping bag. Staring down at the hardwood floor, I could imagine how uncomfortable it would be. Making up my mind, I moved over on the bed. Why don't you just sleep in the bed with me? The surprised look on his face was almost comical. You're not serious? Sure, why not? We can put a pillow between us, if it makes you more comfortable. A pillow? Yeah, and don't worry, I'll keep my hands to myself, I teased. He stared at me with amusement. Tell you what, why don't we go to my room? I have a king-sized bed. There will be more space between us. Less chance of you taking advantage of me. I laughed. Sure. Okay then. I guess I'll meet you there, he said, still looking bewildered as he headed toward the doorway. Grabbing my pillow, I followed him down the hallway, to his bedroom. When I walked in and saw the bed, I had to admit, I was glad he'd suggested it. The mattress was a luxurious pillow top. He got in first and moved over to the other side. Come on in. The water's warm, he said, yawning. I bit my lower lip, wondering all of a sudden what I'd been thinking. It is, huh? He winked. Don't worry. I'll stay in the deep end. Seeing a man like that waiting for me under the sheets, half-naked and hot as hell, caused so many emotions I wasn't sure how to feel about it. Swallowing, I got in and pulled the covers around me. You okay? He whispered, not one part of our bodies touching. Yes, I whispered back. As we lay there together, I suddenly felt anxious and began to babble like an idiot. So nobody knows that you own this place? I asked, cutting through the silence. Just you now. Someone could find records though, right? The person on the title of this property isn't Jordan Steele. It's actually Samuel Larson. My eyes widened. Your nephew? Yes. I want him to have it. He's going to need a safe place to go someday. Especially if he follows in his old man's footsteps. You mean if he joins the club? Oh, he will. Raptor loves the club and his boy will too. What are your views on that? Joining a club? He shrugged. To each their own. Most members have grown up in that kind of lifestyle and would feel lost without it. If that's what makes them happy, then so be it. Your father was in a club, right? Yes. You never decided to join? No. I waited for him to tell me more, but he remained silent. You don't really like talking about yourself, do you? Not much more to know about me. I'm a relatively simple man, other than what I do for a living. I laughed out loud. Really? A simple man, huh? You don't really expect me to believe that, do you? Why not? I stared at him in disbelief. You must think I'm gullible. No, but you are a woman, he said, a slow smile spreading across his face, and like most you tend to overthink things. 
especially when it comes to men. Most of us are pretty straightforward. Right, I said smiling. Jordan Steele was obviously anything but. You're so full of it, and a little chauvinistic, I might add. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're overanalyzing me again. I snorted. Right. Seriously, I'm just like most average guys, and are happy with the basics. And what is that? Food on the table, a well-paying job, and sex. The fact that he'd brought up sex, and we were lying together in bed made my stomach heat up. Sorry, but I can't even believe you're saying that with a straight face. His lip twitched. You don't believe me? When it comes to you, I guess I really don't know what to believe. But something tells me that you're holding back. That your needs are not really so generic. He turned to his side and stared down at me. Maybe, but the truth is, that's all I can afford to need. What about family or love? There's no room in my life for either, he replied, now looking past me. Then maybe you should change your life. He sighed and lay back on his pillow. It's not that easy, he said, closing his eyes. Even if I could, I've made too many enemies. Their lives would always be in danger. I couldn't do that to anyone I cared about. He was obviously right. There was no point in arguing it, so I said nothing. Jordan yawned. I'm exhausted. Good night. Sweet dreams, I said softly. You too. Chapter 23 Jordan When I woke up several hours later, Jessica was snuggled up against my arm still sound asleep. It would have been fine if one of her hands wasn't dangerously close to my morning wood. Swearing to myself, I slid out of bed. Hey, she mumbled, opening one eye. What time is it? Almost two in the afternoon. Really? Her gaze lowered to my crotch and her eyes grew wide. She quickly looked away. I'll be right back, I said, seeing her blush. Ah, uh, sure. After I finished in the bathroom, I found her in the guest room, digging through her backpack. How did you sleep? She looked at me over her shoulder. Better. Thank you. I folded my arms across my chest and leaned against the doorway. Good to hear. So, what are we doing today? Well, for starters, I don't know about you, but I'm hungry again. How about we drive into town and eat somewhere? I asked as she pulled out a pair of faded jeans and a light blue t-shirt. Sure, she replied, taking out what looked like some kind of a makeup bag. Would you mind if I called my mother again later? Not at all. Thanks. I appreciate it. No problem, I replied. I'm going to go and take a shower. Let's plan on leaving here in about an hour. Sounds good. A little over an hour later, we were on my Harley and heading toward Ben's Tavern. You doing okay? I asked as we stopped at a red light. This is great, she answered with a big smile. What a wonderful day for a drive. I agree. It was definitely perfect weather for a bike ride with temperatures in the 60s. Not too hot. Not too cold. The light turned green and for the rest of the ride, I took my time, so we could enjoy the beautiful Alaskan scenery which reminded me of why I'd moved there. When we finally arrived at the restaurant, we took off our helmets and went inside. I suppose my hair looks just wonderful, she said dryly, running her fingers through it. You look great, I answered, meaning it. Although her hair was a little flattened from the helmet I'd given her, Jessica's cheeks were pink and her eyes were sparkling. So, do you come to this place often? She asked after we were seated across from each other in one of the booths. I looked around the rustic bar, which had been featured in a popular television food channel, for their giant steaks and large selection of wings. I've only been here once. I had a burger, and it was pretty damn good though. Um. I'm in the mood for a good burger, she said, opening up the menu. A woman who can eat, I replied. That's refreshing. Oh, I can definitely eat, but I definitely have to work it off, she replied, staring at the menu. How do you do that? She shrugged. Pilates, yoga. 
Kickboxing. Good for you. She looked at me over the menu, her eyes twinkling. It's not by choice. It usually never is. You must work out, she said, glancing at my biceps. I jog and do some weight training. I'm sure you have to stay in shape to do what you do. It helps. I think I'm going to try another of their burgers, I replied, wanting to move the subject away from my profession. It was then that I noticed an attractive woman staring at me from across the room. Recognizing the blonde from the gas station, I quickly averted my eyes. My name is Kathy. I'll be serving you today. Can I get you two started off with a couple of drinks? Asked a gravelly voice. Hi, Kathy. I just want a glass of water, said Jessica. Me too, I told Kathy, who I guessed to be in her sixties. She was short, with curly white hair and glasses. Kathy smiled and nodded. Sure thing. I'll be back with those shortly. Do you want to order an appetizer? I looked at Jessica. No. I don't need anything, she answered. What about you, she asked, looking at me. What do you recommend? I asked. Well, we're known for our wings, and right now because it's happy hour, they're half-priced. Is that right? I answered. I guess we can't go wrong there, can we? It's definitely a good deal. There are 15 different kinds to choose from, too. You can also get them plain, if you'd rather. Nice. Tell you what, I'll take an order of your spiciest. I'm in the mood for something hot. That would be the Hellfire Wings. Have you ever had them before? asked Kathy. No, I said, smirking, but they sound interesting. That's not how most people describe them, she replied, looking at me in amusement. Believe me, he's not most people, said Jessica, chuckling. And I'm definitely not afraid of a little heat, I added. So bring them on. Okay. I'll put in an order, but you should know we make you sign a waiver, indicating that you know what's in them. What's in them? I asked. She smiled. They're made with ghost peppers. As in boot shalakia. I asked. She scratched her head and shrugged. To be honest, I don't really know what the hell that is. All I know is that these things are killers. They creep up on you and it's all over but the crying for your mama, she answered, winking. Something tells me this isn't your mama either. Nope, I replied. Gotta say, you're not exactly selling me on the wings, Kathy. She laughed. I know. Don't tell my manager. I just want you to know, because I'd hate to see you cry in front of this pretty girl. I rubbed my chin. Maybe I'll pass on them. I don't know. Those wings sound like they're right up your alley, said Jessica, a twinkle in her eye. You should try them. See what it's like, being on the other side of pain. Kathy's eyebrows raised. Other side. He's an exterminator, said Jessica. Oh, you kill bugs, asked the waitress with a grimace. Something like that, I said. I think I'll pass on the wings. Are you afraid of a little heat? asked Jessica. You know, I'm beginning to think that you want to see me suffer, I told her. I just want to see if you can handle the ghost peppers, said Jessica, smiling. Can you? Just because I'm a woman doesn't mean I can't handle a few wings. Tell you what, if you eat some of them with me, I'll prove I can handle even more than you, I answered, thinking she'd decline. Fine. I accept your challenge. Can I get a tall glass of milk? asked Jessica, surprising me. You sure you want to take a chance with those, honey? asked the waitress, frowning. They don't call them hellfire wings for nothing. Jessica smirked. I don't know, I'm starting to think that I haven't been taking enough chances these days. And you really want to start making changes with wings that will knock you on your ass, I said, chuckling. We'll see who gets knocked on their ass, she replied, and then looked at Kathy. Bring on the wings. You heard the woman. Bring them on. We'll both take an order, and I'll also have a glass of milk too. Okay. It's your mouths. I'll put in the order and bring you the waivers. You finish every last one and you get a t-shirt by the way. 
Get it ready, I said. Because only one of us is going home with a shirt today. I take a large, by the way. Kathy shook her head, smiling. We'll see, honey. We'll see. Jessica's rolled her eyes. Hope the collar is big enough to go over that fat head of his. Laughing, the waitress walked away. Have you ever had spicy wings before? I asked. I mean wings so hot that they make your nose run. A couple of times. Nothing with ghost peppers though. I grinned. She had no idea what she was getting herself into. If you want to back out, we can still catch Kathy before she places the orders. I'm not backing out, she said firmly. I need something to take my mind off of things, and I doubt there are many other contests that I can realistically beat you at. So you really think that you can beat me on this? She pulled off a black binder that was on her wrist and began pulling her hair back into a ponytail. I don't know if you're aware, but women can usually tolerate pain a lot better than men. Right, I said dryly. I'm a nurse, she said, wrapping the binder around her hair. I know these things, although I'm sure that your threshold for pain is pretty high. You think right, Nurse Betty, I said. So, are you ready to lose? Said the hare to the tortoise, she replied, now playing with the sugar packets. Just remember, this isn't a fairy tale, it's real life, I told her. She grunted. You don't have to tell me. My mouth was on fire as I reached for the second glass of milk. I gulped some of it down and swore when it didn't help. What happened to over-excessive swearing is lazy, she remarked. Fuck lazy, I replied, grabbing a napkin. I wiped the tears under my eyes and then swore again when they in turn began to burn. And fuck what I said. Can we get some iced water this time? Asked Jessica, when Kathy appeared back at the table with our burgers and fries. Of course. Are you okay? She asked, and then looked down at the plate of wings sitting in front of me. How many did you eat, two? Three? He ate two and couldn't finish the third, said Jessica, who had eaten four of them. Although she'd also thrown in the towel, she didn't appear to be going through half as much agony as I was. You seem to be doing okay, remarked Kathy. Better than him anyway, said Jessica. I guess I made him eat his words. Not only that, he knows better than to challenge you again, said Kathy, her eyes twinkling. Still I wouldn't hold my breath, said Jessica. Iced water please, I said to Kathy. Actually, another glass of milk would be better, said Jessica. Water can make the burn feel worse. Kathy sucked in her breath. Oh sorry, I'll get you something, she replied, hurrying away. You going to be okay over there? Laughed Jessica. I don't get it. Why aren't you dying like me? And don't give me that thing about being a woman. Not when it comes to eating hellfire wings, I said, wiping the sweat from my forehead. Those damn things are evil. I won't argue that. Are you finished with yours? She asked, looking down at my plate. Hell yeah. And you agree that I'm the winner? I guess I'll have to. She grinned. Sugar. What about it? I put some in my mouth when you weren't paying attention, and it helped take the burn away. Really? I said, grabbing a packet. I opened it up and shook some into my mouth. After a few seconds, the burn started to recede. That's amazing. Would have never guessed. I'm surprised that you weren't aware of it yourself. I lowered my voice. I'm paid to give pain, not remove it. Unlike you, Nurse Betty. Seriously, enough with the Nurse Betty. I grinned. What's wrong with that? Everything. And don't you dare call me that in front of Tank. With my luck, he and the rest of the club will start calling me it. I won't, I replied. I'll keep it just between us. Thank you. You're welcome. I lowered my voice. Nurse Betty. She groaned. Has anyone told you that you're really annoying at times? I laughed. Yes. It's part of my charm. Right, well your brother never mentioned how charming you were, she said dryly. Raptor. She nodded. 
Makes sense. We hardly know each other. And why is that? He paused and then shrugged his shoulders. It's too dangerous. I don't want to mix my world with his or Sammy's. You do realize that Raptor's world is already dangerous. Another reason why I don't want to make things worse. The Gold Vipers have enemies, but I have so many more. You have to realize that these same enemies are now Raptors too. Everyone knows your brothers now, Jordan. They're already at risk. I sighed. So there's really no need to stay away. She smiled. And Sammy, he is such a sweet kid. You should really get to know him. I think he really needs to know who his uncle is. That's one thing he doesn't need to know, I said quietly. I disagree. The man sitting across from me is definitely worth knowing. Kathy returned to our table with the glass of milk and our meals. Both of us had ordered a cheeseburger and fries. Thanks, I said. Yes, thank you, said Jessica. Hopefully these will go down easier than your wings, said Kathy, winking as she walked away. I still think you should visit Jensen more, said Jessica, grabbing the bottle of ketchup. I sighed. Jessica, besides what you think you know of me, I'm not a family guy. I don't want to pop into Sammy's life and then have to feel guilty about staying away. I don't want to. Be like your mother, Mavis, she interrupted. Hey, you're his uncle. It's not a big deal if you're not with him all the time. Come on, Jordan, let Sammy meet you. He really needs to find out what a great guy his uncle is. Damn it, she was persistent. I'm not a great guy, I answered, wishing she'd drop it. Jessica reached over and grabbed my hand. Bullshit, Jordan. I know about your reputation and I know what you've done, but I also know that you're trying to do the right thing, even if it's a little twisted. You think what I'm doing is twisted? Of course I do, and don't look at me like that. Murder is still murder, even if it's for something that you believe in. Are you finished? No. I didn't think so, I mumbled feeling my eye twitch. It's also obvious that you don't want people in your life because you're frightened of letting them in. Of getting hurt. Well we're all afraid of that at some degree, Jordan. Every last one of us, whether we were raped, or our parents beat us, or we had the perfect childhood. You think you know me but you don't, I said sharply. Her eyes searched mine. To be honest, I don't think you really do either. You don't know me, Jessica. Not really. And don't make the mistake of thinking that I'm something I'm not, I replied, suddenly realizing that things were getting too comfortable between us. She was a woman in danger, and I was her bodyguard. So you think I have it all wrong about you, she asked slowly. Yes I do, I replied, pulling my hand away, angry at myself. I had a job to do and here we were, holding hands. Hell, last night we'd slept in the same bed together. If she would have even so much as hinted at having sex, I would have been all over that too. The woman was getting under my skin, and as far as I was concerned, that was much more dangerous than the situation with Reaper. She tilted her head, studying me. Who are you then? Who am I? Just a guy hired to protect you, I said, grabbing the ketchup. I squeezed some onto my plate. I needed to put some distance between us before I really screwed things up even worse. Apparently, it's getting a little gray in that area. I see, she said quietly. From her expression, I could see that I'd hurt her feelings. It didn't make me proud, but at least she'd know that I wasn't a man looking to be redeemed. How is everything? asked Kathy, stopping back at the table. Great, I said, dipping a fry into the ketchup. As I shoved it into my mouth, I noticed that the woman from the gas station was staring at me again. Yes, it's very good, said Jessica, still not looking at me. Um, where are your bathrooms? In the back, she said, waving her thumb. Jessica wiped her hands with a napkin. Okay. I'll be back. I nodded. Kathy turned to me. Can I get you anything else? Some water? I'm good. Okay, she replied. Enjoy the rest of your meals. Thanks. After the waitress walked away, 
I finished up my burger while I waited for Jessica. As I started on the fries, the woman from across the restaurant walked over to me. Hi. Remember me, she asked, her perfume engulfing me. It was something bold and sexy. Like her. I smiled. The attorney. She smiled back. Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt your meal, but I need to talk to you about something. Me? Yes, believe it or not, she said, sounding amused. Am I in trouble? She threw her head back and laughed. Something tells me you're always in trouble. I smiled again. You have me there. So what exactly is this about? She lowered her voice. Actually, I was hoping we could talk in private. This isn't something I can discuss, out in the open. Can you meet me later tonight? I stared at her, still puzzled as to what it was that she wanted. I hadn't even given her my name on our last meeting. Is this something that we could discuss over the phone? No. It's not that easy. It needs to be handled face to face. It's not about your lonely nights in Anchorage, is it? She laughed. No. Not exactly. Okay. We can meet up. When and where would you like to do this? My secretary and I will be heading back to our office, over on Emerald Street. It's only a couple blocks from here. I'll be there until 8. Stop by before then. I reached into my pocket and grabbed a pen. What's the address? She told me. Okay. I'll be there as soon as I can. She looked over her shoulder where Jessica had disappeared. You know. I think it's best if you left your girlfriend at home. She's just a friend, I replied. Caitlin relaxed. I was hoping you'd say that. I'll see you in a couple of hours, Mr. Steele. I stared at her in surprise. Noticing my expression, she touched my shoulder. Yes. I know your name. I know quite a bit about you. But don't worry, handsome, I'm on your side. You are, huh? Yes, I am. Oh, and speaking of your friend, here she comes. Don't forget to leave her behind. The information I have doesn't and shouldn't involve her. Okay, I replied. Can I at least get a hint as to what this is about? Caitlin leaned over and whispered in my ear. Just keep your gavel at home, judge. I gritted my teeth. She stepped back and turned to smile at Jessica, who was now standing at the table. Oh, excuse me, she said, getting out of her way. No problem, said Jessica, looking at Caitlin with interest as she slid back into the booth. I look forward to seeing you later, said the lawyer, her attention back to me. We have a lot to discuss. I smiled coolly. Apparently. Winking, she turned around and walked back to her table. Who is she? asked Jessica. A lawyer. Are you going to meet with her today? Yes, I said, looking back over toward Caitlin, who joined another woman also dressed in business attire. They both caught me staring and smiled. I turned away. I take it this is a private meeting? asked Jessica dryly. Yep. Jessica grunted. What? Nothing, she said stiffly. I'll finish my burger and we can head out. So you can get to your meeting. Okay, I answered, my mind still on Caitlin. She not only knew my real identity, she was a lawyer. On a lighter note, she apparently still wanted me. That had to give me some kind of leverage. Chapter 24 Jessica Jordan was distant for the rest of our meal and on the ride back to his cabin. The tension between us put a horrible knot in my stomach. We'd been having such a good time, laughing and joking the last few hours, and now he'd suddenly closed down on me. I wanted to blame it on the lawyer, but I knew the real reason. I'd been pushy and had asked too many questions, upsetting him. I decided to give the man space from now on in hopes that he'd come around. I'd meant what I'd said about there being a good guy buried somewhere inside. I wanted to see him again. When we arrived at the cabin, Jordan unlocked the door and I followed him inside. 
I have a few errands to run so make yourself at home while I'm gone, he said, as I sat down on the sofa and tucked my feet underneath me. That includes meeting with that lawyer? I asked, trying not to sound jealous, even though I had to admit that part of me was seething. It had started after I'd noticed the way the woman had been openly appraising him, with her eyes. She wanted Jordan. I just didn't know if the feeling was mutual. Afraid so. Jordan? What? he asked, looking through some of his mail. I stood up and walked over to him. Are you angry with me? He suddenly looked uncomfortable. Why would you ask that? You're not acting like yourself. Jordan stared at me and his jaw clenched. Not acting like myself? I thought we already went through this. You don't know me, you can't know if I'm acting like myself, so quit trying to analyze everything I do. I flinched at his words, not sure whether to cry or get angry myself. I raised my chin. I guess I don't know who you are. Sighing, he looked away. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump all over you. I'm just stressed out. I sighed. It's okay. I'll be back in a couple of hours. I might try and call you later. So if the cabin phone rings, you'll know it's me. All right. He took out a piece of paper and wrote down his cell phone number. Then he left it by the phone. How long do you think you'll be gone? Probably a couple hours give or take, he said, walking to the front door. He stopped and turned back around. Jessica, remember that this is a business arrangement. I'm getting paid to keep you alive. That's it. I get it, I said tightly. In other words, I needed to back off because he wasn't looking for a friend. Nodding, he walked out the door without another word. After Jordan took off on his motorcycle, I watched television but quickly became bored. Yawning, I turned it off and began wandering around the cabin, looking for something to do. Eventually, I found some books about Alaska that he had lying around. I picked one up that looked interesting and soon found myself outside, heading toward the lake. When I reached the dock, I walked to the end and sat down on the bench, admiring the majestic beauty that was all around me. From the ducks swimming near the shoreline, to the lush wilderness and mountains in the distance, I found myself captivated. The only thing that could have made the experience better, was to have shared it with Jordan. Which evidently isn't happening anytime soon, I mumbled. I didn't know what was going through his head right now, but I'd stumbled upon another side of Jordan's steel that was so much more than what he claimed to be. I'd seen it in his eyes and had felt it in his touch. He was a man with depth and feeling. A man who was struggling with what he thought he wanted and what he really needed. Chapter 25 Jordan Driving toward Caitlin's office, Jessica's expression haunted me. The look in her eyes when I told her how it needed to be made me feel like a prick. But I knew that it was the right thing to do. Things had started getting far too cozy between us, I knew if I wasn't careful we'd end up doing more than just sleeping in my bed. That shit couldn't happen. And then there was the thing with Sammy. She'd made me feel guilty for wanting to stay out of his life, and I couldn't allow that either. It was bad enough that his old man was in a club who'd made a few enemies. But they were nothing compared to the kind of people that wanted me dead. My phone began to vibrate, so I pulled over to the side of the road, worried that it was Jessica. Fortunately, it was just Slammer. What's up? I asked. Word on the street is that Reaper knows you have Jessica. I sighed. How did he find out? Not sure. Sounds like he doesn't know your location though. So hang tight and if I hear anything, I'll call you right away. Someone's leaking information. You didn't tell anyone at the club, did you? Just Tank Raptor and his old lady. You trust her? Adriana. Yeah. She wouldn't say anything. I didn't think so either. We must have been spotted at the airport then. That might have been it. If that was the case, I'm surprised that they didn't try stopping us from getting on the plane, I replied, still wondering how Reaper learned about my incoming flight to Cedar Rapids to begin with. 
The only thing I could imagine was that my conversation with Brett had been somehow compromised. He hadn't known that I was hired to safeguard Jessica though. It wasn't usually my thing. Maybe they didn't have enough manpower at the time, said Slammer with a smile in his voice. To take down the judge. I grunted. Yeah. Maybe. So, have you seen anything suspicious at all where you're at? Actually, I've got a meeting with a lawyer in a few minutes. Someone named Caitlin Ferraro. Says she has information for me and knows my street name. Slammer took a drag of a cigarette and I could hear him blow out smoke. Shit. You have any idea what that's about? No. I will soon enough though. You taking Jessica with you? No, I've already left her at my place. Where is that? Can I ask? Somewhere safe. Don't worry about it. Slammer grunted. Franny keeps bugging me about it. I hate to say this but I'm looking forward to her going on this cruise, he said, lowering his voice. I'm already counting the hours. When is she leaving? Two days. For now, just tell her that it puts both of them at risk if she knows where Jessica is. I've been telling her that. She ignores me. I chuckled. I'll call you when I find out what's going on. I heard a woman's voice in the background, and then Franny got on the phone. You're sure Jessica is safe? She asked, her voice shrill. Yes. Don't worry. I won't let any harm come to your daughter. Okay. Protect my baby, Jordan. Please, she begged. Of course I will. Slammer got back on the phone. Sorry about that. She took the phone out of my hand before I knew what the hell was happening. I chuckled. Don't worry about it. So Jessica is safe and doing fine? Yep. How's Raptor and his family? I asked, changing the subject. Adriana and Sammy are out of town for a few days. Sent a couple of prospects with them for protection, just in case. Without Raptor. He stayed behind to watch their house. Seems to think they're going to try striking there next. Wants to catch them breaking in so he can break their faces. I sighed. I don't know, maybe we should just find Reaper ourselves and take him out. I'm already working on it. That dude is not an easy one to locate. He knows we're after him, obviously. So their entire chapter is on the run. No, he said, chuckling. In fact, he's already gone nomad. What? I asked, surprised. Rumor has it that Reaper's obsession with Jessica has pissed off some of the original Devil's Rangers. I heard they might have already taken his patch. That didn't take long. Nope. Let me know if you find out anything else. For sure. He sighed. Is there something else? I asked, sensing he had something else to get off of his chest. Nothing major, I just have some other shit that's come up. What is it? I got this chick looking for me. I laughed. You knock someone up? Hell no. This is something else. Apparently, this girl thinks that I'm responsible for her son being shot. My eyes widened. What do you mean? There was a drive-by shooting at some kegger last weekend here, in Jensen. Apparently, there were some Devil's Rangers there. Did you know about the party? No, and even if I did, I wouldn't have set something like that up. That's bullshit, he said angrily. I figured as much. So what about this kid that was shot? He let out a ragged sigh. He was only two years old. Died in the crossfire. So let me get this straight, the girl had her kid at a beer bash? I asked disgusted. No, apparently the babysitter was at the party with the kid. The mother, someone named Reina, had no idea at the time. She was working or something. Wonderful, I replied dryly. So the child is dead. Yeah, he replied in a somber voice. Poor kid. Who the hell brings a toddler to a goddamn party? Nobody with half a brain. How did you hear about this, anyway? 
from one of the prospects. He's friends with someone who knows Reina. From what I gathered, she thinks that I requested the drive-by. Now she wants to do something about it. What are you saying? That she wants to kill you? Apparently. Don't worry about this shit though. I can handle it. What are you going to do? Try and talk to her. I don't want people thinking that I set that shit up, he said crossly. Only pussies do hit and runs. Nobody in our club would be involved in something like that. I believed him. It was one of the reasons I worked with Slammer. He had some integrity. So the cops question you about it? Not yet. I'm sure they'll be sniffing around here soon though. Tank know about it? No. I told the prospect to keep his mouth shut too. Too much shit is going on now as it is. I'm going to keep this quiet until I get it sorted out. I understand. I looked at the phone on my clock. It was almost seven. It's getting late. I gotta go. The lawyer? Yeah. Good luck to you too. I thought about the woman with the flirty eyes and something told me it was her that wanted to get lucky. Thanks, I said before hanging up. I started the bike back up and was soon on my way to find out exactly what the deal was with Caitlin Ferraro. When I arrived at her office building, I parked my bike and went into the lobby. An alley-looking security guard named Pete Wallace greeted me. I'm here to see Caitlin Ferraro, I said, taking her card out of my wallet. Is she expecting you? He asked, picking up the phone. Yes. Can I get your name? Just tell her it's Jordan. He grunted. Hello, Mrs. Ferraro? Yeah, we have a gentleman here to see you. Pete looked me up and down. Yeah. That's him. Says his name is Jordan. Okay, I'll send him on up. He hung up the phone and nodded toward the elevators. You can go up. She's on the third floor. I thanked him and went up to Caitlin's floor. When I stepped out of the elevators, she was waiting for me in the hallway. I had to admit, she looked even more attractive than earlier, especially now that her hair was down and she'd taken off her blazer. To be honest, I wasn't sure if you were actually going to show, she said, smiling at me like the Cheshire Cat. Did you really think you could drop a bomb like that and not? You're not even going to pretend, are you? Pretend? I don't play games, Mrs. Ferraro. Smiling, she slid her hand through the crook of my arm and began pulling me toward a door with the name Ferraro and Ferraro scribed on it. We all play games. Just different kinds. Is that right? I asked as she opened the door. You of all people know that, Mr. Steele. I didn't reply. Wondering if she was wearing a wire, I decided not to give her anything that might be the slightest bit incriminating. There was no proof that Jordan Steele and my alias, the judge, were one and the same, and I certainly wasn't going to admit to it. She pulled me into the lobby of her offices, which was dark. Closed for the evening? I asked, looking around as we continued on our way down one of the hallways. Yes. I let everyone go early in hopes that you'd show up. You wanted to be alone with me. She smiled. You catch on quick, Mr. Steele. So you share your practice with your husband? I do. Does he know about this meeting? I asked as we entered her office. She shut the door behind us and turned around. No. He's far too busy at the moment to worry about where I am or what I'm doing. And what exactly is it that you are doing, Mrs. Ferraro? You'll find out soon enough. In the meantime, can I take that? She asked, staring at my black leather jacket. No. I won't be staying long. Plus, I had a gun hidden underneath. She didn't need to find that. Caitlin smirked. Please sit down, Mr. Steele, she said, motioning toward a leather sofa. Humoring her, I walked over and did what she asked. She walked over to her desk and pulled out a bottle of whiskey. Would you like a drink? I'm not much of a whiskey drinker. 
She pulled out another bottle and held it up. I have scotch too. It sounds better but I'm going to have to decline. Ignoring me, Caitlin pulled out two small glasses and filled them both up with scotch. Then she walked over, put both glasses on the coffee table, and sat down next to me. Just in case you change your mind, she said, nodding toward the glass. I smiled. Turning sideways, she put her elbow on the back of the sofa and leaned her head against her hand. I must say, you're one hell of an attractive man. I'm sure you get that a lot though. Come on now. You didn't invite me over to discuss my looks. But your looks have everything to do with it, she said, undressing me with her eyes. In fact, I haven't been able to stop thinking about you. In what way? I asked smirking. She reached over and touched my knee. When I see something I want, I become obsessed with it. Her hand began to slide up my thigh. It's all I can think about, and... I need to have it. I grabbed it before she reached my crotch. So this is about sex? She smiled. It's only part of it. Part of what? Part of the big picture. Enough of the mind games. Tell me what's going on and how you found out my name is Jordan Steele, I said firmly. Sighing she stood up and walked back to her desk. She pulled out a large, yellow envelope and brought it to me. What's this? I asked, opening it up. I pulled out a photograph and felt my stomach drop when I saw a picture that had been blown up. It was of me, Barney and Jessica, getting off of the plane at the airport. That's obviously the girl from the restaurant. And that's you. I recognize your facial features. Nice costume. I do prefer your real look, by the way. Why do you have this picture? Because Barney is my husband's uncle, and she smiled grimly, he was found murdered early this morning. Chapter 26 Reaper You find out where he took her yet? I asked Todd on the phone as we waited for our flight. No. The old man refused to give up any information. Tried everything, but he was a stubborn prick. After losing the judge the first time at the airport, Todd had located him again in Jensen at Slammer's place. Then he'd followed him back to Cedar Rapids, where he and Jessica had boarded a plane headed back to Anchorage, which is where Todd was now. He'd located the pilot, Barney Jameson, and had paid him an in-house visit to try and get an address for Jordan Steele. The man, my sources confirmed, who blew up Mudd's clubhouse and killed him. The judge. He must have had his number. Oh yeah. But you couldn't get him to make the call. I asked. Todd was supposed to lure the judge to Barney's place. No. No. That's not acceptable. Try harder. That old man is stubborn, I tell you. First, he claimed that he didn't know what I was talking about and had never heard of anyone named Jordan Steele. Obviously, the judge didn't give him his real name. I realized that and brought it up. Barney then claimed that he doesn't know anything about the man or woman he flew earlier. Just that they were cousins and the man's name was Jim. Put more pressure on him. Jesus, break his hand for all I care, just get him to make the call. There was a pause. Todd. I can't. The old man tried shooting me. He's gone. I clenched my jaw. You killed him? This didn't make me happy. Yeah. I didn't plan on it, he said defensively. I counted to ten and then released a ragged breath. Okay, nothing we can do now about it now. Tell me, what did you do with his body? Dropped him off in bear country, he said, a smile in his voice. It's all bear country up there. You sure nobody will find it? Eventually, they will. What's left of it after the wildlife gets a hold of his corpse? He was an old man, I said, still pissed that Todd screwed up. You're telling me that you really couldn't handle him? I didn't know he had a gun. It was him or me, he said tightly. Shit. This shit really doesn't make me happy. Do you have any idea how big Anchorage is? We needed Barney. It's not all bad. I have his phone. Jordan's number is in there, under the name Jim Blake. We'll get him. 
unless he screwed that up too. Just don't do anything else until I get there. And for shit's sake if he calls don't answer it. I won't. One more thing, he'll obviously recognize you if he sees you, so keep a low profile. I'll call you when we get to Anchorage. Okay. I stared down at my bicep and made a fist. I want him and I want the girl. I need to see them both suffer. You will. Chapter 27 Jordan What do you mean he was found murdered? I asked, feeling sick to my stomach. Some hikers found his body in the middle of the woods, north of Sand Lake. He was shot in the chest. Sand Lake. That was too close for comfort. I rubbed my forehead. Do they know who did it? Right now you're the number one suspect. Apparently, he flew in from Iowa with you and your friend. Yes. We flew with him, I admitted. Lying about that was useless, and if she wanted me in jail, she'd have already given the information to the police. I had a sinking feeling that it was Reaper's crew. If that was the case, Jessica was in danger, and I needed to get back to the cabin. Her eyes burned into mine. Did you kill him? No, I said firmly. He was fine and heading home when I last saw him. Barney and I were friends. I would have never hurt him. Her shoulders relaxed. That's what I thought. Someone did though. I think it was someone looking for the judge. Who is this judge you keep talking about? I asked. So, you're going to deny it? Deny what? That you're him, she asked, smirking. I've never even heard of the guy. She stared at me for a few seconds, her eyes calculating. The girl in the picture is the stepdaughter to the president of the Gold Vipers, a motorcycle club in Jensen. A man they call Slammer. Obviously, you know of him. Yes. My husband has friends in high places, and they were able to identify her from the picture. I know all about the rape, and how her attacker was found murdered three years ago. And? Rumor has it that the infamous judge not only killed her attacker, but is now Jessica Winta's bodyguard. I don't know anything about the guy you're referring to. The truth is, Jessica and I are friends, and she wanted to get away from Iowa for a while. That's why she's in Anchorage. Caitlin smirked. Right. Believe what you want. I will. I find all of this extremely hot by the way, she said, touching my arm. Knowing who and what you are. What you're capable of. You've got it all wrong, sweetheart, I smiled coolly. I'm not the guy you think I am. Still playing it cool, huh? I understand why you're not admitting to it, and that's fine. I actually expected it. I'm not out to get you. I want to help your friend. Why and how do you want to help Jessica? As for why, let's just say that I have compassion for rape victims like her. As far as how goes, I believe that I've already helped. By giving you this information. So, you think that Barney's murder has something to do with Jessica? I believe that she's being stalked by someone out to hurt her stepdad's club, and maybe even the judge. I stood up. If her life is in danger, I need to get my ass moving and make sure she's safe. So what do you want from me? She smiled at me flirtatiously. I think you already know. Chapter 28 Jessica While I was paging through the book I brought with me, I suddenly felt the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. I looked up and over toward the neighbor's cabin, and my heart stopped. There was a bear. Oh my god, I gasped, standing up quickly. The bear was brown and very large. Definitely a grizzly. Fortunately, it was headed away from the cabin and toward the woods. With my heart beating rapidly, I watched as it disappeared from sight and then I hurried back up the dock to the safety of the cabin. When I got inside, I shut the door and locked it, grateful the bear hadn't noticed me. I wasn't sure if it would have attacked me or even wandered onto the dock, but just seeing it had frightened the living daylights out of me. Still anxious about the animal, I hurried over to the phone to call Jordan, but then stopped myself. We were in Alaska. 
There were bears everywhere, from what I'd read. He probably saw them all the time. In the end, I decided not to interrupt his meeting with the lawyer, especially to whine about a bear that had disappeared already. Going back to the great room, I turned the television on, to try and get my mind off the bear. As I was flipping through the channels, I saw that there was some breaking news flashing across the screen. When I noticed the picture of our pilot, I gasped in horror. Two hikers stumbled upon the body of 68-year-old Barney Jameson's body early this morning, said the female reporter, who was standing on a trail near some woods. Officials say he died from a single gunshot wound to the chest, although there are no witnesses or suspects in custody at the moment. I listened to the rest of the report in shock, and when they flashed Barney's photo across the screen again, tears filled my eyes. He'd been such a sweet man. I couldn't understand how anyone could kill him. Wanting to share the news with Jordan, I grabbed the phone and dialed his cell number, which he'd left for me before leaving. He answered on the fourth ring. What's up, he asked, his voice funny. I didn't know exactly how to tell him, so I just blurted it out. Jordan, I was watching the news and they said that Barney was murdered. I heard. I was just about to call you about it myself. Do you know how to use a gun? Yes. Why? I asked, getting scared. Listen carefully. I want you to lock all the doors and then go to my basement. There's a gun safe down there. He lowered his voice and gave me the combination. There are several guns to choose from and ammunition. Load one and keep it close. I'll be home soon. My hand gripped the phone tightly. Am I in danger? I don't know, but I'm not taking any chances. Does Barney's death have to do with us? A woman said something in the background, and then giggled. I recognized the husky voice of the attorney, and I was suddenly pissed off. Whatever their meeting was about, it didn't sound too much like business to me. Jordan? I said stiffly. Is it Reaper? I don't know. I'll be home soon, he said, and then hung up. Gritting my teeth, I put the phone on the receiver and marched down to his basement, my fingers itchy to shoot something. Chapter 29 Jordan I hung up with Jessica and turned back to Caitlin, who was now holding some kind of black whip. I wasn't even sure where she'd gotten it. I stared at her in amusement as she began snapping it. Okay, what's that for? She smiled darkly. I want you to use it on me. Sorry Caitlin but I really have to go, I said, chuckling. This shit was getting weirder by the moment. Before Jessica had called, she tried sucking on my fingers. No. You owe me, she said, her eyes gleaming with excitement. Caitlin. It's time to pay up. She lifted her shirt over her head and tossed it away. She was indeed a gorgeous woman. A very dangerous and gorgeous woman. I'm flattered. Really, but I have to go. Can I just see it? She whispered, her hands now inside of my jacket. See what? Her eyes traveled down to my crotch, which was starting to respond. Shit, I really needed to get out of there. There was definitely no time for this. Not when Jessica's life was on the line. I have to get going. I began walking toward the door. Hey Jordan. I turned around to find her standing there, her slacks down and her hand in her panties. Alrighty then, I said, turning away. I had to admit, I was both flattered and repelled by the nymphomaniac. I knew one thing, I wouldn't be returning. Some may have considered me dangerous, but this woman actually scared the hell out of me. Chapter 30 Jessica. After searching through Jordan's gun case, I found one that I knew I could handle, a 357 revolver. I loaded it and then went back upstairs, where I stared anxiously out the window, waiting for Jordan to return. When he finally arrived, it was almost 40 minutes after our phone conversation. I wanted to ask him what had taken so long, but he looked so grumpy when he walked through the doorway, I decided to leave it be. You're back, I said, forcing a smile. Yeah. Sorry it took so long. 
He looked down at the Smith & Wesson that was still in my hand. You doing okay? I laid the gun down on the counter and wiped my sweaty hands on my jeans. I'm fine. Scared, obviously. Nodding, he set his bike helmet down onto the end table and ran a hand through his hair. Don't let Barney's death worry you. I've had some time to think about it, and the truth is, this might not even be related to Reaper. I had a feeling he was just saying it to calm me down. Barney's death was just too much of a coincidence. You don't really believe that? I asked him. Why shouldn't I, he countered with a straight face. Come on, seriously? Who else would kill such a sweet old man? Maybe he wasn't as sweet as we thought he was. I suppose that was possible. He could have had some of his own dirty little secrets. How well did you know him? He sat down on the sofa and stared toward the fireplace. Not as much as I should have, apparently. One thing I did know was that he was a good pilot and there for me whenever I needed him. I just wish I would have accepted some of his invitations for dinner with his wife. Maybe I could have gotten to know him better. Maybe I could have even stopped whoever killed him. Whether it was related to Reaper or not. Maybe. Maybe not. Don't go blaming yourself, I said, noticing the regret in his eyes. He sighed but didn't say anything more. So, what are we going to do? I asked after a few minutes of silence. Jordan stood up. We're leaving the cabin. Until I find out what's going on and if it really is related to Reaper. Damn. I was hoping you wouldn't say that. I replied smiling sadly. I was really beginning to like it here. He seemed surprised. You were? I looked out the window toward the lake. It looked so peaceful and serene. Yes. This place is definitely a breath of fresh air. If it wasn't for the grizzly bears, I'd even consider moving up here myself. I wouldn't worry too much about them. They don't venture too close to the cabins normally. Unless you leave garbage out. I told him about the bear I'd seen earlier. Really? He walked over and stood next to me. I guess I'll have to keep a better lookout when I'm doing yard work. I laughed. Yeah, you probably should. His eyes softened. Still, it's beautiful though, isn't it? It sure is. As I was saying before, it's a shame we have to leave already. Hopefully, it will only be for a couple of days. I hope that's the case. Where will we go? You'll know soon enough. Are we staying in Alaska? You'll find out when we get there. My eyes widened. Not this again. You're really not going to tell me? He was silent. Jesus, I thought we were past this cloak and dagger crap. We're not past anything, he replied evenly. Look, this is how I operate and if you want to stay alive, you need to listen and follow my orders without asking so many questions. Orders? I repeated. Sometimes he was so nice and then there was this side of him, the one making my blood boil. What are you, a drill sergeant? No, but I'm the guy being paid to keep you alive, and in order to do that. I need you to cooperate without hassling me. I wasn't hassling you, I said, gritting my teeth. And I don't know what the big deal is. He sighed and pointed toward the guest room. Please just go and pack your stuff. We don't have time to argue about this. Fine, I replied coolly before disappearing down the hallway. When I walked back into the guest room, I quickly packed the few belongings that I had, mumbling to myself, and then made my way back into the living room. All packed? Yes, I said stiffly. Hey, he put his hand on my shoulder. I'm just trying to do my job here. Okay? I pulled away. Yeah, fine. Frowning, he picked up the Smith & Wesson. Here. You don't want to forget this. I stared at him in surprise. You want me to carry it? If Reaper is in town, I want to make sure you're armed. In fact, I'm going to go and get you an ankle holster. I have an extra one downstairs. 
Okay, I replied. If you think I'm really going to need it. Let's just hope to hell that you won't, he said, disappearing down the hallway toward the stairs. Looking at the gun again, I suddenly felt an overwhelming sense of doom. As much as Jordan had been trying to make me think that Barney's death might have been something else, his actions showed that he believed otherwise. Here it is, said Jordan, walking back into the room with the holster and two large duffel bags a few moments later. He set the bags down and then kneeled next to me. Pull up your jeans. I lifted the right leg up and he fastened the holster around my calf and ankle. Then he strapped the gun in and tugged my jeans over it. It's a little tight, but you should be able to get to it fairly quickly if you need to. Thanks, I said as he stood back up. No problem. How did you find out about Barney anyway? The lawyer from the restaurant told me about it. Is that why you met with her? I asked surprised. To be honest, I had no idea what the meeting was going to be about until I showed up. I just knew that it was important. Did she think you had something to do with his death? He walked over to the phone in the kitchen and picked it up. Yes and no. She apparently figured out my true identity and wanted to confront me about it. She knew that you were a mercenary? He nodded. And yet she set up that meeting to confront you. That was a bold move. And stupid, I thought. Tell me about it, he said, smirking. I frowned. Does she know who I am? Unfortunately, yes. The security cameras got a picture of us at the airport with Barney. She recognized you at the restaurant. It's how she put two and two together. I don't get it. How was she involved in this case? He put the phone back down on the receiver. Barney is her husband's uncle. I stared at him in horror. Oh my God. Is she going to go to the cops? No. She's trying to blackmail me. So, she knows your true identity, believes you're involved in Barney's death, and is trying to blackmail you? Yes. I sucked in a breath. Oh shit. Ah, uh, so did you kill her? Jordan rolled his eyes. No, I didn't kill her. Believe it or not, I just don't go around murdering people, Jessica. Sorry. I'm just frazzled with everything going on. This thing just seems to be really getting out of hand. I would have to agree. So what happened then? Did you agree to give her what she wanted? Kind of. What does that mean? She made her demands, and I didn't really give her a straight answer. Well, are you going to give her what she wants? A look of amusement spread across his face. No. It's too dangerous. I wondered what he meant by that. Did she have a job for him? What's going to happen when she figures out that you're not going to give in to her demands? Nothing you're going to need to worry about. I frowned. What exactly did she want from you? Can I ask? It's something I'd rather not discuss. I stared at him in disbelief. What? Why not? I mean, think I should know since we're in this mess together. He sighed. Fine, if you really need to know. She wanted me. I stared at him in surprise. What do you mean? She wanted you to kill someone? No. She wanted me to have sex with her. My jaw dropped. You can't be serious? She has so much on you and she just wants that? He looked annoyed at my reaction. Oh, I am. Um, I didn't mean that the way it came out, I said quickly. I mean you're very good looking and sexy. I laughed nervously. What woman wouldn't want that? His lip twitched. I felt my face turn three shades of red as I realized that came out all wrong as well. It sounded like I was also hot for him. I mean most women would want to. Women who weren't afraid to have sex, I stammered. His eyes burned into mine. Does the thought of having sex frighten you that much? That's not any of your business, I said, shocked that he was asking. You're right. I'm sorry. 
I shouldn't have asked, he replied, looking embarrassed. Feeling foolish for snapping at him, I relaxed. It's okay. I'm sorry for biting your head off. I just don't like to talk about it. Especially with you. Understandable. He nodded toward the doorway. I suppose we should leave. Grab your stuff. Okay, I replied, hating the tension that had returned between us. Jordan picked up the two duffel bags and headed toward the door. Are we taking your motorcycle again? I asked, wondering how we were going to fit that amount of luggage onto the bike. No, he said as we stepped onto the porch. Where is your Harley, anyway? I asked as he locked the front door. The motorcycle was nowhere to be seen. I locked it in the shed, he replied, heading toward the dock. Come on. Are we taking your boat? I asked, surprised. He looked back at me and smiled. You got a problem with that? No. Not at all, I said, following him toward the lake. I just wasn't expecting that. Once we reached the boathouse, he unlocked the side door and I followed him in. It was dark and musty but relatively free of cobwebs. Jordan set the duffel bags down and began readying the boat, which appeared to be a 19-foot blue and white bayliner. Have you ever taken it out? I asked, helping him unsnap the cover. A few times. It's really nice. It looks new, I remarked. It was clear that Jordan was meticulous when it came to caring for his belongings. It's only two years old. Wait until you hear the stereo on this thing. It must be a lot of fun. I love boating. Always have. He smiled. Yeah, me too. Moments later, we were flying across the lake, listening to some song by Tool, and I couldn't help but smile, even with everything going on. Is it as fun as you thought it would be, he called out, smiling at me with his sunglasses on. He'd removed his shirt, giving me a nice view of his chest and arms. Even better. Between the wind in our hair, the loud music, and the hot man driving the boat, I was definitely in La La Land. His grin widened as he turned up the music. After cruising around the lake for about 40 minutes, I began to wonder if he knew where we were going. When I asked him about it, he didn't respond. This time, instead of getting angry, I focused on enjoying the boat ride. Ten minutes later, however, I found that we were back by his side of the lake. Are we going back? I asked in shock as we began to slow. Not quite. I was very confused when we pulled up to a dock that was only a few hundred yards from Jordan's. What are we doing here? I asked, bewildered. You'll see, he said as he maneuvered the boat up to the dock. I watched as he cut the engine, and then jumped out of the boat to tie it down. When he was finished, he grabbed the duffel bags and then held out his hand to me. I frowned. Come on, he said. Grab my hand. I did what he asked, and soon both of us were standing on the dock. I turned back to look over at Jordan's cabin, wondering what the hell he was up to. Let's go, he said, walking toward shore. I followed him across the dock and up the hill to the cabin, which was similar to Jordan's but not nearly as nice. We climbed the steps to the porch, and Jordan pulled out a set of keys from his pocket. He unlocked the door. Why do you have a set of keys for this place? I asked, confused. Are you friends with the owner? He turned around and smiled. I am the owner. Chapter 31 Jordan her eyes widened. What? I own this place too. Why? I purchased it as an investment last winter, after it went into foreclosure. I was planning on renting it out, but just haven't had time to list it. Guess that was a good thing, she remarked. A very good thing. Why do you think we're any safer in this place, she asked, crossing her arms under her chest. Because if someone were to dig around, they'd find Samuel's name listed as the owner for the other cabin. Reaper could connect the dots, obviously. This one has the name of Annabelle Gertrude Hunter. She laughed. Really? Where did you come up with that name? It's another alias. 
one that I paid a lot of money to acquire. It's amazing the things that you can do when you know the right people. Apparently, she said, looking impressed. I don't understand, why didn't we just walk over? To be honest, I was going to take us to another spot farther north to camp for a couple of days, but then I changed my mind. The relief on her face was almost comical. Thank God. Not that I don't like camping. I'm just deathly afraid of bears. There are wolves and other predators out there too. Good grief. I smiled. Yeah, I think I made the right choice for both of us. Definitely. I just want you to know that the reason I didn't tell you exactly where we were going earlier was that I didn't want to risk anything. For all I know, the place could have been bugged while we were gone earlier. Her eyes widened. Do you think someone could have done that? I don't know. But I didn't want to take any chances. That was smart. And here I thought you were just being an asshole. I winked. Oh, I'm still an asshole. Just a very cautious one. She smirked. Okay, asshole, what are we going to do now? Just hang out here and wait for something to happen across the way. I chuckled. I am. I opened one of the duffel bags and pulled out my M16 and the night vision goggles. While you kick back and relax for a while. I fired up the generator in the basement but told her to keep the lights out, even when it grew dark. You shouldn't need them anyway. The sun doesn't set until after 11 this time of year. You should be fine without them. Can we build a fire? She asked. No, but you can light a candle if you need to. I don't want to draw attention to this cabin. Won't it get cold? The temperatures only get down to the 50s at night. You'll be fine, I repeated, heading toward the door. There are plenty of blankets in the linen closet if you need them. Where are you going? She asked, looking anxious. To the boathouse. I can see the other cabin much better from there. Plus, I want to hurry up and put the bayliner away. Make it look like nobody is here. Do you think someone will actually show up tonight? Not sure, but if he does, it will be when it's dark. What am I supposed to do while you're down there? There are some books in the back bedroom if you need something to do. Just don't leave the cabin. Her face suddenly grew paler. What about your phone? If they get into the other cabin and look at the call log, they'll notice that someone dialed a cell phone number from it. They could trace it, right? It's already taken care of. I erased the history and dumped the cell phone into the lake before we left, I said, and held up a different one. I'm only using this one now. As a precaution. Wow, you really are thorough. I haven't stayed alive because of my good looks, I said, smiling. I'll check back in a couple of hours. Stay inside. Okay. Chapter 32 Jessica Jordan ended up staying away for more than a couple of hours. Even worse, when the sun began to set, my mind started playing tricks on me. Every noise in and around the cabin seemed to startle me, and every shadow creeped me out. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I didn't want to be alone. Grabbing the gun, I snuck out of the cabin and ran to the two-story boathouse. I walked up the stairs to the second level and knocked softly. The door opened and there he was, standing there with his night vision glasses on. I chuckled. You look like some kind of alien. He pulled me inside. I thought I told you to stay put, he said gruffly, removing the glasses. Relax, will you? I was just worried about you, I lied. As you can see, I'm fine. You should have stayed in the cabin. Sorry. I just thought I heard something and wanted to make sure that you were okay. Wow, this is really nice, I said, looking around. It reminded me of my mother's three-season porch, only far less cramped. In fact, the only piece of furniture was an oversized brown suede sectional that faced the lake. Is this yours? I asked, thinking that it looked very inviting. The sectional? Yeah. I wanted it for the main cabin, but it was too large. So I had it brought out here. 
The moon was shining through the large apex window, and as I drew closer, the view of the lake was breathtaking. I sat down on the sectional and sighed. I could definitely live with this. I know. It's one of the reasons I bought the place. You get a clear shot of most of the cabins and the mountains from this angle, he said, now standing next to the window. And this soft, cushy sofa makes it even better. I laid my head back and closed my eyes. That does it. I'm sleeping here tonight. He yawned. Go ahead, if you want. Sounds like you could use some sleep, I said, noticing the weariness in his voice. I'm okay, he said, yawning again. I opened my eyes and looked at him. There were shadows under his eyes. Jordan, why don't you take a nap and let me keep watch for a while? No, I can handle it. I got up and walked over to him. Nothing is happening right now. Get some sleep so you're alert when you really need to be. He frowned. Don't be so stubborn. Let me watch the other cabin for movement. If I see anything unusual, I'll wake you up right away. Sighing, he handed me the night vision goggles. Okay. Just for a couple of hours, though. Sure. What time is it now? I asked, walking over to the window. 11.45. Okay. I sat down on the edge of the sectional, put the goggles on, and stared outside. Wow, these are neat. Jordan crawled onto the sofa and closed his eyes. Turn them on. They're even cooler. I laughed. Oh yeah? I guess they are. He smiled. As Jordan slept I watched the other cabin, anxious for something to happen, but hoping that it wouldn't. After about an hour, he began making noises in his sleep. Curious, I glanced over at him, thinking that he was even more handsome when he slept. With his long eyelashes and sensual lips, I could understand why the lawyer would want him. Thinking about her putting her hands on him though, made my stomach clench. The little bitch. I knew I had no right being jealous, but it was pretty obvious that I already had a serious crush on Jordan Steele. For the past few hours all I'd been thinking about was him. Not only did he make me laugh, but the man made my pulse race and things tingle in places that hadn't in a very long time. I'd even started wondering what it would be like, having sex with him. Something in his eyes told me that he could be wild and passionate, but also gentle and patient if needed. Biting my lower lip, I really took a good look at him. He was damn sexy that was for sure. Jordan suddenly groaned in his sleep and my jaw dropped. From the way he was moving, he was either making love to someone or doing crunches in his sleep. Oh my god, was he having sex with that lawyer in his dreams? Convinced that he was, I gritted my teeth, but continued watching him, unable to tear my eyes away. But then, I began to imagine him having an orgasm, and decided that I needed to save us both that embarrassment. I removed the goggles, and crept over to where he was sleeping. Jordan, I whispered, shaking his arm. He murmured my name and moaned. I froze, the air in the room feeling as if it had been sucked out. Soon, Jordan began saying other things, erasing any doubt in my mind about who it was that he was making love to in his dream. My cheeks burning red, I finally found my voice. Jordan? Jessica. His hands reached clumsily for me and the next thing I knew, I was lying on top of him. Oh my god. You're so beautiful. Whether he was dreaming or not, the crazy thing was that I didn't want to get off of him. In fact, I wanted to be there so badly that I relaxed against him. Jess. Jordan, I whispered, grabbing his hand. I placed it against my cheek and closed my eyes. There were so many emotions going through me that I felt tears under my lashes. One thing I knew for certain was that for the first time in a very long while I felt desire for a man, and wasn't frightened. Jordan was my protector. He was risking his life to keep me safe. I trusted him at that moment, with everything I had. Everything. Jordan suddenly stopped all movement, and then his entire body stiffened up. Realizing that he was now awake, I opened my eyes and looked into his. Hi. He removed his hands from me. 
What are you doing? He whispered in a strained voice. I'm sorry, I said, jumping off of him. My cheeks burned in shame. I tried waking you up and then you pulled me down. Looking horrified, he closed his eyes and rubbed his forehead. Jesus. I'm the one who should be saying sorry. I laughed nervously. It's okay. Really? He opened his eyes and sat up. Did I say anything to you? No, I lied. He looked angry with himself. So, I basically pulled you down and began molesting you in my sleep? It's okay. And you didn't molest me. No, it's not okay, he said sharply. He stood up. This is why I work alone, and I don't do security, especially for a woman that I... His voice trailed off. That you what? Need to keep my distance from, he said, avoiding my eyes as he reached for a bottle of water that was on the ground. Why? He laughed coldly. Isn't it obvious? Look at what just happened. I practically raped you in my sleep. I laughed harshly. No. That wasn't rape. Believe me, I know what that is. Well, whatever that was, it can't happen again. From now on, I think you should just stay as far away from me as possible, he said, before taking a long drink of water. But I don't understand. Why? Jessica, why do you have to ask so many damn questions? Because I deserve to know the answers, I said, frowning. Fine. You want to know why? Because you're too much of a temptation, that's why. I'm a temptation? I repeated, staring at him in surprise. No. I meant a distraction, he said angrily. I can't concentrate on anything when you're around. You and all your damn questions. You're driving me nuts. Oh, and you're so easy to be around? I snapped back. He ran a hand through his hair and began to pace. Oh hell, I should have never agreed to this job. Then maybe you should just take me to the airport and ship me back to Iowa. I said loudly. And then you can be alone and happy. Just the way you like it. He stopped. Maybe I should. I don't need this shit, he said glaring at me. You're a goddamn pain in the ass, you know that. Is that right? I raised my chin defiantly. Tell you what, judge, why don't you take your holier-than-thou gavel and go EF yourself with it? Jordan's eye twitched. I went on. By the way, that's not a question, it's a suggestion. One I highly recommend. He smiled coldly. Guess what, princess, this time I have a question that needs an answer. Bring it on, I sneered, unlike you, I'm not afraid of giving one. Jordan grabbed me around the waist and pulled me into his arms. His lips crashed against mine, kissing me hard with an explosion of pent-up lust. Moaning, I opened up to him, enjoying the way his demanding tongue made love to my mouth. Just as my legs turned to jelly, he tore his lips free and we stared at each other, panting. This has to stop, he said, his eyes burning into mine. I can't allow it. You are not going to stop kissing me now, I said, pulling him back to my lips. He groaned in the back of his throat and then began kissing me again. I arched my back, desperate for more. Suddenly, he lifted me up and into his arms, carrying me over to the sectional. Then he sat down with me on his lap, facing him. We can stop. If you want, he said, although his eyes burned with frustrated need. In answer, I leaned down and began kissing him again. I wasn't sure what was happening between us, but I didn't want to stop it. Not yet, anyway. Jordan slid one hand into my hair and caressed my shoulder blade with the other. I slid my hands along his chest, reveling in the hard planes of his muscles. Wanting to get closer, I pulled his t-shirt out from his jeans and slid my hands under it, running the palms of my hands along his smooth, warm skin. He suddenly pulled away from my lips. Tell me if anything gets to be too much. Okay. I mean it, he whispered, kissing my neck. My hands clutched his head as he lips trailed down my throat, he slid his hand up my stomach until his fingertips stopped. It's okay. Touch me, I whispered. 
He stared at me silently and I could see that he was still so conflicted. I, however, needed this. I needed him. My eyes burned into his. I placed his hand on my chest. Please. Jordan's lips came crashing against mine and passion overcame the both of us. Soon he was making love to me gently, making me feel things that I'd never thought possible. At one point I cried out his name and told him I loved him in a moment of ecstasy. He moved away from me just as I realized what I'd said. I opened my eyes and noticed that he was putting his shirt back on. I didn't mean that, I said, laughing nervously. I just loved how you made me feel. And how was that, he said, not looking at me. I stared at him in disbelief. Do you really have to ask? He shrugged. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Then why do you look so pissed off? Because this should have never happened, he answered sharply. I'm being paid to protect you and I just got done. He ran a hand through his hair. Jesus, what in the hell is wrong with me? Well, I didn't think it was wrong, I said with tears in my eyes. And I don't appreciate the fact that you just took something that I thought was fantastic and called it a mistake. But it was a mistake, he argued. Look, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. I really am, but it shouldn't have happened. Why? Because I accidentally said that I loved you? I answered, grabbing my clothes. Or is it just that I disgust you sexually? What? No, he snapped his eyes wide. Is that what you really think? I began to get dressed. I don't know what to think anymore. He was about to say something when a light from outside caught both of our attention. Oh my god, what was that? I whispered. Someone's over at the other cabin with a flashlight, he said, rushing to the window. He grabbed his night goggles and put them on. I joined him. Can you see anything? He was silent for a few seconds and then smirked. Yeah. I see something. Three men just stepped onto my damn porch. They're definitely wearing cuts. My breath caught in my throat. What are we going to do? You're doing nothing, he said. I'm going over there and putting an end to this. You're going to kill them? He didn't reply. Jordan? Jessica, you're better off not knowing. I wrapped my arms around myself, frightened of what was going to happen. I knew he was supposed to be good at what he did, but I was suddenly afraid of losing him to those assholes. Maybe we should wait it out and then just let them leave. He shook his head. No way. First of all, they're on my property and that really pisses me off. Secondly, these guys are going to hunt us down until we're dead, Jess. It's either them or us. I knew he was right, which scared me even more. He went over to the duffel bag and pulled out two handguns, then holstered them to his body. Then he grabbed the M16. You stay here and keep the door locked. If anyone but me comes through it, shoot to kill. Right, I mumbled. I'm serious. I nodded. Yeah. I know. He stared at me for a second, and then his eyes softened. I'm sorry. For what? For everything. For being an asshole. For being me. Truth is. I don't know what to do with a girl like you, he said, smiling grimly. You seem to know what you were doing a few minutes ago. He walked over and pulled me into his arms. For the record, he said into my hair, you could never disgust me. Ever. I've never wanted a woman as badly as I've wanted you. It's just that we can't. Even if I want you to. He didn't reply as he released me. I'll be back. Hang tight and keep this door locked. Jordan, I said, still frightened of losing him. I took a deep breath and told him how I felt. I needed to. I meant what I said. You might think it's wrong, but... I think I've really fallen in love with you. His eyes narrowed. You hardly know me. I know. I laughed nervously. Look, I just wanted you to know in case this turns out really, really bad, I said, nodding toward the window. 
Sighing, he turned around and walked out the door. Chapter 33 Jordan I knew the moment I heard her confession that I couldn't afford to leave Reaper alive anymore. He needed to go, and I needed to return her back to Iowa. I didn't know if she really loved me or not, but if she did, I had to get out of her life. I crept down the stairs and headed toward the other cabin, noticing that our visitors had entered inside. Although I expected the invasion, knowing that they were in my home pissed the hell out of me. If it wasn't for the fact that I wanted to leave the place to Sammy someday, I would have burnt it to the ground with them in it. When I reached the other property, I hid behind some trees and scanned the perimeter for other bikers. I found one trying to get into the shed, and I gritted my teeth when I saw him break the lock. I raised the M16 but then changed my mind. Even with the suppressor, it would still catch the other's attention. Instead I snuck around the house and caught the intruder by surprise. Sure enough, he was wearing a Devil's Rangers patch. Find anything? I asked standing behind him. Surprisingly, he didn't even question my voice. Found a Harley he isn't going to be needing this anymore, replied the heavyset man, chuckling. My eye twitched as he leaned forward toward my bike. Before he could touch it, I grabbed him by the neck and snapped it. Dover. You in there? Hollered a voice, moving toward the shed. Trapped, I raised the gun and shot him in the chest when he saw me. He fell backward before he knew what hit him. Knowing that the others would have heard the gunshot, I raced away from the shed to the back of the cabin. I heard a shot, said a voice stepping out of the doorway. Dover. J.D. Recognizing Todd's voice, I crept around the side of the house. As I inched my way closer, the wood underneath me creaked. Shit. Todd stepped around the corner. We meet again, I whispered, aiming the M16 at his head. How unfortunate for you. He raised his hands in the air but played it cool. You're not going to shoot me. Really? I let you live once before. That was a one-time gift, Todd. He smiled. Is that right? I noticed that he was looking over my shoulder. I quickly fired the gun at Todd, and then leapt over the porch railing as a bullet grazed my shoulder. I hit him. Hollered a deep voice as I ran for cover behind a tree. I think he's down. From my hiding spot, I watched the cabin door open and two men stepped out. One stood about my height, and the other towered over him. Who'd you hit? The judge, asked the big guy, throwing a cigarette butt out onto the grass. Frowning because he'd been smoking in my cabin, I raised the gun, hoping it was Reaper's life that I was about to put an end to. Put your gun down, growled a voice behind me. I hesitated. Get your hands in the air and put your goddamn gun down, he ordered. Sighing, I dropped it and raised my arms. I got him, he hollered toward the others. Bring him here, called the big guy. You heard him. Let's go. Fine, I said, looking over my shoulder. When I noticed what was behind us, I couldn't believe my luck. Better watch out for that bear. He laughed. I'm not falling for that. You know we're in Alaska, right moron? The grizzly made a snorting noise, and the man holding the gun at my back, looked over his shoulder. Jesus, it's a bear, he hollered, swinging his weapon around. Before he could shoot the bear, I kicked him in the lower back, and he flew forward, landing on his knees in front of the grizzly. Startled, the bear raised himself onto his hind legs and moved toward him. I hurried away through the bushes as a gun went off. It was followed by blood-curdling scream. Hold it right there, said a familiar voice stopping me in my tracks. I turned around to find Brett holding a gun to my face. Chapter 34 Jessica I paced the boathouse until I heard the gunshots. Terrified, I ran over to the window to try and see what was happening, but it was too dark. Then I heard another blast, and then a third. Something is wrong. I could feel it in the pit of my stomach. Jordan was outnumbered. He needed my help. I saw the front door of the other cabin open, and two figures walk out. One of the men was so large that I knew it could only be Reaper. 
I rushed to the door and opened it up to see if I could hear what exactly was happening. Jesus, it's a bear, hollered a man's voice in the distance. I sucked in my breath as another shot was fired. Then there was a loud horrific roar, followed by a man screaming. Oh my God, was that Jordan? With my heart pounding in my chest, I grabbed my gun and snuck down the stairs, knowing that I was disobeying Jordan's orders, but convinced that he needed my help. Fortunately, the cabins were surrounded by plenty of trees, so I was able to sneak over to Jordan's main cabin unnoticed. As I crept closer, I could hear the voices. So, this is the great and powerful judge, sneered Reaper, walking around Jordan, who was being held at gunpoint by Stryker. Jordan didn't reply. Where's the bitch? asked Reaper. Still, he held his tongue. You'd better answer if you know what's good for you, said Stryker. Jordan's lips curled into an angry scowl. Screw off, Brett. You're nothing but a backstabbing asshole. Brett. Wasn't that Jordan's government friend? Don't take this personally, said Stryker. Reaper and I have a much more significant past than you and I, fact is, I owe him a lot more than I owe you. I saved your life, snapped Jordan. I know. I've given you enough information over the years to pay that back. Saved your ass a number of times too. I guess the real question is, who's going to save yours tonight? Not this big gorilla, sneered Jordan, smiling coldly. Reaper raised his fists and smashed Jordan in the face. Not once but three times. Horrified, I covered my mouth to keep from screaming. You done being a smartass? asked Stryker when Reaper stepped back. Because it's not helping your situation. Jordan spit out a wad of blood. So. It makes me feel better. Damn it, enough with the bullshit. Tell us where that bitch is, demanded Reaper. Jordan grinned coldly. I think you're the bitch. You certainly hit like one. Reaper's face turned red. He grabbed Jordan's shirt and this time head-butted him. Jordan fell backward and then slowly got up. I'm not going to ask you again, growled Reaper. Where is Jessica Winters? If you don't tell me, I'm going cut off each of your fingers and shove them down your throat. Why don't you start with this one, said Jordan, raising his middle. I stifled a giggle. There was blood running down his nose, and he was weaving back and forth, but his sense of humor was still intact. Reaper swung at him again, his knuckles connected with Jordan's jaw and I gasped as this time he dropped to the ground and remained motionless. Reaper's head whipped around, and I saw him staring in my direction. Did you hear that? Over there, he said to Stryker. You over there, darlin'? Called Stryker, walking toward me a sinister smile on his face. Come out and play with us. Come on now. Don't be shy. Frozen in place, I glanced again at Jordan. He wasn't moving and I didn't know what to do. I was so terrified. Go and get her, ordered Reaper, turning his back on Jordan. As soon as he did, Jordan's hand snaked out and it was then that I saw the knife. He slashed it across the back of Reaper's ankle tendon, through his jeans, and the man roared in pain. Stryker turned back around to see what was happening. What the hell? He cut me. Growled Reaper, who'd stumbled to the ground several feet from Jordan. He pulled out a gun and aimed it at him. You're dead, asshole. No. I screamed, racing through the trees toward them with my own gun now pointed at Reaper. Drop your damn gun. Reaper looked at Stryker. Get her. You drop the gun, Jessica, said Stryker, his gun trained on me. Now. God damn it, mumbled Jordan, staring at me through two swollen eyes. Don't you ever listen. There was a growl from the woods, and we all turned to stare at the angry grizzly now stumbling toward Reaper and Jordan. Jesus Christ, yelled Reaper, struggling to get to his feet. Stryker, shoot that damn thing. Jordan. Run. I hollered. He also appeared to be transfixed on the bear. Jordan came to life. He got to his feet and raced toward me as Stryker's gun went off. I thought I told you to stay in the boathouse, he snapped, as we began to run away from the others. I thought you needed my help. Stop and give me your gun, he said suddenly. I gave it to him. 
Hurry and get back to the boathouse. Hide and call Slammer. Tell him what's happening. What are you going to do? I asked in horror as he started walking back. I'm finishing this. No, just come with me, I begged, running toward him. I grabbed his hand. Please. Jessica, for once in your life, do what I ask, he demanded sharply. Before you get us both killed. His words stung. Hurt, I turned and ran back toward the boathouse. As I made it up the staircase, I heard the shots. They were immediately followed by the sound of police sirens. Chapter 35 Jessica Ma'am, do you know the man who owns the cabin next door, Samuel Larson? asked Sheriff Harris Parker, an older man with kind blue eyes. No, I said, sitting in the other cabin, the one owned by Annabelle Hunter. I'd told the police that I'd been renting it and didn't know anyone in the area. I've never met Mr. Larson. In fact, I don't think he's even been home this week. Obviously you heard the screaming or the shots from next door. To be honest, I was watching a movie in the bedroom. I didn't hear anything, I lied, still wondering where Jordan had disappeared to. The police had found the bodies of Reaper, Stryker, and the other club members, some shot and two mauled by the grizzly. Apparently, someone had been on the lake and heard all of the commotion, so they'd radioed it in. Do you know who they were? The victims, he asked. They appear to be bikers, belonging to some club called the Devil's Rangers. I pretended to be surprised. A motorcycle club? I had no idea there were any in this area. So, you had no idea of what was going on next door? No. Not at all. Are you staying here alone? He asked, looking around the cabin. Yes. I just broke up with my boyfriend and needed a place to think, you know? I said, my eyes filling with tears. His eyes softened. Sorry to hear that. You're from Iowa, huh? I'd showed him my driver's license. I was pretty certain if he checked up on me, he'd find out who my stepdad was. For now, however, I wasn't about to give up that bit of information freely. I nodded. I'll be going home soon. I don't think I can stay here, after what happened next door. I don't blame you. There are a lot of bears in this area, too. In fact, two of the victims were attacked by a grizzly. I put a hand to my chest. Oh my god, are you serious? He scratched his scraggly chin and shook his head. It's a scene out of a horror movie over there. It sounds like it. I'm glad I didn't see what happened, to tell you the truth. You'd have nightmares, that's for sure. Well, I know you want to go back home, but I'm going to have to ask you to stick around for a few days. We might have some more questions for you. Sure, I replied. I really didn't see anything, though. He stood up. Maybe not, but if you end up recalling anything unusual about the last couple of days, be sure to give me a call. I had to stifle a laugh. Everything about the last few days had been unusual. Yeah. Definitely. He tipped his hat and smiled. Good night, Ms. Winners. Don't forget to lock this after I leave. Obviously, it's not safe around here for a young woman all alone. Nowhere was safe these days, I thought. After he was gone, I found Jordan's other cell phone and called my mother. I'd tried calling Slammer before the cops had arrived, but he hadn't answered the phone. Thank God, she said when I reached her. I've been trying to get a hold of you. I'm okay, I said. Jordan had to get rid of his other phone. I thought he would have told Slammer about it already. She began to cry. I frowned. Mom, what is it? It's... Slammer. He... He's been murdered, she sobbed. Chapter 36 Jessica Jordan never returned to the cabin, but I learned from Raptor the next day that he'd taken off when the cops had arrived. I get why he left when the cops showed up, but why didn't he come back for me afterward? I'd asked, still frustrated. Because of someone named Brett Stryker. 
Stryker had information on him, and Jordan was worried that the feds would figure out who he was and arrest him. Wasn't Stryker killed? I asked. Yes, but Jordan thinks that Stryker might have kept information on him. He didn't want to take any chances. So what in the hell am I supposed to do? My mother needs me. I have no money. The sheriff said I needed to stick around here for a few more days. Screw him. Leave a note and get back here. We'll wire you some money for the plane ride back. I began to relax. Thanks. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Have they found out who killed Slammer yet? I asked. From what I'd heard, someone shot him at an ATM machine without taking any of his money. We're not sure exactly. There was one witness who claimed a woman did it though. The club thinks it could be a girlfriend or an old lady of the Devil's Rangers. A woman? Yeah. They get a description? Guess she was wearing a hoodie and dark glasses. The only other description they had was she was light-skinned with medium height and build. So, not a lot to go on. How is Tank doing? He sighed. He's wrecked. They were pretty close, you know? Yeah. I know. You two were pretty close as well. Raptor was silent, and I could tell he was trying to stay composed. The poor guy had lost two people in the last few days. I had a suspicion that Slammer had meant even more than Mavis. I'm going to miss him, he said after a while. He was like a second father to me. I know he talked highly of you, I said. He loved you too, Jessica. He really did. My eyes filled with tears. I'd been trying not to think too much about his death, but the truth was, he'd grown on me. I was definitely going to miss him. I could tell. I still can't believe he's gone. I know. Tank's determined to find out who did it and settle the score. He doesn't care if it's a woman, either. He's looking for blood. I closed my eyes and rubbed my forehead. It's just never going to end, this feud. And Tank's going to go to prison if he gets caught. Slammer wouldn't want that. No, but Slammer would want retribution, said Raptor. Maybe, I said. One thing for certain, I was going to move my mother out of Jensen, whether she liked it or not. We'll set up the wire so you can buy a plane ticket home. Okay. When's the funeral? Not sure yet. They're doing an autopsy, and it could take a little longer. Oh. We're cremating him, said Raptor. Slammer always wanted his ashes spread out on the freeway. I'd heard him say that before. He wanted Tank to release his ashes after giving him one last ride on a Harley. I remember. Well, I gotta go. Hold tight and we'll get you back here. Sounds good. Oh, and Raptor? What? Do you have a phone number for Jordan? I'd really like to talk to him. He didn't say anything. Raptor? Sorry, but he specifically told me not to give you his number. I gritted my teeth. Really? Why not? He said you were a distraction that he couldn't afford. I snorted. I'm surprised he didn't also call me a pain in the ass. Actually, he did. I just didn't want to repeat it. I scowled. Wow. What an asshole. Raptor chuckled. He can be. I'm his brother and he won't even join us for the holidays. A real Mr. Grinch. Guess so. What was he like, anyway? You were together for a couple of days. I don't anyone else who might have gotten to know him as much as you did. I grunted. Cocky. Arrogant. A real Mr. Know-it-all. That's probably what Adriana would tell you about me he said, laughing. So, in other words, he's a dink? Yes, I said, and then sighed. But, there's a man struggling to get out of that wall he's built around himself. He says he doesn't need anyone in his life, but his actions show otherwise. What do you mean? 
I wasn't about to tell him how Jordan had held me in his arms and had kissed me with such passion that I'd felt it all the way down to my toes. So instead, I told him about the cabin he'd purchased. The one he would someday leave for Sammy. You're kidding, he replied shocked. I know, right? He's definitely a man with many layers, I said softly. I guess so. Don't tell him that I told you about the cabin, I said quickly. He might come looking for you, laughed Raptor. I smiled slowly. Actually, maybe you should tell him. Damn girl, what happened between the two of you? He asked, a smile in his voice. I bit my lower lip as I pictured Jordan's smile. At that moment, I wanted to kiss him just as much as I wanted to slap the big jerk. Honestly, I'm still trying to figure that out myself. Chapter 37 Jessica The funeral was scheduled for nine days later. My mother was handling it hard, spending hours in their bedroom, crying and going through photo albums. Even though they'd only known each other for four years, she'd said it had seemed like a lifetime. I don't know what I'm going to do without him, Jessica, she kept repeating. Tank was also taking it hard, but handling it differently. He became distant and moody, not wanting to talk to anyone about how he really felt. Then there were times that he'd flip out over the smallest of things, and I began to wonder if he was self-medicating with drugs. He'll be fine, said Raptor when I talked to him about it right before the funeral. He was like this when Crystal died. He was not like this when Crystal died, whispered Adriana when Raptor stepped away from us. If you want to know the truth, I think he might be using. He used to snort cocaine with Crystal sometimes. We both looked over at Tank, who was with some of the other club members, talking quietly. Well, he's definitely hungover right now, I said. He stayed at Mom's last night drinking a bottle of Jack. Drank himself into a stupor while watching television. Never said anything to us, either. You'd better watch him, said Adriana. He might need some kind of intervention. I grunted. Right. Like he'd listen or even allow it. She smirked. Yeah. I know. He's been voted in as the club president now. He needs to get his shit together, or they'll vote him out. Raptor is even concerned about Tank. Maybe he just needs time, I said, my heart going out to him. No matter what happened, Tank was still like an older brother, and I desperately wanted him to be okay. Yeah. Maybe. Tank looked over at us, and I could tell he knew we were talking about him. I smiled at him. He turned away. I sat in the front row of the church with my mother and Tank. The place was packed with other gold vipers from different chapters, coming to pay their respects. Even Bastard and April showed up. During the sermon, Raptor and a couple other club members went up to the podium and spoke of their love for Slammer. I held my mother as she cried, while Tank stood next to us quietly. I noticed that his eyes misted over once, but other than that, his face was like stone. When it was over, I turned around to walk my mother out of the church, when I noticed him in the back row. Jordan. My heart skipped a beat as our eyes met, and I immediately felt my insides turn to mush. I'd missed him so much, even as angry as I'd been. I knew at once that if he asked me to jump on another plane with him for anywhere in the country, I'd do it in a heartbeat. As I raised my hand to wave, people everywhere began to get up and move, and I lost sight of him. Jordan is here, I whispered to Adriana, who was in the row behind us. Who? asked my mother. The judge, said Tank, speaking for the first time. Did you know he was coming? I asked. Tank nodded. I sighed. Why didn't you tell me? Because he's not here to see you, he replied bluntly. I realize that, I said, his words stinging me. Raptor tapped me on the shoulder. He's not staying, so if you want to go talk to him, now's your chance. I looked at my mother. Go ahead, she said, dabbing the tears on her face. You two obviously have some unfinished business. We'll meet you back home. Are you sure? I asked. 
Franny smiled sadly and then leaned over to whisper in my ear. I lost my man. Don't let that one slip away. Not if he's worth it. The problem is, he doesn't think he is, I whispered back. The good ones never do, she said, squeezing my shoulder. Do what you need to do. I looked at Adriana. We'll take care of your mother, she said, smiling at me. Don't worry. I gave her a hug and walked ahead of them, in search of Jordan. When I made it out of the church, I scanned the parking lot until I saw him getting on a motorcycle. He started the engine and I watched in disappointment as he began to drive away. Coward, I mumbled, walking down the steps of the church. When I reached the sidewalk, I decided to go and wait for mom and Tank in the parking lot. I didn't feel like talking to anyone and didn't know many of Slammer's friends. Being alone sounded like the best thing to do. As I began walking toward Tank's truck, I heard the rumble of a Harley behind me. I turned around and there he was. Get on, said Jordan, nodding to the back of the bike. Why should I? I asked, raising my chin. As much as I wanted to jump on, I wanted an apology even more. He owed me one. His lip twitched. Fine. Don't then. Grinding my teeth together, I got on behind him, thankful that I'd worn black dress pants instead of the dress I'd originally picked out. Jordan handed me a helmet. I slipped it on and we took off. Chapter 38 Jessica I didn't know where we were going and the truth was, I didn't care. I had my arms around Jordan Steele and my heart was racing in my chest. He'd come back for me and I was feeling breathless. I knew right away that I still loved him. We drove for about 40 minutes and then finally stopped at a secluded picnic area by Center Lake. Get off, he said briskly, shutting down the engine. I took off the helmet. Really? Get off? That's how you're going to ask? He shrugged. Fine. Stay on then. Do you ever get tired of giving orders? I snapped, uncurling myself from him and the bike. I mean would it hurt you to even say please? He removed his helmet and ran a hand through his jet black hair. At least you listened this time. Jesus it's hot. It was 80 degrees and he was wearing a black suit. Although Jordan looked very GQ, it was obvious he wasn't used to dressing up. Let me guess, you're still pissed off that I came and saved your ass? I stated. Smirking, he removed his jacket and laid it over the bike. Oh, you saved my ass? That's really how you remember it. I put my hands on my hips. It's exactly what happened. Reaper had you on the ground and I rushed out, distracting them so they wouldn't shoot you. You were about two seconds from dying. He grunted. You're definitely the expert on distractions. I folded my arms across my chest and smiled coldly. I'm also a pain in the ass, apparently. His eyes twinkled. You're finally finding yourself, huh? Did you bring me out here to insult me, or is there another reason? I brought you out here because I heard that you wanted to talk to me. My eye twitched as I stared at him. Really? So talk, he added, rolling his sleeves up. Fine. I guess I just wanted to know why you left and never came back. Sighing, he looked past me toward the water. If I would have stayed, they'd have arrested me. I understand that, but why didn't you ever come back after that night? I was going to, he said, his voice trailing off. And? He shrugged. I don't know. I just changed my mind, I guess. What? You just changed your mind? That's, that's not a good enough answer, I stammered. You left me. I was scared and I didn't know what to do. The cops were questioning me and hell, I didn't even know if there'd be more of Reaper's guys around waiting to kill me. There weren't any left. I took care of them and made sure that you were safe. No, you didn't. You left like a coward, I said angrily. I was still there until the day you stepped on the plane and headed back here, he said. I never left Anchorage. I just left you. My eyes filled with tears. 
And that's supposed to make me feel better? He reached out and grabbed my arm. No, but you need to hear this, Jessica. My voice broke. What exactly do I need to hear, Jordan? That you have no room in your life for me? He stared at me in silence, his eyes stormy. That's just it, isn't it? You came back to tell me this in person. To make sure that I'm not pining after you. So you don't have to feel guilty about it. You can't love me, Jessica. But I already do, I said, the tears running down my cheeks. I'd thought that maybe I'd been caught up in the moment when I'd said I'd loved him originally. I'd even thought that after I returned to Jensen, I wouldn't feel the same way. But I'd been wrong. All I'd been thinking about was Jordan. He haunted my days. My nights. My dreams. You hardly know me. It doesn't seem to matter, I replied, feeling almost foolish. Here I was, professing my love for him, and he obviously felt nothing but pity for me. He clenched his jaw. It should. You have to forget about me. I mean it. My eyes burned into his. Jordan, no matter how many times you try and order me to stop caring about you, I just can't do it. It doesn't work that way. He grabbed my face with both of his hands. What are you doing to me? He asked, wiping the tears from my cheeks with his fingers. Then his lips were on mine. Surprised, I opened my mouth, kissing him with everything I had. I don't care if you ever love me, I said, when he suddenly broke away. But I'm not ready to let you go yet. What do you want from me? He asked in a tortured voice. His pupils were dark and full, and his lips glistened from the moisture of our kiss. I bit my lower lip. My body was on fire, and I knew that he couldn't give me everything I desired, but he could at least give me something I needed. Right now, I needed him. Just make love to me. He stared at me hard. I'm no good for you. This thing between us isn't. Right. There you go again. Deciding what's right for me. How about you let me decide? His eyes searched mine. That's what you really want? I nodded. He looked around the park and then grabbed his jacket. Put your helmet on. This time I didn't argue or ask questions. We got back onto the bike and he drove a few more miles up the road, finally stopping at a small camping resort. He parked in front of one of the cabins and we both got off his motorcycle. Then he grabbed my hand and led me inside. Are you staying here? I asked as he locked the door behind us. It appeared to be a three-room cabin. Nothing fancy but comfortable and private. Yes, he said, taking the helmet from me. He tossed it onto the sofa, pulled me back into his arms, and didn't waste any more time with words. Kissing him back, I pulled his jacket away from his shoulders, letting it fall to the floor and began unbuttoning the white shirt underneath. As I did this, his hands went to my blouse and he began fumbling with the small round buttons. When he couldn't undo them fast enough, he grabbed it with both hands and ripped it open, sending them everywhere. Sorry, he whispered before kissing me with such passion, it took my breath away. Soon all of our clothes were off and we made love to each other desperately. It was as if neither of us could get enough of each other, and afterward, the intense emotions washing through me brought tears to my eyes. I clung to him, not wanting to let him go but knowing that it was probably the last time we'd be together. It hurt like hell knowing this and my heart felt like it was breaking all over again. Hey, what's wrong, he whispered, noticing that I was crying silently. The tenderness in his eyes made it hurt even more. Nothing. Jordan stared at me silently and I knew he didn't believe me. Chapter 39 Jordan the sadness in her eyes tore me up inside. Knowing that I was the cause of it made me sick. She didn't deserve it. She didn't deserve me. But who was I to decide that for her? Jessica was the only woman who'd ever loved me, much less cared. Staring into her eyes, I couldn't deny it any longer. I loved her too. I loved her with every fiber of my being. I couldn't keep it to myself anymore. Whatever happened, happened. 
I love you. Her eyes widened. What did you say? I pulled her tightly into my arms and closed my eyes. My voice cracked as I repeated the words again. I love you Jessica, God help me, but I do. Chapter 40 Jessica When Jordan admitted his love for me, I thought he might have just said it in the heat of passion. But later, when he brought me back to my mother's house, he surprised me and said it again. I love you too, I whispered back as he held me in his arms. We were standing in the driveway next to his bike in the dark. It was just after nine and the house appeared quiet. We stayed like that for a while and then he pulled away. Um so now what? I asked shyly. Now what? I nodded. Yeah. What's going to happen with us? To be honest, I don't know, he answered quietly. But we love each other. I mean, you're not going to just disappear again, are you? He was quiet for a few seconds and then he said, I have to sort a lot of shit out in my life before we can go any further. What does that mean? You know who I am. What I've done, he said. It isn't easy to just walk away from that. But you're going to, right? He didn't say anything. Oh my god, Jordan, you're not going to walk away from me again, are you? I asked, getting angry. I have to, but just for a little while, he said, pulling me back to him. I promise. Sighing in relief, I asked him where he was going, and how long he'd be. I don't know, a month maybe. I groaned. A month? I'm not going to see you for an entire month? If we're going to be together, I'm going to need a new identity, he said in a low voice. A lot of people want me dead. So you've said. Does this mean that you're not going to kill anyone anymore? Not unless they deserve it. I scowled at him. No. I'm not going to kill anyone else, he said, smirking. It's another reason why the judge needs to disappear. For good? Yes. It's the only way. He rubbed his chin. To do this, I need to get my finances in order, sell some of my property, and work on becoming a regular old Joe Schmo, he said dryly. So, I'm not a danger to live with. Live with? I asked, getting excited. Do you want to live together? Eventually, but? I think we should take things slowly, Jessica. I ignored him. You could move to Shoreview with me. We'll get a place together. Maybe we can even rent a house. Oh my god, do you love dogs? I've always wanted to get a dog. Or a cat, I said, giddy at the idea of us waking up together every morning. He suddenly looked pale. What about your mother? I'm going to talk her into moving in with Cheryl. I explained who she was and why I'd originally planned on moving there. I'm beginning the internship in a couple of weeks. Shoreview, huh? Minnesota? Yeah, I said, worried about his expression. So, what do you think? He let out a ragged breath. I think we have a lot to talk about when I get back. Yeah, I said, still giddy. I guess we do. He tipped my chin up and looked me in the eye. Know this though, I will be back. I promise. You'd better. Tank took that moment to open the front door and step outside. We waved at him and he waved back. How is he doing? Not very well. His old man died. I wouldn't expect anything else. Call me though if things get ugly around here, he whispered as Tank took out a cigarette and began smoking it. Rumor has it that he's out for blood. A lot of it. I don't want you getting hurt. Tank's definitely changed, I whispered. I'm really worried about him. He needs time to sort things out. Hopefully, he'll figure out a way to get back at Slammer's killer without adding innocent casualties, said Jordan, getting onto his bike. Let's hope. I'll call you tomorrow. We'll get together again, before I leave for Alaska. You're going back there too? I asked surprised. I have to close down both cabins. At least for now. 
Be careful. That sheriff might be watching both of them closely. I'm surprised that he hasn't tried to find me. I'd left the man a note, telling him that there'd been a family emergency. That's why I had to leave. You won't be hearing from him. In fact, the case is closed already. My eyes widened. What do you mean? From what I hear, they figured out what happened at the murder scene, he said, smirking. Apparently, Brett Stryker set up a one-man sting operation that went sour. It was in the papers. I laughed. Is that right? Yep. I even spoke to Sheriff Parker, who confirmed it. My eyes widened. As Jordan Steele? No. As Samuel Larson. I snorted. Did you get fake IDs for that name as well? Of course. He winked. It pays to know the right people. So you've said. He sighed. I should go. You need to get some sleep. I nodded. He kissed me. I love you. I love you too, I said. Putting his helmet back on, he started the bike up and disappeared down the road. Missing Jordan already, I walked up to the porch, to where Tank was sitting in the dark. I smiled at him. Hey. Hey, he replied. Are you okay? I asked him. He nodded, but I could see from the look in his eyes that he was just saying it for my benefit. If you want to talk. I'm okay, he repeated and looked away. I just need some time to myself. I understand. I squeezed his shoulder. Good night, Tank. Good night. I went inside to check on my mother and found that she was sleeping. Sighing in relief, I walked upstairs to my bedroom and got ready for bed. Sliding under the covers, I lay there for a while, thinking of Jordan and what kind of life we could have together. I closed my eyes. There were so many possibilities. Hell, maybe we could even get married and have children someday. Then I realized that neither of us had used protection earlier. Crap, I thought, opening my eyes. I reached for my cell phone, prepared to call him, when I pictured Jordan's eyes whenever he spoke of Sammy. He loved that little boy and didn't even really know him. I could only imagine the love he'd have for his own son. Laying my head back on the pillow, I closed my eyes and for the first time, in a very long time, fell asleep with a smile on my face. The End this has been Fearing the Biker, written by Cassie Alexandra. Breaking the Biker is the next book in the series. Please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to be notified when new books are released.